mic test. One, two, one, two.
committee services, if we can have you flip the camera to the board members since the board's ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joaquin Esquivel. I'm chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. Today is uh, Thursday, January 19th. It is 9.32 uh, a.m. and I'd like to call this meeting back into order. I'll start by introducing my fellow board colleagues. With me here today is Vice Chair Doreen Diadamo, board member Sean McGuire, board member Laurel Firestone, and unfortunately, uh, board member Nicole Morgan is not feeling well today and is not participating, but will be observing. Uh, and with us as well is our executive director, Eileen Sobeck, our chief counsel, Michael Lauffer, our chief deputy, uh, Eric Oppenheimer, our acting clerk of the board is Courtney Tyler, and assisting her today is uh, Margie Argel and Viva Malachik. As you can see, this board meeting is being uh, webcast and recorded, and you're uh, observing one of two ways. Either you're uh, participating, and it's a hybrid meeting, so you're participating remotely, or you're here in person with us in uh, the Cali PA building in Sacramento. If you're participating remotely, you're either on our customary webcast on uh, the Cali PA website or on YouTube Live. But if you intend on commenting on any of today's items or today's discussion, uh, you need to be on the Zoom platform with us. In order to do so, there are instructions at the top of the agenda on how to uh, fill out the form and get onto the platform. If you're having any issues with that, please do just email our clerk of the board at board.clerk at waterboards.ca.gov, and uh, she will help you get onto the platform. Once you're on the platform, your camera will be off, you will be on mute, uh, until is your uh, opportunity to speak on the item that you've uh, requested to do so. For those of you in the, the room this morning, good morning, glad to have you with us. And uh, just a few announcements for us here. Uh, please do observe uh, the exits. In case of an emergency, we'll calmly file out to Cesar Chavez Plaza and await uh, further instruction. If you intend on commenting on any item today, uh, there is a, a tablet at the side of the room. There's also uh, a QR code, which will allow you to sign up. Uh, once you are before uh, the board here, please uh, introduce yourself, uh, any affiliation. Uh, and also lastly, if you're here in the room, please do silence uh, your phone so that we don't have any distractions during today's discussion. Uh, you know, today, and before we get into the items, uh, I did want to uh, start here with, with a bit of a script. Uh, today, we are going to have two items related to the update and implementation of water quality control plan of the water quality control plan for the San Francisco Bay Delta, San Joaquin Delta, or Bay Delta plan. Uh, this is the first. Uh, the first is an informational item providing an update on activities to update and implement the Bay Delta plan, including consideration of proposed voluntary agreements. We'll begin with a staff presentation, followed by a presentation. Uh, from representatives from the uh, Department of Water Resources and uh, the Director of the Department of Water, uh, Fish and Wildlife related to the proposed voluntary agreements. We will then hear public comments and any comments from board members. Following the informational item, we will hold a board workshop uh, and, pre and present and hear comments on the draft scientific basis report supplemental, uh, supplement in support of proposed voluntary agreements for the Sacramento River Delta and Tributaries update to the Bay Delta Plan that was released on January 5th, 2023. The workshop will be the start, just the start, of the board's public process to consider possible voluntary agreements for updating and implementing the Bay Delta Plan. There will be other steps in the process, including opportunities for public input that will be detailed in the forthcoming informational item on the board's Bay Delta planning process. 
The board has not approved the voluntary agreements and will consider the public comments received here today and throughout the board's public processes to update and implement the Bay Delta plan and to determine how to proceed. We are aware that tribal governments and non-governmental organizations who have not been part of the voluntary agreement process to date have input that they would like to provide. The board's processes today are an opportunity to hear from those parties as well as the voluntary agreement parties. We look forward to hearing the various perspectives. The State Water Board is actively seeking consultation with California Native American tribes on its Bay Delta planning and implementation effort consistent with B1011 and its tribal consultation policy. In addition, the State Water Board has begun efforts to formally consult with tribal governments pursuant to AB52 for its implementation efforts on the Lower San Joaquin. In addition to tribal consultations, State Board staff intend to hold a tribal, tribal listening session in early 2023 to explain the board's Bay Delta planning and implementation efforts and hear questions, comments, and concerns related to those efforts. We look forward to hearing the tribes that would like to participate in this meeting and additional consultation processes. Before we uh, further get into the item, I just want to also reflect on really the importance of this work. And I know that for some, uh, because uh, we haven't had as thorough of an update as this, we did have an informational item about a year ago where we laid out additional work that the board was gonna be doing in implementation of phase one of the Bay Delta plan, including uh, identification of biological goals, the establishment of what's known as the Sacramento Merced Tuolumne uh, Working Group, the STEM Working Group, uh, and other activities for implementation. Uh, and, 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 and so here, uh, since this is one of our more thorough touch points that we've had, uh, there may be some that are, are, not, are a bit new to the project. And I think it's incredibly important to remind ourselves of the importance of this project in the face of a lot of discussions like groundwater recharge or projects that are out there like sites or perhaps conveyance. And that updating these standards, which I think we can all agree is overdue, uh, is actually really key to setting ourselves up here for the 21st century, uh, where we have better protective standards uh, that are the basis of our decision making. Uh, and I think that we all agree we can do better on uh, given the science and the information that we all have around how we best manage uh, in a, an incredibly challenging uh, time in, in California's uh, water management history. I think we do uh, by continuing to ensure that um, we do the critical work of incorporating what watersheds need uh, into the future. And so uh, this is not an easy conversation. I know that there are many opinions here amongst the dais, let alone uh, those out in the state. But I think the importance of the project is what I'd like to just continue to emphasize. And, uh, and here, as uh, we said, uh, at the start of what will be a very uh, intensive load of work uh, these next couple of years and, and look forward to hearing um, from our folks uh, how everyone can plug into the discussion, public discussion that's happening before the board as we evaluate the voluntary agreements, as we move forward with implementation and standards, standard setting for the Bay Delta and the Water Quality Control Plan update. Um, and so just uh, thank you. I appreciate everyone's uh, patience, grace, and participation in today's discussion. And uh, we can start here with item number eight and hand it over to our folks uh, in the program. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Escabel and board members. Um, can you bring up the staff PowerPoint, please? No problem. Um, I will go ahead and get started with the introductory slide. I know there's nothing critical in the slide. Um, my name is Diane Riddle. I'm one of the assistant deputy directors in the Division of Water Rights. With me today is Aaron Forsman, the environmental program manager of the Bay Delta San Joaquin section, and Tina Leahy with the Office of Chief Counsel. Aaron and I will be presenting today's informational item on upcoming actions to update and implement the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan. We will both be available for questions along with Tina. Before we launch into the presentation, I also wanted to introduce Rob McCarthy. Rob, can you please stand up for a moment? Rob will be the board's point of contact for ensuring that the perspectives of California and Native American tribes, black, indigenous, and people of color and disadvantaged communities are incorporated into the board's Bay Delta planning and implementation activities. Rob's contact information will be posted on the board's Bay Delta website in the next couple of days, along with other information regarding the board's efforts to coordinate on tribal, BIPOC, and disadvantaged community 
um, issues and opportunities for providing input to the board. Thank you. Thank for you. That. Thank you, Rob. Next slide, please. I'll start by providing a brief overview of the topics we plan to discuss today. First, I'll start with a brief background on the water quality control plan for the Bay Delta. Next, I'll provide general background on proposed voluntary agreements for the update and implementation of the Bay Delta plan. Then we'll talk about the specific efforts to update and implement the Bay Delta plan. Following our staff presentation, we'll turn it over for, to representatives from the Department of Water Resources and Department of Fish and Wildlife. Today's update will cover the general anticipated timelines and steps to complete the processes to update and implement the Bay Delta Plan, assuming expedited efforts. We are not planning to discuss the details or substance of these efforts, which are being discussed in the specific public processes associated with the different components of the update and implementation of the Bay Delta Plan, including the subsequent uh, workshop on the draft scientific basis report. Next slide, please. To provide context for today, I'll pr provide a little bit of background on the Bay Delta Plan and the update and implementation effort. The Bay Delta Plan identifies beneficial uses of water, water quality objectives for the reasonable protection of those uses, a program of implementation to achieve the objectives, as well as monitoring and evaluation efforts to inform implementation actions and future updates to the Bay Delta Plan. The Bay Delta Plan includes municipal industrial, agricultural, and fish and wildlife beneficial uses and water quality objectives to reasonably protect those uses. The water quality objectives in the Bay Delta Plan to date have been primarily flow dependent um, and include both narrative and numeric objectives. The program of implementation itself also includes non-flow actions as well as flow actions, um, which are largely recommendations to other entities who have authority for implementing those actions. The Bay Delta Plan is required to be reviewed on a regular basis pursuant to, state, to the State Porter Cologne Act and the Federal Clean Water Act. As will be discussed in more detail in this presentation, the San Joaquin River flow and Southern Delta salinity components of the Bay Delta Plan were updated in 2018, and the Sacramento River Delta and tributary components of the Bay Delta Plan are currently in the process of being updated. The last overall update to the Bay Delta Plan was completed in 2006, with the last major update occurring in 1995. Next slide, please. Next, I'll talk a little bit about the purpose of the current efforts to update and implement the Bay Delta Plan. The board's Bay Delta planning and implementation efforts are a very high priority of the board due to the critical role the Bay Delta watershed plays in the state. The Bay Delta watershed includes the Sacramento and San Joaquin River systems, the Delta, Sassoon Marsh, and San Francisco Bay. The Sacramento, River, Sacramento and San Joaquin River systems, including their tributaries, drain water from about 40% of California's land area, supporting a variety of beneficial uses of water. The Bay Delta is one of the most important ecosystems in California, as well as the hub of California's water supply system. As, a, as the largest tidal estuary on the western coast of the Americas, it provides critical habitat to a vast array of aquatic, terrestrial, and, and avian wildlife. The watershed and the salmon and other species it support also are also of significant importance to tribal communities for nutritional, cultural, religious, and other purposes. In addition, the Delta watershed is critical to the many Californians that live, work, and recreate in the watershed, including recreational and commercial fishing and boating interests and the communities live, that live within the Delta. Current efforts to update and implement the Bay Delta Plan are focused on updating provisions from the 1995 Bay Delta Plan that were developed pursuant to the 1994 Bay Delta Accord, which was an agreement between state and federal entities for the last major comprehensive update to the Bay Delta Plan. The, upper, the efforts are focused on protection of fish and wildlife beneficial uses due to prolonged and precipitous declines of a broad array of native fish and aquatic species. 
In addition, the planning and implementation efforts are focused on updating requirements to provide protection throughout the watershed, as well as broader responsibility in the face of climate change and pronounced droughts. The efforts also address issues associated with expired voluntary agreements that have resulted in, in implementation gaps and compliance issues. Next slide, please. So the board's efforts to update the Bay Delta Plan started in, in 2008 focused on the lower San Joaquin River flow objectives and Southern Delta salinity objectives um, to those issues um, associated with expiration of voluntary agreements um, and issues with meeting in stream flows. The board's efforts to update portions of the Bay Delta Plan covering the Sacramento River and Delta started in 2012. The board completed the lower San Joaquin River flow and Southern Delta salinity updates to the Bay Delta Plan in 2018. During that approval process for those updates, um, in which possible voluntary agreements were raised for actions to update and implement the Bay Delta Plan, the board also provided direction to staff to provide technical and regulatory support on development of voluntary agreements for incorporating as an alternative in the board's Bay Delta Plan update process, which we will provide an update on today. Next slide, please. Related to voluntary agreements, in 2022, the board received an MOU for voluntary agreement proposals for the update and implementation of the Bay Delta Plan. Um, as has been noted, the State Water Board is not a signatory to the MOU and has made no decisions regarding whether to approve the VAs. Consistent with the 2018 resolution I just mentioned, board staff have been working to develop draft scientific and environmental evaluations of the VAs for public review and input. Following a full public process, state water board staff will con the State Water Board will consider whether to incorporate the VAs in the Bay Delta Plan. The board may also provide direction before that time. As will be discussed in more detail later today, the VAs propose an eight-year initial term. Following the eight-year term, the VAs could be extended, could be modified, or a regulatory path could be implemented. If the VAs are not shown to be Sorry about that. The VAs propose flow, habitat restoration, and flow and habitat restoration actions on tributary, tributaries to the delta and in the delta that are intended to meet a proposed new narrative ecosystem protection objective and to contribute to the existing salmon protection objective, also referred to as a salmon doubling objective. The VAs also include governance, science, monitoring, reporting, and review provisions to inform implementation of VA assets and future decisions regarding continuation of the VAs. Next slide. With that background, I'll now move on to discussing the process to consider Sacramento Delta updates to the Bay Delta Plan. This slide provides an overall map of the Bay Delta watershed and the areas covered by the Bay Delta planning and implementation processes. The blue oval in this slide identifies the general geographic scope of the Sacramento Delta updates to the Bay Delta plan. Next slide, please. This slide provides some background on the actions to date to update the Sacramento Delta portions of the Bay Delta plan. In the fall of 2017, we released a scientific basis report that generally describes the staff recommendations for Sacramento Delta updates to the Bay Delta Plan and documented the science upon which those changes are based. An earlier draft of this report re was reviewed by the Delta Independent Science Board and the public and revised in light of the input that we received. Following those revisions, the report was subjected to independent peer review before being finalized and released. In 2018, during the consideration process for the Lower San Joaquin River Flow and Southern Delta salinity updates to the Bay Delta Plan, board staff released a framework for possible Sacramento Delta updates to the Bay Delta Plan identified by staff at that time uh, prior to receipt of voluntary agreements, including possible inflow objectives for the Sacramento River and tributaries and the Delta East Side tributaries, including the Casamnes, Calaveras, and McColney Rivers, the call for 55% of unimpaired flow with an adaptive range from 45 to 65% of unimpaired flow. 
Um, as a reminder, unimpaired flow represents the water production of a river basin unaltered by upstream diversion, storage, or by export or import of water to or from other watersheds. In addition to possible inflows, the framework identified possible cold water habitat provisions, inflow-based delta outflows that would require required inflows as outflows, possible interior delta flows, and monitoring report and reporting provisions, as well as other provisions. As will be discussed in more detail in the workshop later today, most recently on January 5th of this year, staff released a draft scientific basis report supplement in support of the possible Sacramento Delta VAs. As Aaron will discuss later, the Tuolumne River VA will be the subject of a separate scientific basis report and consideration process than the Sacramento Delta update process. Written comments on the draft scientific basis report supplement are due on February 8th. In addition, recently board staff sent letters offering to consult with California Native American tribes on the Sacramento Delta update to the Bay Delta plan, including the offer for a tribal listening session that Chair Esquivel referred to, um, in which board staff would provide more information about its planning, overall planning process, planning and implementation processes, um, and an opportunity to receive input from tribal representatives. Next slide, please. This slide provides an overview of upcoming actions to complete the Sacramento Delta update to the Bay Delta plan. Based on the public comments received on the draft scientific basis report supplement um, that we're discussing today, that report will be updated, following which the report will be submitted, submitted for independent peer review pursuant to the requirements of the Public Health and Safety Code, which is anticipated for this spring. In addition, this spring, staff anticipates release of a draft staff report for public review and comment, analyzing the environmental, economic, and other effects of possible Sacramento Delta updates to the Bay Delta plan, including evaluation of the voluntary agreements and the staff framework proposal, as well as other alternatives. Following release of the draft staff report, the board will hold a public workshop to receive verbal input on the draft staff report. Then in the spring or summer of 2024, staff anticipates release of a final draft staff report, including responses to comments and the proposed Sacramento, Sacramento Delta changes to the Bay Delta plan for the board's consideration. Following which the board will actually consider the proposed Sacramento Delta updates to the Bay Delta plan, which is anticipated in the summer or fall of 2024. That concludes my update on the Sacramento Delta updates to the Bay Delta plan. Now I'll turn it over to Aaron Forbesman to provide additional information regarding the process and timeline to complete implementation of the 2018 updates to the lower San Joaquin River flows and Southern Delta salinity objectives in the Bay Delta plan and consideration of the Tuolumne River VA. Can you move it to the next slide, please? So thank you, Diane, and good morning, Chair Esquivel and board members. My name is Erin Forsman, and I'm a program manager in the Bay Delta Hearings and Special Projects Branch. I will present the next six slides about Bay Delta plan work in the lower San Joaquin River watershed and Southern Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, or Southern Delta for short. This slide shows a map of the new and revised flow objectives adopted in 2018 as amendments to the Bay Delta plan for lower San Joaquin River flows and Southern Delta salinity. Starting with the Lower San Joaquin River watershed, the new tributary flow objective applies to the Stanislaus, Tuolumne, and Merced rivers at the confluence with the Lower San Joaquin River. The tributary flow objective requires 40% of unimpaired flow as a seven day running average within an adaptive range of 30 to 50% of unimpaired flow from February through June. As Diane identified, unimpaired flow is the water production of a river basin unaltered by upstream diversions, storage, or by export or import of water to or from other watersheds. It is essentially an estimate of available water supply for in-stream demands and other water right demands. Compliance with the tributary flow objective is assessed at the flow gauge nearest the confluence, which you can see as green points on each of the Stanislaus, Tuolumne, and Merced rivers on the map. The plan amendments also include adaptive implementation options that allow for changing the required percent of unimpaired flow within the adopted range of 30 to 50%, managing flows as a block of water or as a water budget using an approved alternative flow schedule, 
and shifting water to months outside February through June time period to avoid adverse conditions for fish and wildlife at other times of the year. There is also a revised minimum in-stream flow, flow objective on the lower San Joaquin River at Vernalis. That's seen on the map as a point that's half yellow and half green. The revised objective requires flows at Vernalis as provided by the percent of unimpaired flow objective to be 1,000 CFS cubic feet per second within an adaptive range of 800 to 1,200 cubic feet per second as a seven day running average. Moving into the Southern Delta, the 2018 plan amendments include a revised Southern Delta salinity objective of 1.0 deci Siemens per meter as a monthly average year round. The prior flow objective was 0.7 deci Siemens per meter from April to August and 1.0 deci Siemens per meter the remainder of the year. The compliance points for the prior flow objective are shown by the yellow and green point of Vernalis and the yellow points in the interior Southern Delta. The Southern Delta salinity objective was also revised to apply river segments instead of interior Delta compliance locations so that compliance can be better assessed in a tidal environment. The river segments include San Joaquin River from Vernalis to Brant Bridge, Middle River from Old River to Victoria Canal, and Old River from Head of Old River to Grantland Canal. The prior compliance locations continue to be used to assess compliance until information is developed to determine the appropriate locations and methods to assess attainment of the salinity objective in the interior Southern Delta. Information development includes producing a comprehensive operations plan, monitoring and special study plan, any unnecessary modeling and long-term monitoring and reporting plan, all of which are requirements in the Bay Delta plan. And some of these products will be discussed further in the following slides. Next slide. This slide provides a summary of implementation actions completed since the plan update in 2018. It will provide a brief description of each of these activities as I move through this slide. The Bay Delta plan requires multiple planning level actions and products to be completed prior to actions that assign us responsibility for achieving the lower San Joaquin River flows and Southern Delta salinity requirements. These planning level actions include, actions and products include development of biological goals for lower San Joaquin River flows. Formation of the Stanislaus, Tuolumne, and Merced, or STM working group. Compliance methods for the percent of unimpaired flow objective. Procedures for adaptive implementation of lower San Joaquin River flows. And several products for Southern Delta salinity, including a monitoring and special study and comprehensive operations plan. In 2019, a report with draft initial biological goals for lower San Joaquin River flows was released for public comment. Biological goals are quantitative metrics that the State Water Board will use to assess if the actions it is taking under the Bay Delta Plan are making sufficient progress toward achieving and maintaining the natural production of viable native fish and aquatic species populations. In 2019, a draft report for describing initial compliance methods for assessing unimpaired flow compliance <clears throat> was released by the Executive Director. Development of compliance methods is required by the Bay Delta Plan because implementing the new flow objectives requires a transition from the prior method of fixed flows based on water year type to the new tributary specific variable flows based on a portion of daily unimpaired flow. Moving into 2020, Department of Water Resources and Reclamation submitted a draft comprehensive operations plan and monitoring and special study for Southern Delta salinity. These draft documents were released for public comment and DWR and Reclamation began stakeholder meetings as required by the Bay Delta Plan. Also in 2020, a final water quality certification for Merced River hydroelectric facilities was issued by the State Water Board in relation to dam relicensing associated with Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, abbreviated as FERC. The final certification includes conditions for Bay Delta Plan Lower San Joaquin River flows and Southern Delta salinity. Let's see, similarly in 2022, um, sorry, 2021, a final water quality certification for Tuolumne River hydroelectric facilities was issued by the State Water Board in relation to FERC dam relicensing. It also has um, final certification includes conditions for Bay Delta Plan Lower San Joaquin River flows and Southern Delta salinity. So that brings us to last year, 2022. The State Water Board released a revised draft initial biological goals report for Lower San Joaquin River flows for public comment and had a public staff workshop. D 
DWR and Reclamation submitted a revised monitoring and special study for Southern Delta salinity that's currently being reviewed by staff. A notice of preparation for development of an environmental impact report in support of an implementing regulation for lower San Joaquin River flows and Southern Delta salinity was released and notice of consultation opportunity was initiated with tribal organizations. The STM working group, the Stanislaus Tuolumne Merced working group, was formerly, formally uh, initiated and formed and the membership was identified. The Bay Delta plan requires formation of the STM working group to assist with implementation, monitoring and assessment of lower San Joaquin River flow objectives. As Diane mentioned in October, 2022, the State Water Board received a proposed voluntary agreement for the Tuolumne River that staff are currently working to evaluate, including providing opportunities for public input and review. As Diane indicated, the board has not made any decision about the Tuolumne River VA or the other VAs and will conduct a full public process in order to inform whether to approve the VAs. Next slide. This slide summarizes the next steps in the process for completing these initial implementation activities that were initiated in 2019. The next steps for biological goals are lower San sorry, biological goals for lower San Joaquin River flows include reviewing and responding to public comments, producing a final draft, initial biological goals report and releasing it, having a board workshop for public comment on the final draft report, board meeting for consideration and action on the final initial biological goals. The next steps for unimpaired flow compliance methods and procedures for adaptive implementation include releasing a draft report for public comment that describes compliance methods for the Lower San Joaquin River unimpaired flow objective and identifies procedures for adaptive implementation, holding a staff workshop and a process for seeking STM working group recommendations, reviewing and responding to comments, and issuing a final report for executive director action. The next steps for Southern Delta salinity include finalizing a monitoring and special study and comprehensive operations plan and requesting executive director action on each product. Next slide. This slide summarizes the next steps for completing the implementing regulation and actions that would occur to consider a voluntary agreement on the Tuolumne River. For the implementing regulation, the next steps include releasing a draft regulation that provides for implementation of the flow and salinity objectives and associated components of the program of implementation and a draft environmental impact report that provides environmental analysis in support of the draft regulation. The process will include public comments, public workshops and associated response to comments, a final environmental impact report, final regulation, a board workshop, then a board meeting for consideration and action and submission to Office of Administrative Law. To initiate the public process to consider the Tuolumne River VA, the board plans to issue a notice of possible Bay Delta plan amendment and scoping meeting to receive public input on the possible updates to the Bay Delta plan and associated environmental analyses. The following process would occur to consider the Tuolumne River VA. A draft scientific basis report would be created and a draft staff report would be produced for the Tuolumne River VA with associated public comment and workshops. A final scientific basis report, a final staff report with response to comments, workshop that allows for additional public comment, a board meeting and consideration of action. Next slide. So the next two slides provide an anticipated schedule for completing actions to implement the Lower San Joaquin River flow and Southern Delta salinity updates to the Bay Delta plan and consideration of the Tuolumne River voluntary agreement. The schedule is optimistic and generally represents the earliest dates for completing these actions. Starting in winter of 2023, the first item is to notice possible Tuolumne River voluntary agreement plan amendments. Next, a final draft initial biological goals for Lower San Joaquin River flows report would be released. We would anticipate executive director action on a draft monitoring and special study for Southern Delta salinity. We also anticipate receiving a stakeholder draft of the comprehensive operations plan for Southern Delta salinity. Moving into spring of 2023, we anticipate a board workshop on the final draft initial biological goals for Lower San Joaquin River flows. And in spring 2023, a board meeting to act on the biological goals for Lower San Joaquin River flows. 
We also anticipate releasing a draft report describing unimpaired flow compliance methods and procedures for adaptive implementation, a staff workshop and STM recommendations on compliance methods and procedures for adaptive implementation, and a draft scientific basis report for the Tuolumne River Voluntary Agreement and a board workshop. Next slide, please. Moving into summer of 2023, we could anticipate executive director on the draft comprehensive operations plan. We anticipate executive director action on compliance methods and procedures for adaptive implementation. In the fall of 2023, we expect a scientific basis report for the Tuolumne River VA to be submitted for peer review, a draft staff report for the Bay Delta Plan Amendment for the Tuolumne River VA, a draft regulation and draft EIR in support of a regulation implementing Lower San Joaquin River flows and Southern Delta salinity. In the winter spring of 2024, this time period would include a final draft report for the Tuolumne River VA board workshop and consideration of the Tuolumne River VA, a final draft EIR and regulation implementing Lower San Joaquin River flows and Southern Delta salinity and board consideration of a regulation for implementing Lower San Joaquin River flows and Southern Delta salinity. And that brings my portion of the slides to a close. I think we now will transition to Departments of Water Resources and Fish and Wildlife for additional information on the 12, I'm sorry, on the voluntary agreements. Thank you, Ms. Forsman. And appreciate here the participation of our, our sister agencies. Um, I believe uh, we have uh, Eric Lobachevsky from DWR and Chuck Bonham from our Director of Fish and Wildlife. Thank you both, really appreciate it. Good to see you. <laughs> it has been a while since we've been in, in person and uh, I wanna acknowledge and, and thank, I know Director, Director Namath uh, was intending to attend today, but you know when the president calls, um, you, you answer. So I really appreciate Mr. Lomachewski, you, you being here with us today. Uh, you may need to turn on your mic. There you go, thank you for having us. We confer for a second. Of course, of course, yeah, of course. <laughs> All right, we're ready. Thank you, Chair, board Thank members. Thank you. Thank you. Public, it's true. My name is Chuck Bonham, and I'm still the director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, which is a great job. I think Eric and I quickly would just like to reestablish the overview, the, the exciting possibilities of this program and effort, but really use that as the platform for then our technical staff with your technical staff to give you the more fulsome presentation around the scientific report uh, effort. So you know this, the general public knows this, those in the room know it. The Bay Delta is one of the most important ecosystems in all of California. It's a legendary and incredibly valuable place in the planet. It's a system that's fed by multiple large rivers, kind of rushing down California and up California, coming off the Sierras. And as a total package, a whole, it drains about 40% of California's lands. I think some could say as the Delta's health goes, so goes the future of California. And what's most exciting about this program, which is a collection of agreements across that landscape, leadership in state agencies, federal agencies, water districts, is that it's a collective. It's not an effort that's isolated to an individual stretch of river or one river only. It's designed to think in the aggregate, think in the community collective, think across the whole landscape and join together multiple rivers in a series of commitments and actions over the next eight years. Eight years is important. 
the world is changing fast underneath our feet. Often in the natural resources world, when we set ourselves longer term agreements, we don't give ourselves the flexibility to deal with the changing climate. So we want to try something for the next eight years. And we need this board's leadership to help us get there. So what we have are a collective of proposals from water agencies across those major tributaries and from within the Delta to provide both additive flow and habitat for restoration to support the broad panoply of beneficial uses. This approach could lead us to get more done faster. And it's a combination of, and like y'all, I've been around the discussion a long time, whether we should only think about adding flows to a system or we should only think about restoring habitat to benefit our ecosystems. And I'm convinced we need to do both. We know from decades of science that flow without habitat can only do so much for our native fish species, and it's vice versa as well. Habitat without flow can't support fish either. So we want to integrate both. That's the purpose of this effort. We have a series of goals and objectives and assets involved in the program, which I would ask um, Eric to explain in a minute. The most recent milestone, as you know, was a, a joining together of these collective parties into an agreement signed in March of 2022. More are joining as we build momentum and move through this effort. I hope as we go forward, we'll see increased participation with our partners in Native American sovereign um, lands and our nonprofit conservation organizations. What you're going to hear in a minute is an impressive collective effort by Water Board, Department of Water Resources, and Department of Fish and Wildlife staff on a singular technical issue around the scientific report. On top of all that, a couple of things that aren't directly related, but are in this context that are happening at our department. So we are actively working on hiring additional positions we have in our current budget to support a lot of acceleration of habitat restoration and flow habitat management efforts. We're gonna have a program manager at the department that will be the key point of contact for collaboration with your staff across all of this Bay Delta plan effort and ensuring habitat restoration is implemented timely. We expect to have that position filled by the end of this month. And across your agency and the Department of Water Resources, we now have a multidisciplinary, many position team working together in this space. That's an improvement. And then on the restoration front alone, we've taken a look at our 2021-2022 metrics and we've been able to initiate about 146 restoration projects um, that total about 134,000 acres and about 103 stream miles. By looking at newer ways we can deal with permitting to do more restoration, like supporting y'all's development of a general order for implementation of large habitat projects continuing the development of our own restoration permit within the California Endangered Species Act for restoration projects. And we calculate that in the last year, working with the restoration community, DWR, y'all, those numbers of projects have saved restoration applicants about $2 million in you know, cost for doing restoration. And we've gotten the average processing time on restoration project permitting down to about 70 days. That's relevant because part of what we're doing in the voluntary agreement space, we've got to turn more dirt faster to connect our rivers back to the floodplains and do this restoration work. And simultaneously, while it's not a direct nexus, our department has received over $200 million about restoration across the Central Valley and in tributaries to our major rivers 
for the purposes of turning more dirt and repairing the ecosystem that's been damaged by us as people. Eric, I think there's a couple of key elements I didn't cover within this effort. I turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Director Bonham. Uh, thank you. Morning, everyone. Thank you for having us here. Again, apologies for Director Namath being unavailable this morning. Um, she was planning on being here, and she said the only reason she would miss it was a visit from the president, and that apparently happened. So um, thank you again. Um, yeah, so just building upon um, the points uh, Director Bonham made, um, wholly agree. Thank you again for that, um, Director. Um, for specifically on the voluntary agreement front, you know, we're looking at a sum aggregate um, in the middle water year types of new flows to the system um, in excess of 750,000 acre feet, again, over this next eight year period. Um, and, and that flow is being derived from a variety of sources, tributary releases, export uh, reductions, um, and the water purchases across the system. Um, again, eight year term period we're looking at around 30,000 acres of new habitat restoration that's broken broadly into categories of spawning habitat improvements, rearing habitat improvements, floodplain enhancements, um, and additional uh, tidal habitat restoration um, in the Bay Delta um, system at large. Um, I, I just kind of stepping back to, I, I just want to um, emphasize uh, our department strongly supports um, the water board moving forward with updating the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan, including consideration um, of the voluntary agreements as an alternative for uh, an implementation of that plan update. Um, not repeating a lot of the package of voluntary agreement uh, that uh, Director Bonham went over, wholly agree we are in broad support of working collaboratively together to see what we can produce over this next eight year term. Um, and as you'll hear from our teams later today, or well, actually after we're done here, um, with the release of that draft scientific basis report supplement developed in collaboration with the board staff. Uh, the team worked with that board staff to really understand what we can expect the voluntary agreements to provide in terms of benefits to native fish species. Um, and then probably I'll just end with, since signing of this voluntary agreement MOU back in um, last year in March, um, the VA participants, which as Director Bondham indicated, we're hoping to expand the inclusion of others into that um, participant category, if you will. We've made progress in developing um, draft processes that outline VA governance and draft documents outlining the metrics and monitoring that we would attach to the implementation of flows and habitat projects that are related to the voluntary agreements. We work, uh, we continue to work on um, developing and drafting a robust uh, science plan as part of the voluntary agreements uh, process and detailed strategic plan that would uh, help us understand how to, by default, deploy flows in any given year. Um, I, once if, if the voluntary agreements were adopted. Uh, I believe that's about um, all I had to go through this morning. Um, happy to, back to you if you had anything. You have a hard. You have had a hard job and you will have a hard job in the future. Um, so many Californians care about our waters and rivers often for different reasons. We appreciate your uh, space in which the technical scientific work can come forward from our collective staff. The public will see it. It's going to go through effectively a peer review process. And we should be doing that out in open transparency. And we appreciate y'all our place in which that's going to occur. Thank you, Director Bonham, Mr. Lowachewski. Uh, we all collectively have hard jobs, um, and especially communities most impacted by, by all this decision making that uh, we're all here amongst us trying best to uh, execute. And so I really appreciate uh, the presentation and the thoughts here. I, I think for me, uh, the importance is the consistency across all of the work, um, not creating a false dichotomy, a sort of an either or between the board's work, the, the scientific basis work, and the development and, and discussion and work with uh, the parties out there. Uh, there. There needs to be a consistency across the science, across the decision making, and as best that we can uh, create as, as 
as best an opportunity we all collectively have to do the right thing amongst us in a really critical time. As you well uh, noted, the next eight years are um, here going to be, uh, I'm sure if we look, dial back the last eight years, uh, just as unpredictable. Uh, and that unpredictability from other nature uh, can be tempered with some certainty from our side as we better try to manage our, our watersheds here. So I appreciate, uh, and I guess my question actually is, I'm hearing that uh, the VA governance and monitoring uh, work is, is kind of humming along. How consistent is that with um, the work that we're doing, say on implementation sort of uh, structure, where similarly we have governance and monitoring and uh, biological goals that are, that are all sounding uh, collectively to be trying to get to the same place. How, how are we feeling about the consistency across those efforts or is it, you know, is there danger of having monitoring governance in the VA context that isn't consistent across sort of what's happening on the board side? I, I'll take a stab at that. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, my, my biggest push here is never to reinvent the wheel where we have processes, com, you know, compartmentalized efforts already working, um, you know, we would like to seek to leverage those, um, you know, in that voluntary agreement space as we're developing those products, you know, in board staff include, you know, are, have been invited and, and are included and are participating. So it's, it's my hope that as we have that insight, particularly from board staff, that that, that helps that cross pollination to, to strive for that consistency, because I, I really don't see a landscape where we wind up in kind of a parallel um, system that may conflict. Parallel would be imprudent. This is a program of implementation alternative within your authorities. We should be mindful of what you're thinking and where you would like to head and integrate within that, or we'll make your decision making more difficult, not easier. Yeah, all collectively, right. And I appreciate, I appreciate that nod, because I think um, what is also in the background, and I appreciate that there is the cross-pollination and discussion there too, is the, the, the reconsideration on, on the biological opinions. Um, and whether it's the ESA uh, and you know federal or state, which sometimes gets confused for what we're trying to do in this project, the Water Quality Control Plan update, Porter Cologne, which isn't a standard of you know, jeopardy for endangered species, but is really about all beneficial uses and, and getting above what is otherwise a floor that the ESA uh, sets. And so there too, uh, there can be inconsistencies if we're not all just trying to, to do our best to, to create some, um, again, some, some, some better uh, circumstance in our decision-making space than otherwise um, Mother Nature might provide us. So I appreciate that. Looking to other uh, fellow colleagues, if there's any comment or question for Director Bonham or Mr. Lobachevsky, Vice Chair, please. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for your leadership in you know, keeping um, uh, so extremely focused on this um, at a time where uh, for all of our agencies, we've been busy with drought, but um, Director Bonham, you said it so eloquently that this is a resource of such import that um, uh, these, uh, we need to find a way. We need to find a way to go forward as we are facing additional stressors on the system. And so that's uh, quite a challenge. And so of course, we have a job to do as an independent board and I'm excited about sort of this kickoff for our um, official uh, process going forward. I appreciate Chair Esquivel, your um, question about uh, process and governance. And um, of course, th th that process is underway. We're gonna be doing that now, but I'm um, gonna pose a question about um, how we can, um, or what are your thoughts on uh, keeping uh, the public engaged on the day-to-day assuming that there, that, that there is adoption um, of this other approach. How do we keep the public involved? And I'm looking at you know what we do with periodic review at Salton Sea and that sort of thing, where we really do get um, stakeholders, uh, not, not just those that have signed on, uh, but say for those who haven't, uh, to, to keep them engaged in implementation. 
Well, speaking personally, I think you're a well-positioned venue to add value on that awareness, that reportability, that um, transparency and trackability, if you will. So you typically have workshops each time you meet on something. And I would also say if the collective program were to ask me my advice, I'd say it's in the interest of the agreement participants to find a set of communication tools as well, not, not the marketing, but rather the publication of, the posting of, the centralization, location of, the metrics we're using to track success. As you know, in addition to a term shrinking to eight years as more prudent, there's also a baked in structure that is a colloquially green light, yellow light, red light, where we need to know working with your staff and the participants in each period of assessment, is it working or not? And if it's not working, you are a backstop. And I think we need a centralized way to communicate that information as well. And then I'll give you an example. My department's sister agency, the Fish and Game Commission, is in its every meeting asking some of your staff and mine to appear with Native American tribes and talk about our efforts to save Clear Lake Hitch. And that there's a regular venue we're talking about Clear Lake Hitch in front of the public has been very valuable. Thank you. And then the uh, second question that I had, thanks for uh, talking about restoration. Um, and uh, th this is an area that um, I think, at, as you indicated, flow alone, um, restoration alone isn't gonna get us where we need to be. And so it's the important combination of both. Of course, on day one, flow can occur, but it's gonna take a while on restoration. So um, just would like to hear um, uh, more from you um, about uh, your process. We've got our general order, and I know you're working on process improvements as well, and you talked about the um, uh, time frame improving, mm -hmm. which is great. But the concern that I have is, has, and just not knowing the details, has some of the lower hanging fruit already been picked, and what's coming up, is that gonna be harder? just really anxious about you know, making sure these projects are online as soon as possible and would like to hear just a little bit more from um, either one of you on that. We're in a better spot than we were a year ago or 18 months ago for three reasons. The first is you now have the two main uh, fisheries, wildlife agencies on the federal front, NIMPS and National Marine Fisheries Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with programmatic biological opinions for restoration. So those in the room that want to talk just about voluntary agreements, you need to step back and just let's talk about restoration a moment overall, which is in everyone's interest. And then on our end, we have more streamlined permitting ability within the California ESA and for restoration also within CEQA. And you have a general order. So people are using those tools more, more often and more volume-wise, more people are using them. Second point, uh, with Eric's leadership, we spent about six months going to every tributary and saying, what's on your docket in the next three to five year planning horizon? So we have this meta spreadsheet of probably 400 projects. Turns out um, everyone's view of what's shovel ready is slightly different. And you really have to go to the proponent world and push, where are you in entitlements? What review have you completed? Do you actually have the budget you think you need, and then let's unpack all of that to identify what are the barriers to implementation of your project. That is how we're approaching this now with the multidisciplinary integrated staff team amongst our agencies. Those are all promising. So we have an idea of what we can get done this calendar year, the calendar year after, and the calendar year after that. Over to you, Eric. 
Yeah, I thank you for that question, and um, thank you, Director Bonham. I, I think it's uh, the alignment of um, a lot of these programmatic permitting efforts, um, some reasonable uh, budget that we have to work from, and then the collaboration that I feel like I'm seeing a little differently than I've seen in the past um, between the lead or um, state federal agencies and an individual project proponent and an ability to communicate a little more regularly between the two. It, it appears to be setting a good um, foundation for making progress on implementation quicker. And yes, as some of the um, easier projects, if you will, that low hanging fruit, you know, definitely has been picked, but um, you know, that means it's on to some harder projects in, in areas, but with the alignment of those elements, um, Director Bonham mentioned, um, and, and you know, my hope is we can really tackle those harder projects, and you know, it bears some possibility that those more complicated projects may do bigger things than that lower hanging fruit. Sorry, one more, just last question here. Um, I just want to take advantage of uh, you being here today, Director Bonham. I know that um, we've talked um, uh, directly about this on a number of occasions, but predation, other stressors in the system, and I know that part of our plan, you know, does include uh, other authorities. And so, wanted to just uh, hear from you um, about uh, um, the, the role that predation um, has in uh, uh, in the voluntary agreement, um, if not want to give you an opportunity to talk about uh, your um, activities in that area. Um, I know that um, in the uh, public water agency community and the ag community, this is an issue of great concern, but um, w there's also been a lot of work done such that we understand we can't just wave a magic wand. And it can mm -hmm. be rather nuanced, and so uh, I just want to get your current thinking on uh, uh, possibilities for um, specific um, hotspot type controls. Want to note that I know it may be a short answer because I think Director Bonham does. Uh, he will have to be uh, stepping out soon. So just wanted to apologize for other board members. But no problem. Um, the <laughs> in in my experience in the water space, there is a fair amount of finger pointing and finger wagging that happens and it can beat the energy and the spirit out of you. So my view on predation is as follows. It's a limiting factor to native fish and it ought to be put into an approach where we're trying to tackle all the limiting factors. Is it the single biggest limiting factor driving native salmon and smelt populations down? Absolutely not. But should we ignore it with our head in the sand? Equally, absolutely not. So I think we've all worked ourselves to a spot where we're willing to accept and acknowledge we need to actively manage this concern. I think the most sophisticated way to handle it is in hotspot targeting and treat it as a test and learn so we can gather better data on overall effectiveness and then kind of think through whether the effort needed, the effectiveness, and how that factors in. That's included in this effort, both on our scientific front and our action front. Is it what some water agencies want entirely? No. Uh, is it ignoring and refusing to deal with the topic? No. Um, so I'm confident if enough of us would rise up and work together, voluntarily add flow to the river systems, do mammoth habitat restoration, advance science collaboratively, tackle predation and other things, we can make a difference here. Thank you, Vice Chair. And thank you, Director Bonham. I know you have a congressional item and, and just appreciate your time. And again, leadership in all of this, we'll continue to have discussion for sure. So thank you. It's a really great presentation our collective staffs have. I've seen it a couple of times. So I hope you reach a similar conclusion on their work product that I have. Thank you, Director.
We still have uh, Mr. Lobachevsky here, though, for, I know, I apologize. I, I know there's, I'm sure, additional questions from, from board at this time. Board Member McGuire. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Lobachevsky, for, for being here, and Director Bonham, as you're on the way out. Um, so I'll kind of retool my question a bit. Um, I think we heard a lot from staff here um, about the timeline and the process and all the work that needs to happen over the next 18 months just to get the, um, the Bay Delta plan itself updated. And I think you both had articulated a lot of the work that's continuing with the voluntary agreements. When you look at the governance process, the science and monitoring, Chair Esquivel mentioned some of these, you know, the science plan and the strategic plan. There's a lot of pieces to a really complicated proposal. Um, and so I just would like to hear from you a little bit more about um, your process and your timeline for those pieces and how you see those coming together in the in the coming months. Um, you know, as Director Bonham mentioned, it's a program of implementation to be considered as an alternative. So to me, you know, as a board member, it's important to understand what all those pieces are and the, and the details matter um, as, you know, we take all this into consideration through our, our Bay Delta plan update process. So could you speak a little bit to what we should expect, what the public should expect? You know, I heard an, also a desire for better coordination with, uh, you know, non-governmental organizations, with tribes. And so I think, you know, all of those pieces, you know, I would like to understand what your vision is uh, from here, you know, from this point going forward. Sure. Yeah, thank you for, for that question. And yes, there's, you know, just straight up acknowledging there's a lot of moving pieces here um, and timelines are, are tight. Um, we, we are, uh, you know, Director Bonham mentioned, you know, uh, his agency is intending to bring on a few extra staff to help kind of coordinate their efforts, you know, in support of a potential voluntary agreement. Um, our department is doing similar and, and that staffing capacity is going to help us move these pieces together quicker. Um, but we, we need to make sure that in doing so that we're engaging, you know, the broader community, including the board, board staff, um, and the public where we can. We have an intent to ha establish a website um, through CNRA um, to showcase some of these materials as they get developed um, and you know, provide some venue for feedback processes. It's not going to get, we don't want to interfere with the board process you know, and the public um, spectrum either. Um, what else do you want to say on that uh, front? Um, it, I think we would be doing everything we can to support developing the materials needed to showcase we have a robust program to implement, you know, ahead of the board considering for adoption. And so you know, that is governance pieces, that is science and monitoring, um, that is the detailed plan for, okay, you, you know, we have all seen these tables on, you know, flow, for example, but what is the exact plan for the deployment of that? And we do have all of those work streams that, you know, have, they're in various states of completeness, if you will. Um, but, but we are getting those together in a way that can be showcased to, you know, the board staff, the board and the public on how we would intend to implement, um, you know, that voluntary agreement package as a whole, you know, when the time comes and if adoption was, was considered. Did I hit that enough? Is yeah, I think so. I think that's helpful. I think the the commitment for a website and yeah. um, continuing to you know make efforts to be transparent about the information as it's being developed. Again, I acknowledge it's it's very complicated and you have a lot of moving parts, um, which is why it's important to understand what all those parts are and how they're beginning to coalesce. So you know, thank you for the update, and I'll look forward to more information. Yeah, and then, and then in terms of, you know, inclusion, you know, I, I want to be clear, you know, we have, uh, you know, I know there's various states of opinions out there, but, um, you know, to re-message something that, that we did um, back in, um, I believe it was early April, you know, the, the VA governance, at least we're calling it the early implementation for VA governance process is, is open to organizations that, you know, California Native American tribes, and on NGOs that, that you know have relevant interest at participating, um, you know, the date has been a pretty light um, attendance um, from those entities, and we we would really 
like and welcome their um, participation in, in that process. So that, you know, I just want to make sure that that message has been delivered, that that, that door, proverbial door is still open. Thank you. Thank you, board member. Board member Firestone. Yeah, I, thanks for the presentation and, um, and all the work that's gone into uh, coming here today. Um, I know a ton has, has been going on. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the discussion and, and questions from all the board members. I think they hit on areas that I am um, particularly focused on as we're looking at this. Definitely, um, I think governance and, um, at, you know, I know that's in process, but um, we certainly have um, an, um, a required and important core role around um, around public process and transparency, and we have a lot of policies that we are um, working through on being able to better um, engage with tribes and sovereign nations as well. Um, I, as we, you know, I, I, I believe the governance plans are in development, but as you mentioned, there certainly hasn't been adequate involvement um, thus far. And so I know that's the point of developing the governance structure is is start is trying to shift that. Um, I, you know, I, I think as you do that, making sure that there's not um, unworkable expectations around um, having sort of uh, signature signatories that can't sovereign nations signing on to um, charters and such I think is just not going to be realistic um, or even probably a, appropriate um, there's uh, I think a, a good point around um, you know the importance of both a really involved public process within the day-to-day -day work of um, the, the parties um, and implementation, we can see, you know, we talked about the overall process here with the STEM group in implementation on the um, uh, San Joaquin River um, implementation. I think there's a lot more we need to do around um, being able to engage even as an example within that. And I think there's a lot of learning we can do to um, head that off from the beginning. Uh, I, um, I think there's a lot of learning around, I, I, I really appreciate now, I, I think maybe um, Vice Chair Diadama, you, you mentioned um, the Salton Sea and kind of learning from that. I think that's a really great example of when there is a, um, an agreement um, that affects a lot of third parties, um, and if you know our we have an oversight role on it um, and a process we need to do around it. It's very you know there's a lot that's totally different from it, but I I think it is an important learning space. Um, I, you know, uh, one thing I wanted to flag within that is I think there's a lot of learning around um, uh, in addition to public process and metrics and monitoring, um, I think just around um, the, the speed in terms of implementation. And this right now, I mean, I know that's, again, been a theme. And Vice Chair Diadamo, you, you mentioned um, that's what a lot of your questions were around. Um, the um, I'm new to a lot of this area around um, Bay Delta work and um, just understanding programs like Eco Restore, um, which I, I think, you know, there's, a, um, I know there's a lot of improvements that um, uh, Director Bonham mentioned and streamlining that we're all doing, but um, just looking at, you know, based on what's on the website, um, which I think is, is was updated um, in 2021. So six years into the process, um, there was, you know, I think um, 4.5 um, projects out of 26 projects that were actually completed, um, and and much very low percentage. I'm 
not good at math in my head of the um, of the acres. And so, you know, when we have a, a voluntary agreement that is eight years, I think that's going to be just a fundamental challenge. Is we have to see results a lot more quickly than we've done in the past. And so, I know that's a, a um, been a theme here, uh, but is um, I think a, a reality check for all of us um, as we look at even the scientific basis, what do we think we're gonna be able to, to actually see and do? Um, so, um, and I, I, I guess just um, lastly, and, and this goes to um, also another theme, I think is just, you know, in the San Joaquin River, we have adopted a, a um, an amendment and uh, we have a backstop for any voluntary agreements, essentially. Um, I don't know if that's the right word, but we have a, um, you know, a, a plan and a process going forward that allows for the kind of innovation um, and adaptation um, that we need to be able to be successful. Um, in particularly voluntary agreements. I think that was the, certainly the intention and, and um, uh, even more so, I think, as we have been going through the phases on Sacramento and, and the Delta um, uh, phase of the Bay Delta plan. But I just, I, I do think as we go through just making sure that we're not um, having to start the, the whole process over after eight years of learning, um, given, I, I think in the presentation there was some discussion of, um, you know, we've had voluntary agreements in the Delta of different sorts in the past and then they expire and then we, we it takes us a long time to update them. <laughs> um, we don't want to be in that position again. Um, so it just as we go through this process, that's I think a really core thing for us as a board to make sure that we're doing. I think everyone understands that, but just wanted to, you know, share kind of areas I think that I want to really understand as we go through this process. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, thank you for that. And I mean, I, I'm hearing a big theme of, you know, learning from what we've done in the past. And, you know, I, I wholly agree. And, you know, where we can turn to other processes, consultancy, for example, um, you know, whether that's in the front of, you know, inclusion of other parties, the public involvement, um, or, or more, you know, to the not reinventing the wheel type of thing. Um, you know, I think we definitely have a keen eye out towards um, building up, uh, upon what we've learned. You know, and then in terms of like, you know, if we hit that eight year, you know, if the VAs were to be adopted and we would hit that eight year term, I mean, I think the intent is we would want to not then spend another five years figuring out what we want the next term of, of the VAs to look like. We, we would like to use what we've learned during that time period and immediately launch into the next term with, you know, any necessary um, adjustments, um, you know, as it would, as the science would, would deem necessary. Um, yeah, I mean, hitting on, you know, implementation speed, I, I again, I, I think that is something we all need to be cognitive of, reality check. Um, I, I, my hope is that when we do have the collection of the items that, Director Bonham and myself touched on earlier, um, it, it is putting us in a little better space than I feel like we've been in, you know, historically, to hit that implementation harder and quicker. I mean, it's you know, on my director's radar every single day. I don't want to speak for Director Bonham, but I suspect it is similarly. So I, I think, um, you know, we just keeping that push and focus um, on implementing these projects quick needs to stay at the top of the list. Um, I think the only thing I just probably add in just in case it wasn't clear at some point um, this morning is um, as part of the voluntary agreement process, you know, we would be planning on an annual reporting process, both on flow, habitat measures, um, you know, and then there is, a, I believe it's a built in um, three year and six year check in that's a lot more of a robust engagement, if you will, that's not just a, a report. So. Um, you know, that, that is some of the, the um, more process pieces that I, I would hope would help keep um, things on a very positive trajectory. 
Great, thank you. And just to kind of add on, you know, there's, I think there's a, a lot of learning that um, of what not of, of how to do things better um, <laughs> from a, a lot of the salt and sea work um, for a variety of reasons. But um, I, I think one thing that's particularly challenging with uh, with this is just is how comprehensive and huge this is. And so um, kind of recognizing that, um, you know, all the details matter, um, each of the tributaries and, um, and different projects affect um, not only that collective, but also very localized stakeholders. And so it presents a real challenge in terms of uh, governance and engagement. But um, I think, you know, just as we are um, just developing, I think, real models for how we're going to do that effectively in a really collaborative manner is going to make it successful. Um, so just, again, a lot of challenges. This is particularly hard on so many levels. but. Um, you know, appreciate the attention. Yes, I did, totally uh, makes sense there. And, um, you know, and then, you know, in that that vein, you know, any input that the board board staff can provide, you know, with um, you all's know, experience over the years at implementing um, these <laughs> very large, complex and, um, and complicated uh, processes, you know, I think we would welcome um, that type of input as well. Thank you, Mr. Lovachevsky. And thank you, board member. Um, agree with many of the points you're making. I think for me, the importance of where we are on this project is it's not an either or when it comes to the board standard setting, standard setting and, and the science and even the, the way we're all collectively looking at the system. We have to see the same system together. We can't be creating different realities for each other. And so um, I think we risk otherwise doing like CalFed 2.0 which I think, you know, keeps me up at night uh, most. So just thank you. I really, I really appreciate this exchange and, and the discussion we've had so far. And thank you, Mr. Lobachevsky and Director Bonham for the time here this morning. It's meant uh, enriched what is going to be a lot more discussion, I know. So uh, thank you. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you as well. Transitioning back to our folks here, if there's anything to say further, um, and if not, we can also then start to hear from some of our commenters. Um, and actually, since we are at nearly 11 o'clock and we lost one of my board members, let's take a 10-minute break, and then we can transition into some comments um, from, I know we have folks waiting uh, to, to begin that, and then uh, we can uh, get into our next item as well. So thank you, everyone.
Okay, everyone, I think we can begin to gather back now. I appreciate uh, the break. Uh, just for everyone's planning purposes, uh, we do have about 14 or so commenters. And so we'll work our way uh, through those commenters and then go ahead and take a lunch and then we'll come in fresh onto item uh, number nine. So, uh, so thanks everyone. I think our first commenter up here is David Guy. Good morning. I think you may need to turn on uh, the microphone. Apologies, Mr. Guy. Uh, uh, there's a button right there. All right. I thought I did it automatically there. Is that better? Yeah, thank Thanks. you. No, yeah, this is all push button here. That's <laughs> good, good to see well, you. It's great to be in the, in the boardroom with you guys. That's always a nice a reminder of how much we enjoy this. Um, anyway, thank you uh, for the opportunity here today. Uh, David Guy, Northern California Water Association. And I uh, just really wanted to just provide a quick uh, kind of overview on some of the the thinking around uh, the voluntary agreements, uh, you know, what we're calling Healthy Rivers California. Um, and we just really appreciate the effort by the governor, really appreciate by the effort by the board here to kind of move that forward and uh, listening to uh, Director Bonham and, and Eric as well, uh, the, uh, the effort that's being put in. There's a lot of work being done. Uh, one of the things I think, you know, when you hear the comments today, I know you're going to hear a lot of comments. You're probably not going to hear a lot of people that are working on the voluntary agreements coming today uh, because that's not what they do. But I can uh, assure you that there's a lot of people working on the voluntary agreements. We have the best and the brightest in just about every discipline uh, working on this. And you're going to be hearing a little bit about that. Uh, I'm going to be here joined today by uh, Thad Bettner and uh, Michelle uh, Benonis, if that's OK with you all. And uh, at least uh, two of our rivers were also, in addition to the Sacramento and the American, working obviously with the Yuba, the Feather, uh, the P Pewter Creek, as well as uh, Cache Creek. So uh, a lot of uh, a lot of work being done on that. Um, anyway, we uh, bottom line is we just feel like the State Water Board is really on the right track um, and pointing in the right direction, and we just want to want to lodge you uh, for that. Um, I know you're going to talk about the scientific basis report later, um, but again, we'll be providing detailed comments on that uh, by uh, February 8th, like I think a lot of folks. Uh, but just want to say that that's you know in our view, this process is pointing in uh, the right direction. In the Sacramento River Basin, uh, we're going to be delivering uh, about 250,000 acre feet of water under the uh, for flows into the river and the Delta, and that, of course, is going to be done in conjunction with uh, modern infrastructure and uh, various habitat enhancements on the river. Plus, uh, there's a significant effort to really reactivate the floodplain, which is what uh, really gets us uh, excited. We think the, the landscape approach uh, that uh, everybody is uh, thinking about, that the UC Davis scientists are all pointing us towards, is uh, very exciting and will be uh, very much a, a part of this. We think that's going to be where the real benefits to fish and wildlife will uh, come. And, we're just looking forward to, to mobilizing that out on the ground. Uh, we do obviously need a, a strong scientific basis report to support that over the next eight to 15 years. And uh, we'll be again providing more detailed comments on that. Uh, but we really do uh, think that it's pointing in the right direction. And uh, we'll be uh, offering some thoughts on how to improve that process. But generally, the conclusions are good. And we want to keep uh, pushing that forward. We also really liked the term that uh, Director Bonham used, the collective, I think. I, don't, I think you, I heard it from him, but I think several folks have mentioned that. This is a collective, obviously, and uh, we want to be working together uh, on a new way forward, uh, really to collaborate. I think that's what this process is showing as much as anything, is that there is a new way forward to work together. We think that can also uh, translate into some of the other processes that have kind of plagued uh, California water for uh, some in kids 50 years, you know, where we've had acrimony. We think this is a model to help resolving some of those important things like the biops, ITP, FERC proceedings, that type of thing. So we hope that this will uh, not only uh, help uh, solve the immediate problem that you're focused on, but also translate into a larger uh, dynamic where we work together as a uh, collective. So anyway, I just want to encourage you to keep moving forward. Know that there's a lot of people that uh, I'm here today uh, speaking, but there's a lot of people in the Sacramento River Basin and other parts of the water community that are working on this. And uh, we're going to roll up our sleeves and get to work with you guys and just really appreciate you pointing us uh, forward. So thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you, Mr. Guy. I appreciate your words and leadership in uh, the work. Next, I'd like to call up Thad Bentner. Good morning, Mr. Bentner. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the opportunity to be able to, to speak remote. Thanks for David for his opening comments on behalf of the, the SAC Valley um, related, to, related to the voluntary agreements. And first, I just want to thank your staff uh, for getting the scientific basis report out. Um, also to Department of Water Resources and CFW, I think 
you know, we've been working on this for a while and I think the report is a way that kind of gets all that information in one place for, for us to see it, for, for you to see it and for the public to see it. So I really wanna thank your staff for the hard work it took to get that um, to this point. We um, are reviewing it like everybody else. Uh, we have at least me representing some of the interests along the Sacramento River. We have put together a proposal um, that is in the document. Um, we're making sure that um, how it's been framed and, and the benefits we think will provide are, are accurate in the document. And again, look forward to talking to your staff and DWR more about that. But, but just from uh, not diving details, but more from higher level, you know, for us, this is a significant commitment. And I think just from a group of water users, I think we've demonstrated to you as a board and to your staff that we're committed to the environment um, as well as to our region and our local environment that we also provide a lot of resources to and for. Um, you know, this, this is a big deal. You know, for us, um, as David mentioned, the, the Sac Valley is providing about a quarter, quarter of a million acre feet. We're providing 100,000 acre feet. So, you know, almost a third or better than a third of that supply. And likely the outcome for us is, you know, we're probably gonna be taking about 25,000 acres out of production to support that. And that land just doesn't provide, you know, food and fiber, but also provides economic value and, and environmental value as well. So, you know, we're trying to work with our landowners to, to see how we move that process forward. And, you know, that's the water commitment, but also just on the environmental commitment, just, uh, you know, making sure we're committed to the habitat projects that are, that are within the document. So, you know, to me, those are the physical things, but on a bigger, bigger side of things, I think really what we're looking at is, you know, how do we build trust together moving forward to improve the environment and accountability um, by all parties. And really we look at this as an opportunity to improve communication and transparency and, you know, the actions that we're undertaking and, and how the, uh, you know, at least we see these actions improving the environment. And, and a lot of that's obviously focused on in-stream fisheries. And then lastly, we really, um, want to have a, a robust science uh, plan and action plan that includes strong governance. And I think, um, you know, for us, again, just in the actions that we've taken historically, we'd be able to, to show, you know, how we think the VAs will make a difference. So we look forward to, to partnering with you and your staff on this process going forward. And, you know, also want to stay around for the scientific basis report and based on any questions or details and they want to be uh, available to provide comments and answers to questions as well. So thanks for your time this morning. Thanks for yours and for the work, Mr. Bentner. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Michelle Bononis. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Michelle Bononis. I'm with the Regional Water Authority. We represent over 20 water agencies in the Sacramento metropolitan region. Um, on behalf of the American River Water Providers, I'd like to express the gratitude to uh, the State Board and the Board staff for their work on the preparation of the Scientific Basis Report and for this workshop. We're in the process of reviewing the Scientific Basis Report and will be providing comments to buttress its conclusions that the VA's combination of flow and non-flow measures will improve conditions for fish species. More broadly, we also know that the VA will help our region through a mutually beneficial relationship between restored habitat environmental flows, and while not specifically mentioned in the, the scientific basis report, enhanced water resources infrastructure. In the American River region, we have strong partnerships built among water providers, environmental interests, business interests, and the public through the Sacramento Water Forum. The Water Forum has for over 20 years served the role of facilitating water management solutions, including building habitat and developing science programs that have led to improved physical and flow conditions for salmon and steelhead in the lower American River. American River water providers also support a foundational element of the water forum agreement, and that's the implementation of the water forum's flow management standard. The VA is an opportunity to advance this element. The water providers in our region have actively engaged in beneficial conjunctive use during this 20 plus years that the uh, water forum agreement has been in place. And that's actually resulted in improved groundwater levels and the planning and development of the Sacramento Regional Water Bank. The bank will allow the region to store water in wet years and call upon those supplies in dry years. This is the storage that we seek and it's right under our feet. This stored water will be part of the region's VA flow contribution. As a specific, I can't talk. As a specific example, in just a matter of two weeks, 
with just four aquifer storage and recovery wells in recharge mode, while we were experiencing this recent series of atmospheric rivers, the city of Roseville, working with the Bureau of Reclamation, was able to bank enough surface water into the groundwater bank to meet future water needs of 600 households for an entire year. So imagine a future where the water bank, where we're able to use this groundwater banking infrastructure scaled up on a regional level, and then we can also provide more significant benefits to help the environment and meet water needs so sustainably and reliably, working to implement and potentially amplify the benefits from the American Rivers proposed outflow commitments in the voluntary agreements. Further, based on what we've learned from many years of flow and habitat work on the American, the benefits to local aquatic species are likely to be even better than described in the scientific basis report, because we all know that habitat correlations and, with, and flow um, habitat correlations specifically have limitations. So combining new habitat, new flows, new infrastructure, and most importantly, the science and adaptation process called for in the VA, we're anticipating that that will improve outcomes beyond model output. It's with our existing decades long baseline of proven success that the American River Region water providers expressed our continued support for the VA process. This support includes our commitment to the ongoing implementation of habitat restoration and science programs. This support also includes our commitment to implementing modern climate resilient water supply technolo technologies for the Sacramento Regional Water Bank that will benefit both people and fish in the American River Region and beyond. Thank you for your attention, appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Benones. Appreciate your time and commitment and work to this. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Tina Yin. Good morning, Ms. Yin. You should be invited to unmute. Uh, um, you're still, there we are. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to virtually speak to you today. Um, my name is Tina Yin. I am the manager of the Water Quality Standards and Assessment Section at the US EPA Region 9 in San Francisco. My office is responsible for the review and oversight of California's Water Quality Standards Program, as well as its monitoring and water quality assessment programs, such as the Integrated Report and TMDLs. Specifically, we work with states, territories, and tribes to ensure that water quality standards as defined in Clean Water Act Section 303C are protective of both fishable and swimmable uses um, as required by the Clean Water Act. Um, and as you know, this Clean Water Act requires states to periodically, or at least every three years, um, review your standards to ensure they're protective of all beneficial uses, um, which you referred to earlier. Um, states may designate appropriate be beneficial uses and the water quality criteria, or in California speak, objectives, to protect those uses um, and to do so under an open public process. Uh, once adopted by the state, EPA then reviews and approves or disapproves the water quality standards in order for them to be effective for Clean Water Act purposes. Um, it's important to note that EPA can only approve water quality standards that are demonstrated to be based on sound science to support the most sensitive uses or does the most sensitive beneficial uses, in this case, aquatic life, including native fish populations. Board acknowledged that the current flow requirements uh, objectives in the Bay Delta plan are not protective of life beneficial uses and you began a process to revise those standards. It's now 2022 and the objectives in the plan for the Sacramento and its tributaries remain unchanged. Um, just as you may also be aware, the EPA recently received a petition for rulemaking requesting that we establish protective objectives if the state board fails to do so. Um, I wanna acknowledge that the EPA understands that the water board's job here is very complex, including the challenges of drought among other issues. Um, and also, also that we recognize the state board has been making progress as evidence with the adoption of the Lower San Joaquin River objectives and its implementation that we heard from Aaron Forsman earlier, and now this workshop and the next step for the scientific basis report. Um, as you revise the Bay Delta Control Plan, EPA will be looking for objectives, including flow, that improve upon the water quality standards that the board acknowledged need to be revised to protect the aquatic life uses. Um, it's important that I point out that EPA has a mandatory duty to review changes of water quality standards under 303C 
um, and to identify which provisions of the board's actions constitute federal water quality standards. And to do that, we use what is known as the four-part test. This is not always an easy analysis as recent litigation about the board's TUCP indicates. So um, when EPA reviews any final board action, we'll be evaluating the provisions in their entirety, whether described as objectives or in the program of implementation, such as the voluntary agreements, to identify those provisions that are considered water quality standards under the Clean Water Act. Um, for those, we have a mandatory duty to review and approve or disapprove to ensure that the water quality standards are consistent with our regulations, are protective of all beneficial uses as evidenced by sound science. Um, our review includes consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service to assess the potential impact, impacts um, of the standards on threatened and endangered species that are protected under the Federal Endangered Species Act. EPA also engages, is required to engage in government to government consultation with Indian tribes that may have an interest in these actions. And so we will also be doing that as a part of our review. Um, we did hear a bit this morning and, and we'll continue to hear about the voluntary agreements as a part of your program implementation. I wanna make it clear, EPA supports a multi-pronged watershed approach as a solution to restoring um, our waterways and aquatic life but habitat restoration is but one critical element of uh, effective restoration projects um, and is not alone an alternative to having specific objectives, including flow to maintain water quality to support all aquatic life uses. So myself and my team will continue to work with your staff as well as yourselves as you move forward on the revisions of the Bay Delta plan. And we look forward to um, helping the state get to standards and objectives that are protective of all beneficial uses. Thank you, Ms. Yin. I appreciate that partnership uh, here across local, state, and federal uh, laws and, and obligations. I think we have an opportunity to, in fact, again, uh, align and ensure that we're um, being protective and importantly, uh, have a sense of urgency around this work. I, I hear uh, your comments and you hear know that this is a top priority for the board. Uh, we continue to, to drive on the work and importantly ensure that all voices are part of our very public process. Um, I do have one question, uh, feeling that urgency uh, and knowing that we've submitted uh, phase one standards to uh, the region, where is the region on approval of those standards uh, currently? We are currently engaged in informal consultation with the services on completing our biological evaluation on those standards, and we are planning to act on uh, the lower San Juan standard. Great, thank you, appreciate it. And uh, thank you again for the participation. We now move to on to our next commenter, and we have uh, up Mark uh, Rafferty. And Mr. Rafferty had indicated he would participate on the Zoom platform and we have not yet seen him there. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Valerie Kincaid and uh, Tim Wachowski. Thank you, Valerie Kincaid, on behalf of the San Joaquin Tributaries Authority. Um, it's good to see everyone in person and um, be here. I appreciate the very comprehensive update by staff. Um, my comments are just gonna focus on one very specific component of that update, and that's the STM group, the Stanislaus Tuolumne and Merced Working Group. I know that the SJTA and other members have invested in that group and are sending um, technical expertise. That group has a, a very impressive um, a, a amount of technical expertise and industry knowledge in the room. Um, and so far, that group has mostly been led by um, staff presentations and um, state water board staff. And I think as everyone knows, the, the, the requirement is to receive STM recommendations from the entire group. Um, I think there's a real opportunity to engage with this group and to really um, mine that technical expertise and I think a few more meetings within that group would really maximize who's at the table and, and, and allow the ability for that technical expertise to come in and really make robust recommendations to the board. 
So the SJTA is recommending that that group continue to be involved, continue to convene, and um, in order to kind of provide the, the responses of the group to staff, um, our recommendation is meeting several more times, at least two, to provide those recommendations to the State Water Board. We think that would be, again, a great maximization of, of a healthy and existing back and forth process um, that, as many people have said, you, we rarely see, but um, we are seeing um, with the input and, and, and participation by, by so many good, good people. So we suggest expanding that, continuing to meet, having at least two more meetings to really receive correct um, uh, input to the, so what so far has been a State Water Board staff presentation. Um, so that's our request and we will continue to stay at the table and look forward to working on that process together. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Kincaid. I appreciate that participation. I know um, the Vice Chair and I have uh, spoken about uh, the, the good uh, environment that it, we feel the STEM group is really providing where people are listening. These are not, as we all well know, very complex issues and uh, sometimes uh, some, some hard feelings. And I think that we've been able to work through a lot of that and seeing the tone of that discussion has been actually um, very heartening to see. So I just wanna appreciate and thank you for the participation around yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's hard to get people together like that. And it, it wasn't easy to convince everyone to get there. So we appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Next, uh, I have up uh, James Lynch, who will be followed by Barry Nelson and then Heinrich Albert. Thank you, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Jim Lynch. I'm a fisheries biologist with HDR Engineering, and I'm speaking on behalf of Merced Irrigation District today. Uh, Merced Irrigation District is appreciative of all the hard work that's been done uh, to advance the Bay Delta update. Uh, they are a bit frustrated. Uh, they feel they've offered and had discussions regarding uh, a deal that could bring them into a VA. Uh, but those haven't come to fruition yet. Uh, they would like me to pass along that they're very eager to do so, and they encourage the appropriate uh, staff to reach out to them to continue those discussions. They are they would like to be part of this process in a more formal process in a more formal way, uh, but I would encourage someone to reach out to them to continue those discussions. They've sort of uh, floundered. And that's the extent of my, and I would say that I also uh, echo the comments on the STM. I've, I've participated in those meetings and I found them extremely productive, very non-positional and uh, the people who have participated have been very professional and advanced the ideas, including including State Board staff. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Lynch. It means a lot and appreciate the engagement. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Barry Nelson, followed by Heinrich Alpert, and then John McManus. Thank you, Chairman and Board Members. Barry Nelson with Golden State Salmon Association. Uh, I'm gonna only speak briefly about two issues. You, you know that the environmental and fishing communities and other communities have deep substantive concerns about the VAs. I, I'm not gonna take time now to summarize those, um, but I would like to talk about two issues. First is there's an assumption in the discussion we've heard this morning, the board has heard this morning, uh, that, that you are going to see a complete enforceable uh, voluntary agreement package soon. And, and that, that may not be the case. Um, what you have right now is a term sheet that's frankly quite similar to term sheets, different term sheets that you've seen for, for many years. Um, and that term sheet leaves many, many unanswered questions. Um, I just shared with the board clerk, who will pass on to board members, a fact sheet that summarizes the voluntary agreement timeline. And what it shows is a long pattern of the voluntary agreement process, setting deadlines to produce a complete package and then failing to meet those deadlines. Um, uh, the, de the first deadline that we found in doing this work was in 2014, but there were, there was another, and I mean, there've been seven deadlines. There've been a lot of them. And each time the VA process has set a deadline to produce a final package and then failed to meet that deadline. Um, um, and I simply want to make sure that the board understood that we may not be much farther along than we have been in years past toward a complete VA package uh, and urge the board to keep making progress. If you want to encourage a, a, a volunteer agreement 
Um, the best way you can do that is by keep moving forward with your existing process. Second concern is about governance. Um, 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 and the comments from many folks about transparency, um, that governance package was draft package was submitted to the board in August. We only got it relatively recently. Um, and it wasn't given to us by DWR or CDFW or any of the VA participants. Um, we had to we had to work to get that package. Um, and, and it raises real concerns about transparency. We're working on comments on that governance package. That package still has major substantive flaws and unanswered questions. But I, I wanted to note uh, with regard to governance and transparency that I was really concerned about some of the comments you've heard today about transparency. Um, disappointed with DWR's comments about public engagement. Uh, disappointed with Mr. Guy's statements about the best and the brightest being involved in the VA process. Um, none of that is true. Um, all of the interests who have been harmed by the decline of the Bay Delta, uh, Delta interests, environmental issues, interests, fishing interests, tribal interests, uh, environmental group, the justice groups who track these issues, uh, all of our interests have been frozen out of the existing voluntary agreement process. Um, uh, the state has laws, the state board has policies about public engagement, um, as well as specifically engagement with communities of color and tribes. Um, and frankly, what we've seen in the voluntary agreement process is a concerted effort to bypass all of those requirements. The public deserves a better answer about how state agencies will ensure that the public, including communities of color and tribes, are not frozen out of a process that looks to us as though it's being designed to replace a traditional update uh, of the Bay Delta Plan by the board. Uh, and frankly, when that effort to engage our communities begins, um, we also want to know if that is going to be a meaningful effort, or frankly, if the deal will have been, been cut uh, before we're invited be, to be engaged. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Appreciate your engagement, uh, words, and work here. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Heinrich Alpert, uh, who will be followed by John McManus and then Michael Cook. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, I think that this process uh, of trying to update and improve conditions, the biological conditions in the Bay Delta estuary and in the tributaries has dragged on way, way too long. I don't see any indication that this voluntary agreement process has any more chance than uh, the past efforts to actually change the conditions um, in the system. Um, I think that in most of the tributaries, maybe not all, but most of the tributaries and in the Delta itself, that conditions for fish and other wildlife have just continued to deteriorate through all this time. I think it's really important that we actually move ahead. And if these voluntary agreement process does not produce concrete uh, agreements for real to achieve real biological goals we need to move ahead and implement the bay delta update thank you very much thank you uh, next i'd like to call up john mcmanus uh, michael cook and then castle willing I'm trying to get to you guys. Can you see me? Can. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. John McManus, President of Golden State Salmon Association. Most of you know me, some don't. We represent sport and commercial salmon fishing interests, coastal ports all up and down the state. Um, one thing I'd like to flag to your attention that you may not have heard is uh, we've had a very poor return of adult salmon to the Central Valley this past year in 2022. We won't know official numbers for about another month, but um, it looks like we're in pretty bad shape. 
state officials have told us they haven't seen these kind of returns since 2007. And you'll recall that we were shut down from fishing for the first time ever in 2008 and 2009 as a result of those poor returns. These poor returns come because of the way the Central Valley water operations have been going. And in any voluntary agreement going forward, it looks uh, like we need some uh, considerably greater flow contributions to get to where we need to be. Um, we've seen Delta smelt basically go functionally extinct in the wild, although I understand five of them have been picked up at the pumps recently. Um, we're still studying the scientific basis report, um, but uh, the best available science that we're aware of all points to flow as the primary constraint on um, salmon health in the Central Valley. And it doesn't look like the scientific basis report adequately reflects that. The other thing that appears to be lacking is um, re requirements and information regarding temperature controls. Uh, we've seen salmon runs in both the American River and the Feather River below the Thermolito outlet basically get wiped out as a result of hot water being poured on salmon eggs that are buried in the gravel, fertilized, but never hatched. Uh, we've seen the same thing in the upper Sacramento River, both with winter run, which has been well documented, and with fall run, which has been less well documented. So without uh, more information about how temperatures are going to be addressed and how flow during the crucial springtime out migration for juvenile salmon are going to be addressed. Uh, it appears to us at this point that the uh, report is inadequate. Uh, I will also just comment that I was encouraged by the comments from the speaker from US EPA who seemed to point to similar things. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McManus. Appreciate your words, uh, engagement, and continued work around this. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Michael Cook, uh, who will be followed by Castle Willie and then Kate Drill. Uh, thank you, Chair Escavel, members of the board. My name is Michael Cook. I'm Director of Water Resources for the Turlock Irrigation District. Uh, Turlock Irrigation District and its partners on the Tuolumne are very pleased to have signed the MOU with state agencies to develop a voluntary agreement. We recognize that the Tuolumne MOU was signed too late for us to be considered in the scientific basis report for the phase two agencies, which you'll hear about in your next item. But as staff noted today, um, there is a pathway to incorporate the recent Tuolumne River VA into a Delta watershed-wide voluntary agreement, which, we've, which would be consistent with your um, paragraph seven, seven of your resolution in 2018 that adopted the phase one update to the Bay Delta plan. So we're glad to be part of the program and we look forward to future collaboration with you and the entire state team on this important work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, uh, I'd like to call up Castle Willie, who will be followed by Kate Dro and then Barbara Berrigan Perea. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Casil Willey. I'm a staff attorney for State of California Salmon. Uh, in 2016, the State Water Board made it a priority to recognize and incorporate tribal beneficial uses into water, control, water quality control plans. And in 2017, three new definitions were established. I noticed that in the presentation earlier that tribal beneficial uses are still not being included in the list of beneficial uses for the Bay Delta plan. The regional water boards are in the process of adopting the new tribal beneficial use definitions and the state water board should be doing the same for its water quality plans as well. I encourage efforts to incorporate the tribal beneficial uses through an amendment or another method going into the future. Next, I would like to address the VAs and I won't go into detail, but I'd like to hammer home the importance of involving tribes, environmental justice communities and conservation groups in the process. There cannot be a true collective until everyone not only has a seat at the table, but is seated at the table and has the opportunity to speak. Moving forward, I hope that agencies involved will effectively listen to and incorporate the valid concerns that these groups have with the VAs. I will hold my further comments for later today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Willey. I appreciate those. And actually, if I can uh, quickly look to um, Ms. Riddle, you know, when it comes to the incorporation of tribal beneficial uses, yes, the regional board is doing that work. 
Uh, can you explain um, how that ultimately um, incorporates into our work and the difference then when it comes to the flow standards we're looking at and the tribal beneficial uses, which um, again uh, are being done just so that there's some clarity there. Sure, and I might let Tina chime in as well. Um, my understanding of the efforts that the regional boards are taking is the tribal beneficial uses. Um, their water quality control plans are primarily constituent um, related, and I think the request to add tribal beneficial uses to the Bay Delta plan would apply those beneficial uses to the flow objectives that the board adopts. Um, and I think that's something we could certainly do. They, the concern that we've had is the time issue we've heard today a lot about the significant amount of time it's taken to date to develop efforts to update and implement the Bay Delta plan. Um, I think that might be something that the board should prioritize as the next step beyond this review. That might be something that we could do, but I, I think there is a differentiation between the actions that the regional board is taking and um, the consideration of tribal beneficial uses by the state water board. Um, and, you know, again, I think that is something that there is, you know, at least some interest in considering. But again, um, it's a complicated, complex issue. And given the complexities that are already involved in the planning processes, um, that might be something the board would consider um, prioritizing, maybe even on a time schedule for a future update after we get through those that are currently um, on our plate. Thank you, I appreciate that. Anything? Thank you, Ms. Leahy. Next, I'd like to call up Kate Drow, uh, who will be followed by Barbara berrigan Faria, and then Gary Bobker. And I'm not seeing Kate Drow on the platform. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Laffer. And Ms. Drow, if you are viewing uh, potentially through one of the live webcasts uh, and having trouble getting on the platform, do uh, email board.clerk at waterboards.ca.gov and we can help get you on the platform. Next, I'd like to call up Barbara Berrigan Perea, who we followed by uh, Gary Bobker and then uh, Regina Chigazola. Good morning, Chair Esquivel and board members. Good to see you in person. I wanted to comment <clears throat> regarding governance, um, what was described in the presentations earlier today. Asking tribes, which are sovereign nations, community groups, and environmental justice groups, the most directly impacted parties uh, by flow conditions to participate in governance in an afterthought email, which happened this past summer, after the VA plan was essentially sketched out without including any of our concerns. Well, we see this as morally wrong and an unjust. The VAs have been perhaps the most poorly executed governance process we have seen in 16 years of Delta advocacy. Delta local community uh, groups, our local government agencies, we were left out from the start. I can't help but believe that that was intentional. Because of this deficiency in inclusion, as Barry Nelson mentioned, presently you do not have in full force working on the VAs at the table the best and the brightest in California. Our communities know what we need, we understand our needs. You don't have people working on solving problems like the harmful algal bloom situation, which continues to worsen and is directly tied to flows. I'm disturbed hearing that governance will be fixed because these parties should now join the process um, as a way to make up for the mistakes uh, that were made at the beginning. Um, and it doesn't, it won't work because we're not seeing what we needed to have included included in the items we're gonna address under item number nine. So I'll save those comments for later. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate your time, uh, attendance and continued work around this. Next, I'd like to call up Gary Bobker, followed by Regina Chikazola and then Valentina Dimas. Great, thank you. 
Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Good Gary Bocker, my institute. Um, you know, ostensibly this is uh, this item, I think, is the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan update, although we've mostly heard about the VAs. So uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to beat a drum I haven't beaten uh, before you for a while. Uh, and uh, But I'm going to return to, to that subject, and that is uh, the time it's taking you to complete the Water Quality Control Plan update. In December 2018, I think the board took the right tack, which was uh, to go ahead and adopt uh, amendments to the water quality control plan indicate that they remained open to any uh, constructive and creative uh, new approaches that they would uh, analyze uh, in due time, but that would not stop them from adopting uh, regulations or implementing them. Uh, unfortunately, since then, we've seen real delays both in implementing the phase one amendments and in producing the environmental documents for uh, phase two, and uh, you know, you have you have adopted the the phase one regulations. You have a solid foundation in the reports you've already issued to to uh, get the environmental documents for phase two out. Um, and instead, we're still here. Um, you know, really, the process has been delayed. A lot of staff re energy and resources have been diverted to the VA, um, and uh, I, I just really urge you once again, to move forward more expeditiously, focusing on the foundation that you have. VAs, which are still in pretty crude, rough draft form, can and should be evaluated by the board, but they really are implementation or should be implementation programs. So the board can go ahead, not only implement phase one, but, go, but adopt phase two regulations, and that doesn't foreclose uh, on the possibility uh, or even probability that VAs could be developed that fall within the parameters of what the board considers acceptable. In fact, I'll go further than that. The more clear and firm you are about what your regulatory requirements are, the more likely that you will have VAs presented to you that actually can survive legal and political challenge. You do not have VAs in front of you yet which can do that, which is clear because of the complete lack of support from so many vital sectors of the folks who are affected by decisions about California water. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I'm talking to the wind here or not, but um, you know, it's never too late to um, to, to to press on and uh, and and complete the update uh, in a more expeditious manner. So uh, with that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bobker. Appreciate your words and know that that sense of urgency is at least from here uh, in this seat. And it's why, as you've heard, uh, we've laid out a schedule here these next two years that is actually still pretty ambitious for the scope of work that still needed to be done. So I, I appreciate uh, the urging and, and the goading, if you will, uh, and know that uh, it is a priority to get these done. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Regina Chikazola, to be followed by Valentina uh, Dimas, and then our last commenter will be uh, Peter Drackmeyer, I believe. Hello, um, my name is Regina Chikazola. I am from the state of California Salmon. Um, and I wanted to just say that I do not think politics is what should decide what happens with the Bay Delta plans and the VAs, unfortunately, are very much based on politics and not based on science. Um, and they're incomplete. Um, we've given over five or almost five years um, for the VA process to move forward. Um, now we're looking at VA science instead of a peer review scientific report that called for flows. Um, and now that there's already been five years of or four years of talks um, and already been agreements, we're getting invite, we're being told that there's invites for tribes and NGOs to be part of governance. I mean, is that how consultation works in the state of California now? Um, water users get to decide what is going to happen, get to decide what science is gonna be used and then everyone else can have a say. 
Um, I don't think that's how this board has approached things, and I don't think this, that's how this board should approach things. Um, I was in the room in 2018 when the decision was made. Um, there were many tribal members within the room that were talking, that asked about consultation, that brought up tribal beneficial uses, even though they were not established yet, the discussions had begun. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, we hadn't thought about these things yet, or um, this is moving forward faster than those things. Um, doesn't seem, this seems disingenuous to me. Um, I've seen similar politics and temperature listings on the Sacramento River um, in water rights um, applications in the Sacramento River. And I think it's the job of this board to go beyond politics and actually look at beneficial uses and look at science. This has been 30 years in the making. And if you look at the diagrams of the salmon runs within that time, it's very obvious what not taking action has done to the Delta. If you look at toxic algae blooms within that time, it's very obvious what non-inaction has done to the Delta. And I could not be a bigger supporter of restoration. It's critically important. And I really support the restoration projects that are being proposed, but restoration, does not work without water. It just doesn't. You can make floodplains forever, but if you don't actually have floods or, or you know flood type flows, they can't make salmon. They can't make fish. They can't um, increase water quality. And in the Delta, I'm sure as you all are aware, the um, water dynamics are very different than somewhere in the Klamath, like I work that doesn't have a massively large estuary. Um, you know, every drop of water that goes into the Delta in the San Francisco Bay is critically important. Um, so I think backing off of a peer reviewed scientific report, which I liked and agreed with, in order to go forward with a different um, method is not a good idea. I mean, I understand you have to look look at different alternatives and I encourage that, but I think we ultimately should encourage these restoration projects but also call for the flows that were recommended in the earlier scientific report. Um, and with that said, I also just wanted to echo all the disappointments in the, in the governance and best available minds discussions earlier. I am extremely disappointed in the agencies involved that, that those kind of things were said when the best available minds were completely kept out of the room and the interest of the people in California were not considered, the interest of only the water users were considered in the VA process. Um, I'm gonna save the rest of my comments for later. I have a lot, but um, I just really wanna encourage the board to do what you did last time, to look at all the different things happening and then go with the best available science. Um, and actually try to make it implementable in a quick way this time. I'll uh, see the rest of my time. Thank you so much. And I will talk to you again, hopefully this afternoon on the actual science behind all of this. Thank you, Ms. Chikazola. Appreciate your comments and your time and engagement on these issues. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Valentina Dimas and then uh, Peter Dreckmeyer and then uh, Justin Fredrickson. Hi, hello. This is Valentina Dimas with Save California Salmon. And I am calling to stand in solidarity with my peers um, and colleagues. We work really hard for restoration. Regina brought up all the main hard hitting points. And I just wanted to say thank you, Regina. And uh, thank you for the board. I do stand in solidarity um, and agree with many of her comments. So, bye. Thank you, Ms. Demas. I appreciate your engagement and, and participating uh, with the board today. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Peter Dreckmeyer, uh, and then I believe this is our last commenter, uh, Justin Fredrickson. Thank you, Chair Esquivel, and good morning for a few more minutes. My name is Peter Dreckmeyer. I am the Policy Director for the Tuolumne River Trust. Mr. Bonham began his comments by stating, as the Delta goes, so goes the health of California, and I appreciated hearing that. To restore the Bay Delta and its tributaries, we need to understand the carrying capacity of those ecosystems. And I believe the 2010 flood criteria study got us started on the right foot. It identified 60% of unimpaired flow for the San Joaquin Basin and 75% for the Sacramento Basin. Mr. Bonham also pointed out that we need both flow and non-flow measures, which is absolutely true. The Bay Delta plan has been criticized by some for focusing solely on flows, but this isn't the case. As you know, the Bay Delta plan can't require non-flow measures 
but it incentivizes them through a range of unimpaired flow that could be adjusted based on how successful we are at achieving the biological goals. The VAs focus a lot on better management of spill. Why hasn't this been done for the past few decades in conformance with Fish and Game Code 5937? Why haven't more non-flow measures been implemented? Measures in the VAs are 30 years late. I have some news to share regarding the Tuolumne River. Over the past month, the SFPUC picked up more than two years worth of water. They now only need 120,000 acre feet to achieve full storage of 1.47 million acre feet. And there's much, much more than that in the snowpack, which is at 130% of the average seasonal high point. During the 2012 to 2016 drought, unimpaired flow on the lower Tuolumne River averaged just 12% for five years. Then in 2017, unimpaired flow was 79% as water was spilled for months to avoid downstream flooding. All the water that I and millions of others conserved during the drought was dumped in one year when the ecosystem didn't really need it. Over the past three years, unimpaired flow in the lower Tuolumne has averaged just 13%, and this year there will be considerable spill once again. Hoarding water during dry years and then dumping it in wet years is no way to manage a river ecosystem. We need the Bay Delta plan as soon as possible. A comprehensive peer review of the original Tuolumne River Voluntary Agreement commissioned by the National Marine Fishery Service a few years ago identified major flaws and failed science. Will these issues be addressed in the revised TRVA? Please make this a priority. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Dreckmeyer. I appreciate your work and leadership and all of this discussion as well. Uh, thank you. Last, uh, we have up Just, uh, Justin Fredrickson. Good morning, members of the board. Uh, my name is Justin Fredrickson. I'm a water and environmental policy analyst at the California Farm Bureau. And I wanted to uh, offer a few um, thoughts and comments, uh, mainly on the focusing on the voluntary agreements uh, developments. Um, uh, the first thing I'd like to say there uh, is that um, these the scientific basis report uh, that's the subject of the next item and the recent VA announcements that we've seen are, in my view, are a very positive uh, development and have been a long time in coming. We've known what the regulatory alternatives to those are, and they've been out there for a while. But meanwhile, we've been going around, um, uh, around and around on voluntary agreements, and it's it's um, it's great to finally see more details coming together on that. In my opinion, I know there are lots of other opinions uh, that have been expressed today. Um, the uh, I a few other things I'll say on that. Uh, the, the, I think that these um, voluntary agreement developments and, and the science that you're starting to put that, the analyses that you're starting to put that are something we needed to be able to begin to look, all of us needed to start to begin to look at the possibility of another way. Um, we know what the way of regulation and conflict look like. That's what we've been doing very well for the last couple, several couple of decades. Um, we're not really sure where it goes, except into more conflict and regulation. Um, we also know that, um, you know, water, um, uh, your, uh, we also know what it looks like to take sort of, a, you know, flows only approach to fish is fisheries issues and expect that that is going to um, uh, yield uh, benefits that we have not seen over time. And so the voluntary agreements, I, in my view, are providing a more balanced um, uh, approach that, in, in my view, is, is more promising and more um, likely to succeed. Uh, it's been said that uh, someone said that there's no water in voluntary agreements. That's not correct. First of all, there's a lot of water already being committed to uh, the ecosystem into rivers and to fish through the bi biological opinions, through the temperature management plans, through uh, natural events like the flood we're seeing outside our all of our windows. Um, and so and then this is on top of that. This is on top of that. There is additional water there and it's water that is targeted in a functional way, which is really what we needed not need, not just throwing water at the problem. Um, uh, a few other things. Um, as we embark on this process uh, that was laid out earlier today, uh, and we, we begin to look at VAs alongside the alternative of regulatory unimpaired flows, um, of course, we're going to be looking at um, baselines, voluntary agreements versus unimpaired, unimpaired flow side by side, those, sort, those sorts of things. 
Um, but it's also important to remember, I think, that the board's task is broader than that. Um, the board's job in, in, in part is to balance, consider trade-offs, and ensure reasonable protection of all beneficial uses for all 30 million Californians, uh, depending on these systems. That's a, that's a big deal. That is a big deal. Um, and uh, um, in addition to that, the Water Board has additional important charges in the area of existing water rights priorities. Uh, uh, drought management, uh, emergency management, which, which we've seen the last couple of years, oversight on local implementation of SIGMA, which is the other huge elephant in the room out there, kind of the flip side of all of these surface water issues. And then uh, consideration of disadvantaged communities and safe drinking water, which is actually, there's a very important environmental justice dimension to these unimpaired flows um, issues uh, down in the valley that I think has been given short shrift. I mean, all of the um, impacts that it's, this is going to have on groundwater is going to impact those impact those communities, and it was uh, somewhat glossed over. Um, uh, and so uh, that that is another important charge. Uh, other disadvantaged communities around this around the state were uh, mentioned, and I agree that that the, those voices also need to be. Uh, uh, part of, of this, this um, conversation. But at the end of the day, I think the same fundamental question before us is remains. Are we trying to uh, do something that can uh, take us in a different direction and get us to meaningful outcomes? Or are we just trying more of the same? What we know have not succeed, has not succeeded for many, many years. Um, and then I'll just jump to my last point, which is actually a significant reservation that I have, and that is regarding the Merced River and the uh, Stan uh, Stanislaus River, which do not have voluntary agreements. And that's of concern to us here at the Farm Bureau, certainly, because we do have lots of uh, agriculturalists in those in those watersheds that are that are impacted by this. Um, so I would I, I guess what I'd like to do there is to invite the parties to explore um, any remaining opportunities to try to get to some kind of a similar uh, set of voluntary actions on those two tributaries. Um, and that might involve including some kind of a placeholder in the analyses for these uh, documents, so technical analyses that will be done in the coming months. Um, there are lots of details of those potential agreements have been discussed. So perhaps it's just an, a matter of picking those up figuring out what, what is needed to get it over the line. But it is very important because without those, the, um, the, the consequences for the water users and the communities and those watersheds are quite dire and quite draconian. Uh, and I can't really overstate that. Um, so uh, thank you and I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Fredrickson. And Chair Escavel, I'll just point out yeah, that uh, Kate Rose has joined us. And I just then, saw her pop on. And we also have another commenter, I believe, Danielle. Um, Frank. Frank, yes. So let's go to Danielle Frank, and then uh, we can go to Kate Rose. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Danielle Frank. Um, I am the Youth Coordinator for Save California Salmon also a Hoopa Valley tribal member. Um, I am Miss Natanahoy of the Hoopa tribe and a student in Humboldt County. Um, I do have class later, so I have a few things that might kind of overlap for the next thing on the, the next uh, item on the agenda, unfortunately. Um, but uh, I just, first I would like to give thanks for this space and opportunity to speak. Um, and especially for the virtual option definitely helps when I have school four hours away. Um, and I would just like to, I have a few points to get through and I can start by saying these, you know, the voluntary agreements are very much contradicting what the water board has expressed as a priority that include that being including um, and recognizing the knowledge held by tribal nations. One of my main issues with the agreements is the, again, I probably will be um, very repetitive of my colleagues, but is the lack of protection of tribal beneficial uses. Um, without this, along with the incorporation of tribal knowledge, the report does remain incomplete. Also, the failure to assess the effects of water temperature on spawning habitat in the report is yet another example of how incomplete scientific analysis fails to address the extreme concern, uh, concerns of tribes and environmental justice communities for restored fisheries. Um, and then also just saying that in these reports, the best science should be used. Um, and that's not the case when the, specifically for the claims for with 
that habitat restoration without flows will benefit native fish in the Bay Delta. Habitat alone um, is not going to benefit any native fish species when they don't have enough water. Uh, and so that's just something that the best science isn't used in some of those claims, which is really, really unfortunate. And the analysis points that were developed throughout the report, they just failed to use the best science, unfortunately. Um, and my one of my just another point that I'll finish up with is the only the only people who were brought in as um, the only non-federal interest involved really were powerful landowners and tribal communities who are the true owners and stewards of these lands were excluded from the creation of the proposed VAs. Uh, now that this is happening, this is not really a welcome to the conversation when the conversation has already been had. Um, the Water Board has stated various times in the past few years that tribal involvement is something that is welcomed, but continues to leave us out of conversations. These conversations have been ongoing for a long time, and the ones that we have been part of has been a fight to get there. And so even um, when we'll be negatively affected by projects such as this, we don't have much of a voice, which is really unfortunate. And uh, just the, the proposed VAs are not tribal friendly. They don't benefit us. We were not brought into this conversation. We were excluded from these projects that will negatively affect our people who rely solely, almost solely on the land and waterways from which we originate. So um, that's just something that from, as, from a tribal perspective, these are some of the really big issues that I had and um, won't be able to be there for the next item on the agenda, but definitely appreciate the space and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk um, and helping me figure out some of that tech stuff last minute. Whoever is doing that is doing a great job. And then um, also thank my colleagues for being there in the next meeting when I can't. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frank. I appreciate uh, your com contributions, uh, your your participation today and the acknowledgement um, of our folks here. I'm glad we can make this easier process and folks not having to spend money to fly down to participate. Um, some benefit from our COVID time. So thank you. Uh, next, uh, and I believe now then last will be Kate Droz. And Ms. Droz, I'm glad you were able to make it onto the platform. Good afternoon. Hello, can you see and hear me? We can, we can, good afternoon. Okay, good afternoon. Again, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, so I want to be really clear that um, people can talk about racial equity. Governor Newsom can make a truth and reconciliation declaration. Um, but it's what are we going to do? What are the actions showing? And right now, the actions are just going with the same old um, that's the plan. So it's time to change. This is unacceptable. The racial and equity plan says beneficial uses for tribes. And the actions of the water board are not reflecting this. This is unacceptable. It's time for everybody to put on their big boys and girls pants and start listening and start changing actions because we have a great opportunity for healing right now. This is an amazing day and age, time and place, and each one of us are put here for a purpose, okay? There have been calls from tribal peoples, environmentalists, fishermen. Right now, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife are making an apology and renewing the plan for partnership and co-management with tribes because when the MPA was established this again tribes were not part of that management process the north coast has really cutting edge partnership between the state parks and your tribe co-managing a site stone lagoon called Chapek. it's time okay it's time all right turn to your neighbor Children can see it. My children, my my 13-year-old and my 12-year-old see this. They see what's not being done. They see the lip service. We're listening to you. We're considering. Okay, enough. We're all grown people here. Kids can see through that. It's time to get right. 
Let's make this right. That's what I have. Thank you for everybody being here. It's time. It's time to make it right. Have a great day. Thank you, Ms. Gross. I appreciate your participation, your words, and engagement here on this issue. So thank you. That, leaves, that brings us to the end of our commenters uh, for item number eight. Uh, I just want to thank everyone uh, for their participation and their words and know that, as we said at the top of this, uh, we are have an intensive amount of work these next two years, so we will continue to have discussion, including this afternoon as we get to an in-depth discussion on the scientific basis report. So uh, just my, my gratitude and thanks to, to folks. Any comments from board members? Um, board member Firestone, please. I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, I know uh, Many of you weren't able to be part of uh, yesterday's meeting. Um, it's a huge, uh, uh, really appreciated that you're able to be part of this today. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that in our um, meeting yesterday, we went over our um, racial equity action plan and commitments and actions that we're committing and prioritizing to take over this coming year, as well as our strategic work plan. And I think importantly to the really, um, frankly, justified frustrations um, and, and issues that have been brought here today regarding um, black indigenous and people of color, uh, there is a commitment in there to, um, uh, specific to the Bay Delta Plan update around um, uh, consultation, engagement, and um, staffing in addition to analysis specific to um, uh, black, indigenous, and people of color within uh, the Bay Delta staff report um, and within the Bay Delta work. So I, I guess I just want to say, well, I understand um, the, uh, the really justified frustration um, over the both our work at the board and also more broadly work um, uh, outside of the board processes that are um, bringing things here today. But um, I also really look at um, uh, this process as, as, um, as an opportunity to shift that and um, really in, uh, want to reiterate the commitment to really meaningful participation um, and, and partnership within all of these processes. So appreciate this. I know this um, is a lot of uh, a lot of work that we all need to be doing to, to improve both the, the process and outcomes. Thank you, board member. Really appreciate that. Vice Chair. I just think that um, the discussion on tribal beneficial uses uh, could use a little further clarity because um, I have um, observed uh, the action by several of the reason, regional boards and think that, you know, I don't know, I, I'm turning to Mr. Laufer and um, Ms. Sobeck, I don't know through executive director's report or some way to, you know, uh, bring back um, additional information on what the regional boards I mean, it's one thing to say that they've adopted in their basin plans and, and another to, you know, maybe learn more about implementation. Sure, I, I think we could, uh, Ms. Sobeck and I could work to make sure that we get an appropriate report in a future executive director's report. And, you know, just to contextualize it, um, and you did hear from some of the speakers today, recall that in 2017, this board adopted the standard definitions and have already included those definitions in the Inland Surface Waters Plan and Enclosed Based and Estuaries Plan. So you already have the framework out there, and the regions have been um, incorporating into their basin plan those standardized definitions. And then pursuant to the state board's resolution, you had uh, directed the regions to prioritize first the incorporation of the definitions and then to begin the work with actually designating the beneficial uses. Um, the most recent one they did was the Central Valley Basin Plan. And you may recall that as part of the Central Valley Water Board's basin plan, that um, that the, the region built in a process for the tribes to approach them about the addition of the cultural subsistence and tribal subsistence fishing designated uses on, on the waters within the Central Valley region. I just wanna point out, I think everybody knows there's some uh, 
overlap between the Bay Delta plan and the Central Valley um, Board's basin plans. And one of the things that the board has been expressed about in the past is that um, the Bay Delta plan, unless the board affirmatively identifies a conflict and overrides the regional board basin plan, including, for example, its designation of uses, those uses are maintained from the regional board. So there's an opportunity for, and I know we discussed this at a prior board meeting, an opportunity for some synergy for the regional board to be doing work on designating that has um, ancillary benefits with respect to how the state water board can proceed under the Bay Delta plan. But we'll provide an update on that. I just wanted to contextualize the conversation we had today so that folks know it's proceeding on multiple fronts. What the regions do actually can have um, a force multiplier effect within the Bay Delta plan as well. Yeah, and I'll just, uh, I appreciate that because I remember this discussion, I think it was when we adopted the, um, or approved the uh, update to the Central Valley's Basin Plan. Um, you know, I know there's going to be a, an offer for a workshop coming up with um, uh, with tribes and um, I and, and other stakeholders. Um, I would, it would be great if in that we can really provide some clarity with this issue in particular, because that's a confusing one, um, I think, for all of us. And uh, it'd be great to be able to do that, not just in future, but for that meeting in particular. Definitely. Thank you, board member, and thank you, vice chair. Board member McGuire, you're good, okay. Let's go ahead and take a lunch. We'll take about a 45 minute lunch um, so we can get back and get back into here what will be item number nine in a deep dive into the scientific basis report. Uh, we will return, let's go ahead and return at about one o'clock and 105-ish. And thank you everyone. I appreciate the morning's good discussion and look forward to, will be a, additional discussion this afternoon on this. We're in recess until 105.
All right, everyone, we're at 105. I uh, appreciate, uh, I hope everyone had a good lunch. Appreciate the morning's discussion. And we will now transition into item number nine, uh, which is a deep dive here on the scientific basis report. Look over to Mr. Holland. Good afternoon, Chair Good afternoon. and board members. My name is Matt Holland, and I'm a program manager in the Division of Water Rights. Today, I'm joined uh, to my left by Diane Riddle, to her left, Bjarni Serup, of, uh, a senior scientist at the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and uh, to his left, um, Brooke uh, Jacobs, a program manager at the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, will also be joined by Louise Conrad, lead scientist um, at the Department of Water Resources. Um, and to my right, I'm joined by Tina cannon Leahy of the Office of Chief Counsel. We'll be presenting today on the draft scientific basis report supplement for the voluntary agreements. Next slide, please. So the purpose of today's workshop is to provide a technical presentation of the draft scientific basis report supplement for the voluntary agreements, which we'll also refer to as the draft supplement report. We have the full title of the report here at the bottom of the slide, and the report itself is available on the board's website at the link provided in the notice for this workshop. A further purpose of this workshop is to place the draft report in the context of the board's ongoing public process to update and implement the Bay Delta Plan. A lot of this context was provided previously in item eight um, during the board meeting, but I'm gonna reiterate on it a little bit um, during the course of this presentation, just to make sure that we're all clear on where, we are, where we're at in the process. And then finally, a purpose of this workshop is to initiate the board's public process for consideration of voluntary agreements as an alternative within the Bay Delta Plan update process, specifically by receiving technical comments from the public on the draft supplement report. Next slide, please. So the agenda for today's workshop begins with a staff presentation, which will be delivered by board staff and some of our colleagues from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and Department of Water Resources who collaborated with the board staff to prepare the report. At the conclusion of the presentation, board members will have the opportunity to ask questions, and then we'll hear from any tribal or elected representatives. Next, we'll hear presentations by members of the public who requested to make presentations in advance, followed by public comments, and then any closing remarks by board members. Next slide, please. So before we get into the content of the report itself, I'm gonna provide some context for where today's workshop and the draft supplement report fit into the larger process to update and implement the Bay Delta Plan. Diane and Aaron provided some of this context previously, but I'm gonna reiterate some of it here. And the State Water Board is currently in the process of updating the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan to provide for reasonable protection of all beneficial uses of water with a particular focus on fish and wildlife beneficial uses. The update was being carried out through two major efforts. The first of these focused on flows in the lower San Joaquin River and its tributaries and was completed in 2018. The second effort concerns the Sacramento River, its tributaries, and the Delta and is ongoing. We refer to this effort as the Sacramento Delta update for short. The last major public products related to the Sacramento Delta update were the 2017 Sacramento Delta Scientific Basis Report and the 2018 framework for the Sacramento Delta update. Both of these products were focused on State Water Board Water Quality and Water Rights Authority, which consists primarily of flow actions. That said, the 2017 report and 2018 framework both recognized the need for other actions and recommended habitat restoration and other non-flow actions by other entities. Today's workshop is focused on the draft supplement report, which is intended to document the scientific basis for an alternative approach to the Sacramento Delta update through voluntary agreements proposed by several parties. Pursuant to California Health and Safety Code section 57004, the scientific basis of any statewide plan, basin plan, plan amendment, guideline policy, or regulation must undergo external scientific peer review before adoption. The staff concluded that a supplementary report should be prepared to document additional scientific information needed to evaluate potential benefits of flow and non-flow uh, actions proposed by VA parties prior to board consideration of a voluntary agreement alternative. Finally, as was discussed in the previous item, any consideration of a voluntary agreement on the Tuolumne River or any other tributary to the Lower San Joaquin River 
would occur through a separate process. And the narrow exception to this is that the draft supplement report does consider potential contributions of San Joaquin Basin voluntary agreements to Delta outflow. Next slide, please. So um, by way of background on the proposed voluntary agreements, this slide lists participants in the voluntary agreements. Most of the par these participants are signatories to the memorandum of understanding advancing a term sheet for the voluntary agreements. The signatories and other participants consist of state and federal agencies, local water agencies, private companies, and the nonprofit Mutual Benefit Corporation. Next slide, please. Of note, however, is the absence of the State Water Board from that list. The State Water Board is not a signatory to the Voluntary Agreement MOU, and the Board has made no decision regarding adoption of a VA alternative. The State Water Board did direct staff to provide technical and regulatory support to the Natural Resources Agency and development of a VA proposal and to incorporate it as an alternative in its Bay Delta Plan update process. As I mentioned earlier, today's workshop is really the beginning of the State Water Board's public process to evaluate voluntary agreements. The Board will conduct a full public process to update the Bay Delta Plan, including consideration of a VA alternative as a component of the program of implementation. This full pro public process will include the release and public review of a comprehensive staff report that will evaluate the VA alternative alongside alternatives consistent with the 2018 framework for the Sacramento Delta update. Next slide, please. Um, so for further background on the VA, um, the key, key provisions of the proposal from VA parties include a new narrative obje objective to achieve the viability of native fish populations and the proposal to contribute to the existing salmon protection narrative objective, also known as the salmon doubling objective. Flow and habitat, it also contains flow and habitat assets accompanied by a science program and government governance procedures. Dual compliance pathways consisting of a VA pathway and a regulatory pathway. And that regulatory pathway would be contemplated to be more like a more traditional flow based, um, you know, regulatory effort. Um, Next, um, the VA contemplates annual and triennial reports to the State Water Board. And at the eighth year, a green, yellow, red light decision structure. And this is um, one of the things that Director Bonham spoke about earlier. And the decision structure would provide for um, options to continue the VA if it's achieving its goals, modifying it, or implementing the regulatory pathway, depending on you know, if those goals are not being fully achieved. Next slide, please. And then just a little bit more on those two uh, narrative objectives that are contemplated by the VA. So the first is the, sa the salmon doubling objective and um, the parties proposed that during the term of the VAs, their actions would constitute their contributions towards achieving the doubling of salmon populations by 2050. Second, they proposed that the State Water Board adopts a narrative objective which to paraphrase, maintains water quality conditions, including flow conditions in and from tributaries and into the Delta, together with other measures in the watershed sufficient to support and maintain the natural production of viable fish populations. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna briefly go over the structure of the draft supplement report. Um, so chapter one is the introduction, um, which provides an overview of um, the Bay Delta plan update process and the purpose of the report. Chapter two documents hypothesized limiting factors for native fish species. CDFW took the lead on this chapter with contributions from DWR and board staff. Chapter three contains a description of the flow and non-flow assets proposed by the voluntary agreement parties. This is largely drawn from the MOU. Chapter four presents, sorry, I heard an echo there. Chapter four presents hydrology and operations modeling methods and results and was led by TWR. Chapter five documents the analytical approaches to evaluating assets. Um, and then of course, chapter six goes on to present those anticipated biological environmental outcomes. Chapters five and six were primarily led by DWR and its consultants. And then finally, chapter seven, which was um, led by the board, summarizes the report's overall conclusions and the uncertainty associated with those conclusions. Next slide, please. So with that, I'm gonna hand the presentation over to Bjarni Serup of CDFW, who will discuss the limiting factors analysis. Thank you.
Thank you, Matt. Um, and good afternoon, Chair and Board Members. Uh, my name is Bjarne Serb. I'm a supervisor uh, with CDFW's VA program and will be talking fairly briefly about sort of the background for native fish species decline. Um, I'm going to try to keep it fairly short so we can get to what I assume is the more important uh, material in the scientific uh, basis report. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, minute details about the specific limiting uh, factors, but more rather provide some context on how we um, decided to describe them and characterize them, and maybe highlight a few key points. Um, we organized the description in three regions, so the uh, three regions being the tributaries, the historic flood, flood basins on the valley floors, so including the uh, Sutter and Yolo bypasses, Butte Sink, Calusa Basin, and then Delta. It's also um, very important to stress at this point, underscore that this is a supplement to the 2017 report. Um, so you might be thinking when you read the scientific basis report that we have skipped a lot of the limiting factors that we are aware exist but that is because they are described in the 2017 report and we have done our best to link back to specific sections in that report. So please keep that in mind when you read the report. That is a supplement that we have uh, sent out for public review here. Um, what we have done then is really try to emphasize including new scientific findings that's come out since 2017 and adding detail where we thought was needed, uh, particularly for the tributaries. We organized it in the headlines you can see here to the left. And uh, for this presentation, we added a flow bullet point just to, again, let people be aware we have not forgotten about the flow, forgotten about the flow component. It is covered in the 2017 report how flow is a limiting factor. We do touch upon it. And a lot of these stresses that you see here in the bullet list are associated with flow in one way or another, directly or indirectly. So you'll find these headlines for habitat loss, ecosystem productivity and food supply, water quality, habitat connectivity, invasive species, disease and climate change. And um, those of you who have um, read the 2017 report extensively will recognize some of these uh, topics. I, on that, I, I just have to comment uh, because again, uh, I think earlier I talked about um, the, the benefit of doing away with some of these false dichotomies sort of an either or around the work that's been developed. It's incredibly important here to note, again, this is a supplement. This isn't a replacement. It's not a, a lessening of what is a, a significant uh, body. And I hope many in this room have read the 2017 uh, report uh, because it's still incredibly valid uh, in the basis of the board's decision making. And this document is strengthening it. Uh, and again, isn't a, a replacement or a repudiation of it. So just thank you. Yeah, thank you for those remarks. Um, so now the next three slides are really gonna be a story about the 95%, the 95% that used to be and that aren't anymore or aren't accessible. For the tributaries, um, a lot of the key issues are covered in the 2017 report, but not directly called out for each of the tributaries. Um, so there are differences, but there are also similarities in ter terms of physical landscape changes, such as rim dams, uh, flood control systems, levees, um, that again led to reduced flow, altered flow patterns, uh, water temperature changes, and loss of connectivity to habitat or loss of habitat quality. Um, so again, we try to reference back to those sections where the impacts of those physical landscape changes are described in 2017 report. Um, and describe how well or where they diverge from the, from the tributaries. Um, it's also important to note that we um, did not rank limiting factors, but we do call out some key findings, I would say, also in this presentation, um, but we have not ranked them in terms of importance in the report. And just to go over the slides here is really, you can see to the left what used to be accessible uh, high elevation habitat for some monads, and in black, uh, we see all that habitat that is no longer accessible. Um, next slide, please. The same trend is uh, visible here. On the left, we have uh, what used to be uh, historic wetlands, floodplain habitat on the valley floor, 
Uh, to the right, we see remnants of it. It's hardly even visible from where I'm sitting, what's left. Um, and we decided to uh, significantly increase the description of limiting factors for these historic flood, uh, flood basins uh, because it's a fairly important part of the VA assets, floodplain restoration. Most of what we did is really capturing findings from close to 30 years of research in both Sutter and Yolo bypasses uh, on particularly salmonids and included that added to the description that was in the 2017 report. One key issue that is uh, important to highlight for the historic flood basins is that a key limiting factor here is really connectivity, both for the flood basins to the river, but also within uh, the flood basins leading to uh, limitation in access juvenile salmon to get out on rearing habitat, but also limiting adult fish passage um, within the flood basins and also for adult fish to get out of those areas again. Next slide. Again, as I said, the story of the 95%. Um, to the left here, we see what used to be the historical wetland floodplain habitat in the Delta region. And to the right, we see what's left. Um, Key outcomes of that really is that productivity in the Delta is extremely low now, much lower than historic levels, which is not surprising uh, when we see this map of historical habitat. Temperatures are high, um, and this is not likely at all to improve with climate change. Invasive species is also a significant issue within Delta, maybe more so than in the tributaries, maybe not, but uh, decided to call it out here. Um, the restoration assets, will help, um, we expect, with productivity, not so much with the invasive species or temperature issues. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Luis Conrad next to me. Okay, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Excellent. Um, good afternoon, Chair Esquivel and board members. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Luis Conrad. I serve as the Department of Water Resources lead scientist. I am going to dive now into a brief explanation of the voluntary agreement's flow and non-flow assets, and then um, spend most of my time discussing the report methodologies and results. So this table is one that you can also find in the MOU. It's in the executive summary of the scientific basis report we're discussing today, and shows the assets all in one place. I'm not going to discuss the rows line by line, uh, but just note that the flow assets are described for each system and vary across water year types. As um, Eric Lobachevsky mentioned this morning, there is some flexibility in the timing for providing these flows, um, generally within the spring months. Restoration assets are divided between spawning, in-stream rearing, floodplain, and wetland restoration projects that are proposed as part of the voluntary agreement package. And in summary, the full proposal provides for 150 to 825,000 acre feet of flow, depending on the water year type, and nearly 30,000 acres of new habitat. And we'll be discussing the, uh, I'll be discussing the habitat and kind of how we estimated the changes with respect to each of these categories here. Next slide. Just to start off with the general conceptual approach of the voluntary agreements, this is something that we have covered a bit already today with the various presentations, but the idea is to provide flow and stationary habitat together as um, they, they provide a greater benefit for species resiliency than if we provided either element on their own. And this is based on really decades of science that have shown that, that the two together provide more for the species that we are caring about and targeting with, with the voluntary agreements. And for this reason, scientific basis report does include devoted sections on the synergistic benefits of flow and habitat provided in tandem for tributaries, floodplains, and the Bay Delta. Next slide. Okay, this is a high level uh, presentation of the methodology. I am going to talk a bit more in detail about the specific analyses, but want to note um, in, in a, as a way, by way of summary for the analysis, the general approach is to, is to involve both the 
quantitative models, um, a series of models really that are used throughout the report to describe the hydrology, the relationships between flow and habitat, water quality, and where possible, the relationship between flow and abundance of, of, of native species. However, not everything is quantitatively modeled in the report. There is also a qualitative analysis that is based on a literature review to bring forward uh, recent and best available science to inform the anticipated outcomes of the report. And that comes into play, especially with the benefits of restoration, ecosystem resilience, and um, hypothesized support for enhanced life history diversity of Chinook salmon, which is a key component of viability. Um, as we've discussed, this was a collaborative team effort that included the State Water Board, DWR, CDFW, and an expert team of consultants, particularly for the quantitative modeling that we're gonna be discussing. I wanna talk about, just to prepare us all for the the results slides to come that there are three general ways of expressing the hypothesized outcomes of the voluntary agreements. And the first one that you're going to see is relevant to the tributaries and uh, shows the change in habitat area with voluntary agreement implementation relative to the total habitat required for the doubling goal, the, the doubled um, salmon population for um, as, as the original and first narrative objective. Uh, secondly, the, the change in the amount of Bay Delta habitat is also shown and compared to a baseline of tidal wetland restoration that is recently constructed or is under active construction or planning. And then they compare that with the voluntary agreement scenario of additional restoration of about 5,000 acres. And finally, the third category of presenting results is to project change in abundance indices for estuarine species based on published relationships between flow and species abundance. Next slide. So starting with the tributaries, I'm going to spend a few slides to talk about how the tributary analysis and the change in habitat with the voluntary agreements was covered. First, the doubled salmon population for each tributary was based on the number of fish on average that occurred in each system between 1967 and 1991. So that serves as a baseline um, to estimate what the doubled population would be. The escapement, and that's the values that are shown here in the table, are the number of adults, adult salmon that have escaped harvest and then are, hence are available to spawn and, and contribute to natural production. This um, doubled escapement value is, is provided for each system and then serves to uh, help project how much habitat is needed with respect to spawning and rearing to support this population. The spawning habitat um, estimation was based on assumptions that half of the adults would be female, that would be spawning, and then an assumption about the average size of their reds, which are the gravel nests where they deposit their eggs. And then rearing habitat was estimated um, using an assumption about the number of eggs per female, so how many juveniles potentially are coming out of every female salmon, and the territory size of juvenile salmon. So this, then, this table then shows you the for spawning and rearing habitat, the in acres, the amount that's needed to support this doubled population. And as you'll see in a few slides, 25% of this estimated area is the target for the eight-year term of the voluntary agreement proposal and is then used as a benchmark for assessing how the voluntary agreement proposal um, measures up to this benchmark. Next slide. So to complete the analyses for this portion of the report, it was necessary to estimate the amount of habitat that is available now for spawning and rearing habitat. And for each tributary, this was informed by expert opinion and by collecting and synthesizing available reports um, for existing habitat. The relationship between flow and habitat also had to be determined, and this was done through a series of expert opinion workshops that were conducted by, by Flow West and where um, not only state federal agencies were involved, but also stakeholders. 
the synthesized information on the available habitat is then expressed as the weighted usable area, which is the habitat in square feet for every 1,000 feet of channel um, as a function of cubic feet per second for flow. This value is then used to estimate the habitat area over a time series of modeled hydrology. So you have a full time series that allows you to project what the variation might be in available habitat. Next slide. So finally, um, the last piece of information that was needed uh, was to estimate the amount of habitat that would be available under implementation of the voluntary agreements. Again, expert opinion was the basis, and here technical experts were provided information on how, um, they provided information on how proposed restoration projects would serve as habitat, given the specific suitability criteria for depth and water velocities that are provided here in this table on this slide. Next slide. So finally, getting to the end of the methods for the tributary piece here, um, there were these three, we had these three pieces of information, the target amount of habitat for the doubled salmon population, the current amount of habitat available, and then the projected amount of habitat available for under the proposed agreements. Calcium was used to model the availability of spawning and rearing habitat, and 1921 to 2015 was the time series used, and uh, then the data were just focused, filtered to the specific months that are relevant to spawning and rearing periods for Chinook salmon. So next slide, we can now move into some results, and starting with the spawning habitat. Here, what we're looking at is a comparison of the median amount of spawning habitat in acres on the y-axis with and without the voluntary agreement implementation. So existing baseline habitat in green and purple is with implementation of the voluntary agreements. The error bars are showing the range in habitat with that interannual annual variability of flows that I was talking about, and then the dotted line, which is a little hard to see, honestly, um, on the slides there, um, is that 25% benchmark, the amount of habitat needed to support 25% of that doubled salmon population. So you can see here that we exceed this 25% goal even in the baseline scenario scenarios for all systems. Um, McCullamy and Yuba already actually exceed the full amount of habitat needed for the full doubling goal. But with the voluntary agreements, the graph is showing that in the American and the Feather River, the spawning habitat acreage exceeds 60% of the amount of habitat needed for the doubled salmon population. Next slide. We do have a different story with rearing habitat. With the voluntary agreements, we're looking at in-stream rearing habitat here. In a moment, I will start talking about floodplains, um, which will layer on to this graph in a few slides. But with just looking at in-stream rearing habitat, McCullamy and Yuba um, will well, McCullamy, sorry, exceeds that amount of habitat needed for the doubling goal. Um, in the American River and the other, uh, other tributaries, we don't quite get there to that 25% threshold when we don't consider the floodplains. So let's move to the floodplain habitat evaluation now. On the next slide, thank you. Um, so uh, again, we relied on expert opinion for informing the flow and habitat relationship. Um, and which is very important for floodplains because they are relying on um, increased flows in order to be inundated. The acreage of, of habitat was added to the in-stream rearing habitat to estimate the amount of total habitat available for juvenile salmon. And in addition to this total acreage, we also, uh, report describes a analysis that was the meaningful evaluated the meaningful floodplain event, or MFE, as it's called in the report, um, criteria, which is really evaluating the character of the floodplain events, the inundation of floodplain events, and how they will serve as um, providing benefit for juvenile salmon. So specifically, this looked at the magnitude or the total area of inundation for, the, for a floodplain inundation event. How, how big is it? And compared this to the percentage of area that would be needed to support the doubling goal. 
Secondly, another piece uh, that's really important for floodplains is how frequently in a given year are they being inundated. Um, and the criteria for being a meaningful event was that at least two of a five month rearing period needed to see inundation. And then the last um, criteria, piece of criteria that I wanna mention is that um, how many, out of how many, what is the interannual frequency? So um, for a set of three years, are at least two of those years seeing inundation? These are the criteria that were um, considered to inform whether or not a floodplain inundation event was meaningful and are supported by um, the scientific literature as it describes what can support life history diversity um, and provide enough time for the fish to reap benefits from floodplains. Next slide. The analysis showed that, um, moving into some results for the floodplains, that at a magnitude equivalent to 25% of the Dublin Gull habitat, um, we see an increased frequency in the likelihood of those events happening for uh, under the voluntary agreements. Um, the, the table shows the percent of years for the three systems where this analysis was conducted, the Feather, McCullamy, and the Yuba, and where that was um, what, what the baseline is and then what is occurring under the voluntary agreement proposal. It's notable to look at the Yuba River, especially, where the floodplain uh, analysis, this MFE analysis showed that we moved from zero to 98%. Next slide. So going back to the total acreage of available habitat, for looking at the rearing habitat with in-stream habitat and floodplain habitat together, um, this is the same graph with the same y-axis for the median annual rearing habitat in acres on the y-axis. And uh, again, we see that uh, the benchmark of 25% is not met in all systems. However, we see a big increase in the Yuba and then in Feather River in wet years, uh, enough water is there to inundate these habitats and provide um, enough acreage to exceed that 25% benchmark. I wanna note that there are asterisks on this graph for the Feather River and the Sacramento River because those don't show potential changes in rearing habitat where the Sutter Bypass is included. And that's uh, because that's a little bit different than the, um, and the rearing habitat on that's right next to the channels, it involves um, addressing some fish access issues to the Sutter Bypass. And uh, that is planned as part of the proposal, but it wasn't quite right to include them right on the graph. So overall, we feel this is an underestimate of the amount of floodplain habitat that could, would be available under the implementation of the voluntary agreements. Next slide. So we're gonna move into the Bay Delta system now um, after walking through the parts of the report that uh, address spawning and rearing habitat for Chinook salmon and the tributaries. And we're gonna talk first about the a species abundance and possible changes to abundance indices with provisions for increased delta outflow. The effect analysis, as I mentioned before, is based on published statistical relationships between flow and abundance, and um, look at and and it does not include um, in as part of this part of the analysis that I'm talking about changes in habitat. We are going to look at results for California bay shrimp, longfin smelt, Sacramento split tail, and starry flounder, which are all species that are sampled as part of long-term sur surveys in the Bay Delta. Next slide. So these are the results. Um, they're showing a percent change from the baseline in the abundance index um, with VA flow measures uh, provided with, uh, in black, a placeholder for contributions that could come from lower San Joaquin tributaries, and then in yellow without that placeholder contribution. So you get a little bit more of a bump with the, the contributions from the San Joaquin side of the system, um, and in almost all years see some level of increase. 
it is important to note here that these are abundance indices, that is not the same as population sizes, um, but it is what we have to um, serve to provide an analysis here. And the calculations use um, these flow abundance uh, relationships are correlations, not necessarily cause-effect relationships. Next slide. So the last uh, kind of arm of analysis regarded Bay Delta uh, dynamic habitat and provision of tidal wetlands. And this is again separate from the species abundance indices. It is based on models of flow and salinity under baseline um, conditions and then implementation of the voluntary agreements. Here we did bring in historical temperature and turbidity data to be able to estimate the available habitat for delta smelt, longfin smelt, and juvenile salmonids. And the total habitat area was estimated and compared to the total wetted area. And the uh, thresholds you're seeing here are ones that were used to filter the um, modeled hydrological data um, to hone in on what would provide habitat for these fishes with respect to turbidity, temperature um, for the smelts, and, and uh, depth and velocity for salmon. Next slide. So um, this is the last graph I'm going to show. This shows the change in habitat area for these three species with and without the voluntary agreements, all relative to the total region area based on the voluntary agreement geometry. Um, the takeaway here in the report is that the amount of restoration is small compared to the total wetted area. Um, however, I think it's important to, in, to consider, especially given the limiting factor review that Bjarni provided, that any increase in the shallow water habitat, given how much it's been reduced, may have an outsized benefit for these fish, however, that's a qualitative, not quantitative analysis. Next slide. So um, lastly, I just want to note that there is, uh, and I have um, referred to this since in the beginning of the presentation, but that there is a general qualitative analysis on anticipated outcomes. And essentially along the lines of this conceptual model presented here on a recent paper for managing for salmon resilience, the um, point is made that increased habitat heterogeneity, excuse me, um, is, is a factor that can lead to increased population resistance, resilience, excuse me. <laughs> um, this occurs through greater connectivity, greater diversity in habitat, which then can then support multiple options for the fish as they go about completing their life cycle. So the, with more quality habitat in the freshwater portion, um, particularly for salmon, they may have options for staying higher in the tributary for some years or moving down into the estuary and finding quality habitat there, which leads to more of diversity and timing of when they're actually making their move into the ocean. And then it literally is not putting all their eggs in one basket to complete their life cycle in a certain way. And as we know, we are ex experiencing increasing variation, extreme events, and having this buffer, if you will, for how the timing um, and size at which fish move through critical milestones in their life cycle is really important for their viability as a population. Next slide. The report includes a full section um, describing uncertainties and caveats to the anticipated outcomes that are described. Um, as I think you know and would agree that models are never perfect and they do involve assumptions that may not hold up all of the time. There's a few important uncertainties and assumptions to mention here. The, as we've discussed, the voluntary agreement proposal does include some flexibility in when flow measures are to be deployed. And this is meant to be able to provide them at the most strategic time to provide benefit, but the report does not explore um, different timings for deployment of flow provisions. Um, secondly, restored sites are assumed to provide benefits based on natural ecosystem function, um, and they're also assumed to be maintained over time such that they keep returning this benefit over time. And that's an active point of discussion within agencies as to how to manage and maintain restored habitats. It's not um, generally 
uh, great to walk away after completing construction. There's, there's work to be done to keep an eye on them. Um, the good news is that there is a science um, arm for the voluntary agreements that could help with that, uh, keeping tabs on how the habitats are performing. Thirdly, um, I, it's, I think Bjarni talked a bit about this, but there are other factors that are outside of the control of the agencies and implementing parties um, with respect to habitat. Um, for example, colonization by invasive species or other factors. Um, and so built habitat might not always serve um, and be suitable as, as designed. Um, want to note too that one important piece is that the spawning and rearing habitat for salmon was assumed to be suitable. However, um, water temperature was not included in that suitability criteria, but um, uh, and and should be tracked as uh, after after creating the habitat to see if it's serving as suitable. The evaluation of floodplain habitat was conservative, as I discussed before, so we think there's an underestimate there in the amount of floodplain habitat that would actually be available. Um, I've already discussed climate change in, as um, being a very important factor for um, needing increased resiliency for species, but it also introduces additional uncertainty in the analysis. Um, their extreme events um, were, were part of the time series that was included for the modeling. But as we, our, our climate and our system changes, we could have increased frequency of those. And though that frequency of extreme events might not, is not anticipated in the modeling. Um, furthermore, the relationship between habitat and species was not modeled. And that's an important point to note here is that we discuss a lot about additional habitat and how um, that would change with respect when, when with VAs being implemented, but it does not translate this amount of habitat into number or population sizes of fish. And then finally, we want to acknowledge that we didn't analyze the full community of fish or other native species that we'd like to see benefit from provision of habitat and flow. Um, we focus on some species of management interest, but there's many others that hopefully would also benefit, including, um, just as an example, the Sacramento split tail, which relies on floodplains for um, their spawning rearing habitat. However, those are just are not modeled in the report. So I look forward to questions, and at this time I will hand it back to uh, Matt Holland to go over next steps for the report. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Um, now we just have a couple more slides to come back around to the big picture of where we are in the process and what the next steps will be. So first, a few more words on the development of the draft supplement report. The report was developed by an interagency scientific team with support from modelers who are considered experts in their field. Agency staff worked as a team to identify the best available science to evaluate the benefits of the VAs using both qualitative and quantitative methods. That said, this is really the beginning of the process to evaluate the VAs, so we're eliciting technical input from the public through today's workshop and the public comment period. We'll weigh this input and incorporate it as appropriate into the version that is submitted to external peer review pursuant to the Health and Safety Code. And of course, the peer review itself may result in further updates to the report. Next slide, please. So finally, before we conclude the staff presentation, I'm gonna go over our next steps. The report was released for public comment on January 5th, 2023, and public comments are due February 8th, 2023. During the remainder of today's workshop, we'll receive oral public comment as well as any written materials submitted today. Once we've received all of the public comments, we will revise the supplemental report. At this time, we anticipate working to complete these revisions through early spring of this year. Finally, we'll distribute the revised, public, the re revised report for Public Health and Safety Code peer review and at, at this time, we plan to complete that step by the end of uh, spring this year. Next, next slide, please. That concludes the staff presentation. We'd be happy to take any questions from board members at this time. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate the good uh, presentation. And I know uh, the really comprehensive work that went into synthesizing uh, the input from a number of agencies around it. I know uh, it, it is important for us in our decision making to, to have this. So I, I appreciate that. Um, Actually, Ms. for Ms. Conrad, I do have a question. Uh, to your good point, there is no perfect model out there. 
There are a lot of assumptions that go on, uh, but the modeling is a really important part of the, the basis of our decision making here. I know CalSIM 3 was used uh, in that modeling, uh, I, and I know that it's still relatively new in its usage, and I think a lot of the decision making in states in the state here, and I, and I think it's important uh, that we continue to, to, to modernize and innovate. But uh, wondering though, what what is the status of um, really the replicability of that model and uh, sort of open kind of transparent, I know um, uh, ideals that we hold with this, but wondering if, if that's the case with CalSIM 3, I guess is it you know, open enough now that you know, there is some public access to, to that modeling? Thank you for the question. Yes, the answer is yes. I was actually reviewing that this morning and looked to the availability of the model. And it is, you can find it and download it on the internet. They're also holding, actively holding training sessions um, on using, uh, using that model. So it should be replicable. Great, that's very helpful. Really appreciate that. Yep. Looking to my fellow colleagues, if there are any uh, questions off the bat, and then otherwise, I know we have a number of commenters that we'll be able to hear from. Okay, thank you. Hearing none, we can start getting to some of our commenters. I believe our first commenter here will be Jennifer Pierre. I have a couple of panels that have Oh, I apologize. I, I shouldn't just say that then. I was looking down at the wrong part of my, uh, there's a couple of panels and then our first individual commenter will be Jennifer Pierre. Apologies. I know, I, sorry. So the first panel will be composed of uh, Gary Bobker, John Rosenfeld, and Julie Zimmerman, and we'll, we'll start bringing them into the meeting. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, Gary Bopker uh, with the Bay Institute. Uh, we have um, we coordinated with other organizations to present a series of um, serial presentations. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it off, and I think we um, Julie Zimmerman has a hard stop at um, two thirty, but I think we uh, I think we can accommodate it that at this point. Um, so I don't think that'll be a problem. Um, so uh, you know, um, could we get the um, PowerPoint up? That we have. Great, thank you. Um, so, so let me start by saying that um, no one in their right mind would argue that uh, both flows and habitat and other factors um, are critical and need to be included in any serious program to uh, protect and restore the Bay Delta Estuary or any other major ecosystem. Uh, indeed, flow and habitat are so closely intertwined in ways that proponents of habitat restoration often don't really understand. Um, but there is no basis for substituting habitat actions as the main component of a management program instead of large scale flow restoration. Uh, and it's important to note that although the VA uh, proposals include both habitat and flow assets. In essence, it's a habitat proposal because the, the flow assets are minimal changes to flows that are uh, minimal in comparison to what the science has clearly indicated is needed to support fish and wildlife beneficial uses, uh, is minimal compared to what the board has already adopted as regulatory requirements or is considering as regulatory requirements to complete the update of the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan. It's less than it appears because uh, you need to compare it to the actual baseline rather than to the invalid 2019 biological opinions baseline. And it's a lot less than it appears because there is so much uncertainty about when the assets will show up, where they will show up, um, whether they will be rediverted. Um, you know, there, there's just a lot of unreliability about those assets. So in essence, 
the VAs are essentially habitat enhancement projects. And uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, we've been here before. Um, science hasn't radically changed in the last few years. Um, there are, <laughs> I've, I've just picked a few quotations from what the board itself has found and what uh, major uh, parties that the board looks to have found. Uh, starting in 2010, the board cautioned that flow and physical habitat interact in many ways, but they're not interchangeable. Uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife in one of many observations said that implementation of non-flow measures uh, won't meet your doubling objective or fish and wildlife beneficial use needs. Uh, you, you need to do flows. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2018, in responding to comments on uh, the phase one environmental documents, uh, the board explicitly said there's no evidence of the efficacy of non-flow measures to protect beneficial uses, no sense of how much water you would save if you did non-flow measures instead, uh, and whether you would achieve goals and objectives. There's no evidence that no, non-flow measures uh, would protect uh, 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 that would serve as in lieu of or as a partial substitution for uh, the requisite flows, uh, et cetera. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, indeed, the, the VA supplemental report itself acknowledges that in the final chapter, which I interestingly note was prepared by state water board staff, uh, the report acknowledges that um, you know, the, the quantitative connection between restored non-flow habitat and species abundance was not modeled, only evaluated qualitatively. So benefits are expected, but unquantified. However, the flow abundance relationship was quantified. And this gets to an essential point about the VA supplement, which is that basically it is an aspirational program. It's uh, a description of things that people hope will happen if they, if you manipulate the environment in certain ways, uh, they hope that through a chain of speculation, you hope that certain things will happen as opposed to the much better understood uh, and predictable effects of uh, enhancing flows that are necessary to achieve um, the board's fish and wildlife beneficial uses. So um, what you're going to hear from the folks uh, on the rest of our presentation and the following presentation, uh, you know, are a couple of things. One is um, the ways in which the supplemental report uh, just is is flawed in its uh, analysis and methodologies, is incomplete or misleading, uh, the ways in which it overlooks uh, a vast record uh, of uh, available science, scientific information, which in fact contradicts it, um, the ways in which critical issues like temperature and uh, harmful algal blooms are not addressed, um, and uh, the way in which the analysis uh, only looks at the effects in regards to existing conditions and not to achieving actually the viability and, and doubling objectives of the board. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John Rosenfield uh, to talk about, to, to give us an overview of, um, of some of those uh, issues and talk about um, the uh, relationship to pelagic species, estuarine species. Thank you, Mr. Bobker. Uh, thanks, Gary. Good afternoon, members of the board. Uh, as Gary mentioned, I'm here to provide comments on the scientific basis reports analysis of the voluntary agreements effect on uh, Delta resident and pelagic species. Um, the VA, as Dr. Conrad already covered, the, the VA flows are less than previously identified by this board uh, in various reports over the past decade or more. The VA habitat actions are not particularly ambitious. The report estimates they amount to about 1% of the historical extent of tidal wetlands in the Delta. Uh, and the draft scientific basis report assumes that the non-flow actions happen and produce benefits immediately. Um, as Gary pointed out, you know, the, the Crosby, Stills and Nash song, we have all been here before, comes to mind. Um, the CDFW commented with regard to the phase one scientific basis report that this flow for habitat uh, trade doesn't work if your flow assets are inadequate, which they are here. Next slide, please. The, the reason the flow uh, 
you can't trade flow for habitat is because for fish, flow is the habitat. Um, the draft report incorrectly asserts that non-flow actions, quote, increase habitat quantity and quality. And I'm referring to table 2.1, which is there's a snippet of here. Um, Director Bonham this morning talked about, you know, dirt moving, dirt turning, I think he called it. Um, dirt turning doesn't create habitat. Flow creates habitat. Dirt turning uh, potentially increases, facilitates the ability of flow to do its work. But as has been noted many times by the board before, flow is the master variable in creating this habitat, uh, maintaining it, sustaining it, um, and, and then of course activating it, right? Um, and this master variable, you just can't get around it by uh, turning over dirt with, with shovels and, and backhoes. Um, so the reasons that non-flow actions can't substitute for the role of flow in maintaining native fish viability uh, is because, as I mentioned, flow is a major determinant of physical habitat. Native fish life history strategies have evolved to capitalize on natural flow regimes. And the flip side of that is that altering the natural flow regime favors invasion and success of non-native species. Next slide, please. So the VA's flawed approach then becomes the draft report's flawed analysis. Um, the draft report estimates habitat, not fish viability. The board is proposing an objective for fish viability, not habitat. So there's an issue there. Um, it assumes that habitat availability translates into more fish, even when there's no evidence to support that assumption. The reported increases in population abundance are relative to the inadequate baseline. We all acknowledge the baseline is inadequate. These increases are not relative to the board's viability objective, which is the standard by which um, any uh, proposed plan update will be evaluated. Uh, Dr. Conrad covered very well the report's approach. Uh, quantitative analysis relied on documented published flow abundance and flow survival relationships. That's good. Uh, but then an additional step of modeling of habitat availability was added. Um, and that habitat availability was based on simplistic descriptions of habitat suitability uh, to which very complex flow modeling is added, which sort of makes it look sciencey, but um, fundamentally it's based on uh, simplistic descriptions of habitat suitability. And finally, uh, as Dr. Conrad described, a qualitative literature review uh, to evaluate possible benefits of the VAs uh, where no quantitative models exist was layered on as a, as, a, as a third layer. And I'm not gonna be the one, I would never be the one to tell you, you need a perfect model or there is a perfect model or you even need a fully quantitative analysis. Um, I think, in large extent, uh, population models are, are overused, over relied upon in this ecosystem. But in this context, when we don't have a quantitative connection of habitat area to fish viability, that means either we don't understand the relationship well enough to estimate benefits, or there is no relationship. Um, in other words, these non-flow actions lack, many of them, uh, lack a scientific basis as a path to improve fish viability, which again is the plan's objective. Next slide, please. Um, you don't need to take my word for it. Dr. Conrad already explained this. Um, it's in the uh, report itself, um, but I'll just note that the uncertainty associated with the voluntary agreement is not just that the delta is complex, not just that models uh, have flaws and are, are imperfect. We all acknowledge that. The VA, in this quote that I'm putting on the uh, screen here, identifies uh, attributes of the voluntary agreement itself that add to the uncertainty regarding its outcomes. Okay, so this is additional uncertainty. We can't just throw up our hands and say, oh, it's uncertain, we knew that, let's just move forward, right? The VA is uncertain because of the way the VA is constructed. Next slide, please. Okay, so to the science. There's, as I said, there's no evidence that habitat volume is, uh, is limiting abundance of pelagic species in this system. We know that there's a diverse array of fish and invertebrates that respond positively to winter spring delta outflow, 
or negatively with X2, because those two are inverse. I'm showing here some uh, graphs produced by Wim Kimmerer and company in 2009 that show this relationship, a strong, persistent, statistically significant uh, relationship that covers orders of magnitude of abundance uh, for multiple fish species in this estuary. But this same study found that these flow abundance relationships or X2 abundance relationships, uh, there was no evidence that those relationships were driven by a flow habitat volume relationship. And the study concludes, therefore, other mechanisms must underlie responses of abundance to flow for most species. Next slide, please. So it's true that some fish experience uh, increased foraging success in or near tidal marsh habitats. But other species don't go in or near marshes, and there's no evidence that zooplankton prey are exported out of those environments to any significant degree that would support them. Uh, note the quote at the bottom from a very recent study by Yelton et al. There is little evidence of persistent subsidies of zooplankton from tidal wetlands to open water. Floodplains, on the other hand, we have recent evidence that they do export food uh, off of the floodplain into the river environment. But flow determines the magnitude of the, uh, of the food exported and the distance downstream that it's exported. And some of the key prey species don't survive in brackish water. So the notion that Yolo Bypass, for instance, is going to subsidize Sassoon Bay as a habitat for pelagic fish species lacks support. Next slide, please. Um, as I was saying, the, uh, we have a lot of recent evidence about the effect of tidal wetlands on um, food subsidies to the pelagic zone. And really, the evidence is surprisingly um, uh, clear that it doesn't happen to nearly the extent that we thought. Uh, Recent study by Hartman et al. Zooplankton abundant found that zooplankton abundance, which is what fish eat, is lower in shallow water than in deep water, and they conclude that uh, this is counter to the conceptual model, which suggests that restoring shallow tidal wetlands will provide an increased supply of food for at-risk fishes. At best, uh, food exports from wetlands is site-specific, seasonal, and likely to be inconsequential. Some tidal wetland habitats are actually sinks, not sources of prey items. Uh, prey items, again, for fish species. No one's disputing that um, many other wildlife species would use these habitats. Next slide, please. Um, the draft report fails to consider temperature effects of flow into the estuary. Um, the VA and your previous uh, um, suggestions about flow regimes vary differently, uh, very dramatically in the amount of flow involved, um, such that they can produce differences in temperature effects. The draft scientific basis report is very clear that temperature is regarded as a key variable for native fishes in the estuary, but it ignores uh, or gives short shrift to recent studies that demonstrate a meaningful effect of freshwater flow volume on delta temperatures. Um, later on, I'm going to provide a list of citations that are not included in the draft scientific basis report, and I mistakenly put uh, this Beshevkin and Maharja paper in, in that list. Beshevkin and Maharja that show this flow temperature effect is in the scientific basis report, but it's just sort of mentioned and, and nothing is done with that analysis, which I believe was very important. So apologies for my mistake there. Next slide, please. So I'd like to go through some case studies of how um, uh, the VA is likely to or or not likely to benefit native delta uh, native estuarine uh, fishes. Starting with the delta smelt, uh, we know that survival of certain life stages of delta smelt is flow dependent, and that entrainment mortality or negative old and middle river flows impairs viability. It's, on the other hand, unlikely that habitat area is limited given that the population is nearly indetectable. The last five years of the uh, fall midwater trawl, the index of abundance for delta smelt has been zero. So there's, there's room at the inn. There's space available for these fish. Um, there's just not enough fish to populate that space. Um, also, we know that habitat restoration alone has failed to maintain viability of delta smelt. The voluntary agreement proposes uh, about 5,200 acres of tidal wetland habitat 
restoration. Let's compare that to the 8,000 acres that were required under the 2008 biological opinion, of which about 4,000 acres have been completed. Sorry, about uh, 4,000 acres have been compl completed, uh, and the population has continued to decline. Uh, it's extremely unlikely that the proposed voluntary agreement habitat is sufficient to change foraging success at the population level, and it's unlikely that the habitat will be constructed quickly enough to recover, support, or maintain delta smelt viability unless flow conditions are addressed first. Next slide, please. Uh, longfin smelt. The, there's uh, much ado about longfin smelt larvae being detected in wetland habitats. Several papers on that recently. Um, that is because we've be recently begun to look for larval delta smelt in wetland or longfin smelt in wetland habitats. But the clear result of these papers is that their the presence of lar longfin smelt larvae in tidal habitats is flow dependent. We find them in these habitats during wet years. We don't find them during dry conditions. Um, and evidence is completely lacking that larval presence in wetlands benefits the population as a whole. We find larvae in wetlands, but we also find them in pelagic water. That's where we find a lot of uh, longfin smelt larvae. There's no evidence that rearing in wetland is a benefit to them. Uh, there is some evidence that wetland environments may be population sinks for longfin smelt during dry years because we, we see longfin smelt attempting to, it looks like they're attempting to spawn as adults. Uh, in these habitats every year, but it's only during wet years that we find subsequent larvae. Um, so the jury is still out on, on whether they may be population sinks during dry years. Next slide, please. Continuing with long pin smelt, uh, recruitment of juveniles is strongly flow dependent. We know this, um, but juvenile abundance appears to be limited by survival from the larval to juvenile stage. And the scientific basis report acknowledges this. Um, survival of larvae to the juvenile stage happens in pelagic waters. It does not happen in wetlands, right? So there's, again, uh, the evidence indicates that larval survival and thus the flow abundance relationship is mediated by freshwater flow. Final point, uh, there's really no evidence that long pin smelt um, are limited by prey limitation. Um, various studies of that have failed to detect any effect. The scientific basis report uh, mis misrepresents uh, the, the results of McNally, which actually found a negative relationship of, of prey with, with longfin smelt abundance. Next slide, please. Um, so moving on to a different species, briefly, starry flounder. There's a commercial fishery for this uh, species. It has a strong, persistent flow abundance relationship, but this fish spawns in the ocean and its juveniles rear on the bottom of open water habitats uh, in the estuary. There's no indication of direct reliance on tidal wetland or floodplain habitat, and there's no indication that their food web depends on production, food production in wetlands. Next slide, please. I didn't wanna leave the presentation without saying something nice about habitat, so I'll talk about Sacramento split tail. They're strongly associated with floodplain habitats, but those habitats need to be inundated for more than six weeks, up to 10 weeks, in order for them to be beneficial for split tail. Larvae and early juvenile split tail rely on food produced on floodplains, and in, but inundation duration correlates with food prey production growth and success. Um, and floodplain inundation duration requires flow. There's not, you know, dirt, dirt turning doesn't get you duration of inundation. That requires an adequate flow regime. Next slide, please. So in closing, I uh, said that um, I would, uh, that I had a, a bit of a problem with uh, the draft report not incorporating the best available science. These are a set of citations that I did not find in the scientific basis report, which are key to evaluating the effects of the voluntary agreement. Again, the Bashevkin and Maharja um, citation being here is a, my mistake. Uh, and the final slide, please. Um, shows more citations that uh, are key to evaluating voluntary agreements assumptions that are not included in the draft scientific basis report. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Rosenfield. And thank you again, Mr. Bopker, and apologies for glossing over uh, our panels and teasing uh, up uh, Ms. Pierre. Um, next, uh, 
we have our second panel, and I believe it begins with uh, Julie Zimmerman. Hi, everyone. I'm Julie Zimmerman. I'm the Director of Science for the Nature Conservancy's California Water Program. And I am here to really give the message that everyone has been giving, which is that you need both flow and habitat together to recover salmon populations. The voluntary agreements are based on the assumption that you can substitute habitat for some amount of flow. That flows can, you don't need to increase significantly if sufficient habitat is created. But recent papers have evaluated flow and habitat effects on salmon, and there's no evidence that increasing habitat in the absence of significantly improving flows will be sufficient to achieve the plan's objectives. Next slide, please. The Nature Conservancy supports habitat restoration. We've led restoration projects for riparian forests, shallow off-channel environments, and wetlands to achieve various benefits. But we're also a science-based organization, and we review empirical evidence for projects to assess the likely ecological outcomes. For salmon, the assumptions have been made that flow, habitat, and temperature are all limiting to salmon viability. And lots of habitat work have been completed has been completed over the years under programs such as CalFed, CVPIA, the biological opinions. And I've even led some of this work under CVPIA in my previous role with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Habitat restoration is definitely important for functioning rivers. And when we restore habitat, we see fish using it after it's been created. However, habitat restoration has not been empirically linked to changes in survival, productivity, or abundance of salmon. So when you don't meaningfully change flows, and when I say meaningfully, I mean to achieve functional flows, we don't see population level effects. In contrast, there's strong evidence that current river flows are inadequate to support ecosystem functions, which include the processes that create, activate, and maintain habitat. So in short, flow and habitat are interconnected. Both are necessary for ecosystem function, but habitat restoration will not be able to meet salmon viability and doubling goals without significant improvements in flow. Although the VAs are framed as providing flow and habitat, we have not seen any evidence that there will be meaningfully, meaningful improvements in flows under the VAs. Next slide. So a key principle of river ecology is that flow is the master variable, and you heard this in John's slide as well, and it's been in some other board documents. Functional habitat is needed for improved flow to fully function, but habitat can't function in the absence of flow. Flow magnitude and variability are primary drivers in ecosystem processes. The draft report draws an artificial distinction between flow actions and non-flow or habitat actions. For fish, flow is habitat, they're completely interchangeable, and flow forms and maintains the land water interface, creating and maintaining habitat through river processes. The Water Board has acknowledged this previously by proposing a flow standard based on the percent of unimpaired flow, and such a flow regime would track the natural hydrogra hydrograph and would improve habitat function. I've been working a lot on habitat function under a functional flow regime, there is a collaborative team that has worked together to develop the California Environmental Flows Framework, or CEF, for defining flow needs in rivers and how flow interacts with, with factors such as habitat, temperature, and water quality. In that report and our associated publications, we define functional, functional flows that support natural disturbances, promote physical dynamics, and drive ecosystem functions. Functional flows require connections to the landscape. But again, habitat can't function in the absence of functional flows. Staff recognizes that the magnitude and shape of the natural hydrograph controls various aspects of habitat. Next slide. Seth formally defines a functional flow as a component of the hydrograph that provides a distinct geomorphic, ecological, or biogeochemical function. Physical processes and biotic interactions in rivers are ultimately or intimately tied to the timing, duration, and frequency of natural flows. So function, functional flows must also be reflective of the natural patterns that occur in both space and time. 
SAF emphasizes five key flow components that need to be retained. And that includes a fall pulse or the first flushing flow of the season, the beginning of the wet season that provides mig migration cues. Peak flows that do substantial geomorphic work, such as the five or 10 year recurrence peak. Channel, they also reshape channels and transport sediment. Winter base flows that maintain habitat for species, such as salmon spawning. The spring recession flow that transitions into the dry season and supports migration and establishment of riparian vegetation. And then dry season low flows, which concentrate food supply and limit non-natives. Next slide. We know we can't forget the geomorphic side of the equation. We have lost a lot of habitat in the system. Just putting more flow down a channel might not be enough if there's no sediment to push around to make habitat or access to floodplains during a flood pulse. But without functional flows, the river processes won't maintain habitat and they won't support full functions. So like John said, turning dirt does not equal habitat. Functional flows inundating functional riverscapes are needed for habitat restoration and maintenance. I'm now going to touch on a few studies that support the interaction of flow and habitat and that habitat restoration can't support salmon in the absence of improved flows. Next slide. So the VAs propose manual creation of riparian habitat. In a five year study of fish migration along the Sacramento River, Henderson and others found no connection between off-channel habitat availability within a reach and survival of Chinook salmon through that reach. On the other hand, they found that river flow was a strong predictor of salmon survival across years and across reaches within any given year. Next slide. There's also been an assumption in the VAs that rapid growth of fish reared on floodplains leads to better survival and disproportionate contribution of floodplain reared fish to the fishery and escapement. Studies have shown greater growth rates of fish on floodplains, but they failed to detect other population level effects. For example, several recent studies failed to find a survival benefit for juvenile Chinook salmon migrating through the Yolo Bypass. Floodplains such as the Yolo Bypass are incredibly important, so is increased growth of juveniles, but the habitat context matters. Floodplain habitat can contribute to growth and life history diversity, but it can't support a population in the absence of other ecosystem functions. Next slide. The scientific basis report also hypothesizes potential widespread effects of, of food exported from shallow inundated habitat. In a recent study by Sturrock et al. in 2022, they show that salmon prey are exported from the floodplain, but the magnitude and spatial extent of the effect are correlated with river flow volume. So as you increase flows, more food is produced and that food is distributed further downstream. There's no evidence that shallow inundated habitats such as floodplains will provide meaningful food subsidies without an adequate flow regime to both produce the food and to distribute it. The habitat has to be inundated and flows have to be available in the river for broad distribution. Next slide. So, um, sorry, next slide. I think there's, oh, there you go. There you go. Um, Munch et al. It looked at, this is a 2020 paper by Stuart Munch and others, they looked at habitat use by wild spawned fry sized Chinook salmon on restored habitat in the Delta. And this figure right here, the top uh, panels in blue show, um, num show, excuse me, show the presence absence of fry on habitat. So whether habitat was occupied. And then the purple panels in the row below show density of fry on habitat. And then if you look at the columns, the first column to the left shows the effect with number of spawners, the middle panel shows flow, the right panel shows flow variability. They found that habitat occupancy or presence absence and density were positively correlated with flow and with the number of fish in the parental or spawning generation. But at recent flow and escapement levels, much of the shallow water habitat in the Delta is not even occupied by the life stage that is most reliant on this kind of habitat, the fry stage. 
building more of this habitat without significantly improving river flows and other measures to increase salmon abundance is not expected to increase abundance or viability. It will be empty most of the time. The authors hypothesize that at low flows, there's high mortality before fry even reach delta wetland habitat. Next slide. The VA emphasis on restoration of shallow habitats is based on the observation that Chinook salmon grow faster and larger on inundated floodplains than in mainstem rivers, and the assumption that large juveniles survive better than smaller migrants. But there's a wealth of evidence that the diversity of life histories is really important to viability of Chinook salmon population. There's no evidence that there should be a management emphasis on only one life history strategy. Anna Sturrock and others have shown that all life history strategies contribute to adult Ch Chinook salmon returns and that increased river flow promotes better survival within each life history, each life history strategy. So in these figure, this figure here on the right in blue shows how the abundance changes in wet years and in red it shows in dry years and it, that effect holds true for different size classes. Next slide. So this figure is from the scientific basis report and uh, we just saw that in an earlier presentation. It shows current versus proposed rearing habitat under the VA's relative to the total habitat need. The VA proposes attaining 25% of the estimated habitat need, not the entire habitat needed for doubling. And in this figure, it shows that the 25% target will not be achieved in most rivers. What's interesting is in the McCullamy, spawning and rearing habitat currently exceeds the amount the VA estimates is necessary to attain the doubling objectives, but the McCullamy is not close to attaining the doubling target. And this just shows that there's other factors that are also important. You cannot achieve your doubling goals by habitat alone. In general, the report fails to show that by increasing the area of shallow water rearing habitats without adequate flows, the board's doubling or viability objectives will be met. So in, strong, in contrast, there is strong evidence that significantly improving flow regimes will be necessary to attain the water quality control plans objectives. And what really needs to happen is to implement the percent of unimpaired, shape it in a way that achieves functional flow components, and then also add the habitat to achieve plan, to achieve plan objectives. Now I'm going to turn it over to Barry to talk about temperature. So you can move to the next slide. Thank you, Ms. Zimmerman. Oh, apologies, Mr. Nelson, you should be invited to unmute. I should unmute. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Thanks, Chair of School Board Members Barry Nelson again with Golden State Salmon Association. Uh, unlike our two previous speakers, I'm not uh, a PhD biologist, um, but I'm here to talk about upstream temperature issues. John Rosenfield talked uh, somewhat about downstream temperature issues in the estuary. I'm here to talk about upstream temperature issues, and those are issues that Golden State salmon tracks very closely. So let me start with just a brief summary of why those temperature issues are so important for salmon. I'm going to focus on salmon, but temperature is important for other species as well. Uh, the 2017 scientific basis report, as you can see here, um, states very clearly that temperatures are a major limiting factor for salmon and steelhead. Um, um, that, that a, a major driver like temperature um, um, and 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 it's worth noting, of course, that temperatures are are very very closely uh, linked with water management. Uh, the for salmon, the upstream temperature issues, the, the upstream life stages that are particularly critical uh, are pre-spawning adult survival, um, spawning success, and egg to fry survival. It's just worth noting a small item that the staff presentation um, earlier on this agenda item about limiting factors uh, didn't address temperature issues. Um, uh, in most of uh, Central Valley rivers, temperatures are water management driven. That's a particularly important issue uh, connected both to cold water storage and, uh, and releases. And it's worth noting that, that, that that is not true in all of salmon's range. Much of, of, uh, of in, in, in other parts of Chinook salmon's range, um, uh, temperatures aren't a driving factor for a bunch of reasons. Um, the draft scientific report also, basis report also 
clearly concludes that a warming climate is going to increase the importance of temperature issues. That's going to happen both because of rising temperatures and changing hydrology. Uh, so over time, these issues are going to become even more important. Next photo, next slide, please. Uh, this is a photograph, actually a state board photograph of one of the famous adult salmon fish kills. We have seen some of these adult fish kills in the Central Valley, uh, but far more common in the Central Valley are what I think of as invisible fish kills, uh, the salmon eggs and salmon fry being killed by temperature conditions. Next, please. Um, temperature issues are also particularly important for the board to consider when they're evaluating the proposed voluntary agreements. There are two reasons for this. First is because the voluntary agreements don't address temperature issues full stop. Um, the VAs don't include in-stream temperature requirements. They don't include cold water storage requirements. They don't have uh, proposed requirements that would that directly control are designed to directly control temperature. Um, um, the, uh, the, the draft scientific basis report clearly states, as you see, can see here in, in a couple of places, that temperature issues were not considered in developing uh, the VA habitat uh, proposals. They, the, the temperatures were left out of that equation. Um, and, and it's important, that's particularly important, simply put, um, juvenile salmon that are killed by temperature conditions can't benefit from the creation of new voluntary agreement habitat. And that failure to address temperature issues results in significantly overstating the potential benefits of voluntary habitat agreement creation, uh, uh, voluntary uh, agreement habitat uh, uh, proposals. Um, this makes it absolutely essential that your analysis really focus on these temperature issues as a key vulnerability in the, of the VA process. Um, another reason temperature issues are so important in the VA process is that uh, the worst temperature damage frequently uh, is seen in the driest of years. And those are the years in which the VAs would provide the smallest contribution of new environmental flows. Uh, your staff earlier uh, on this agenda item showed you table 4-1 that summarizes the voluntary agreement um, of flow contributions. Um, if you have a chance, go back and look at that, uh, that table and look at the flow contributions in critical years. It shows that there would only be 2,000 acre feet of new environmental flows on the Sacramento River. And uh, that table, table 4-1, shows that in critical years, there would be no, zero, new environmental flows on the Feather, the Yuba, um, from the Friant uh, unit on the San Joaquin or on the Colony. Um, those flows described in that VA table are in many ways worse conditions than in 2008, 2009 biological opinions. What that means is that the low flow VA contributions, particularly in, in critical years, uh, would exacerbate the temperature impacts we're already seeing. Next slide, please. Um, there are some areas in which the, uh, the scientific basis report, the draft supplemental scientific basis report does discuss habitat, uh, does, does discuss temperatures. Um, uh, there's a brief discussion about temperatures in floodplain rearing habitat. Uh, but unfortunately, generally speaking, uh, the document is dramatically in, inadequate in addressing temperatures, addressing upstream temperatures. Um, and I'm going to mention six issues. These are the first three. Um, um, first, um, the document doesn't adequately discuss temperature requirements for all life stages, particularly spawning adult salmon and in-stream rearing habitat. Uh, second, um, the document doesn't summarize temperature damage that we have seen in recent years. Um, we've seen low to disastrous egg to fry survival in many years, um, driven to a great extent by temperature-related mortality. It's temperatures that are the biggest single driving factor there of, of uh, reduced um, egg to fry survival in some of these years. We've seen those disastrous results in 2014, 2015, 2020, 2021. Um, uh, we've also seen pre-spawn mortality, the same sort of adult mortality 
that I showed that photo of on the Klamath River. We've seen that uh, in 2021 as well. Um, and uh, th these numbers suggest, again, that our temperature-related problems are growing. Third place where the draft report doesn't adequately address temperature issues is that the VA inaccurately assumes 38% egg, egg to fry survival um, when they're looking at uh, trying to evaluate the benefits of their proposed habitat creation. Next slide. Th this slide is designed to show the, the combination of those two factors. The blue bars, this is, this is focused on Sacramento River um, winter run egg to fry survival um, 2011 to 2020 for a decade. The blue bars here show um, egg to fry survival each year for that, those 10 years. Um, uh, and temperature related mortality is the major driver of that egg to fry survival. The red line you can see here at 38%, that's a little faint, um, uh, shows the 38% egg to fry survival that is assumed in the VA document. And you can see here that actual egg to fry survival for winter run is far lower than assumed um, at that 38% level. It's far lower in eight of these 10 years. In five of these 10 years, egg to fry survival is less than half of the 38% survival assumed by the VA process. Uh, we see similar problems if we look at uh, at winter at, at fall or Sacramento River fall run. Um, similar problems in other rivers. Um, what this shows very clearly is that in most years on the Sacramento right now, uh, temperature conditions, existing temperature conditions, could kill juvenile salmon before they could benefit from habitat restoration that might happen downstream. Next slide, please. Um, the fourth area where temperature conditions aren't adequately addressed is just summarizing the existing conditions in our river. I mentioned the Sacramento. Uh, here, I'll only briefly mention, in addition, the Feather River. Um, Feather has major temperature problems. Roughly half of the existing spawning habitat on the Feather is unusable for salmon in most years because of temperature conditions. Uh, and those temperatures are the result of temperature pollution from DWR's Thermolito After Bay. Um, yet temperature issues, and the role of the Thermolito After Bay, the role of the uh, uh, Department of Water Resources Oroville complex is not even mentioned in the discussion of the, of, the, of the Feather River. And this is not the only place where temperature issues aren't, uh, where existing temperature challenges aren't fully developed. Um, the fifth issue, fifth place where we don't think the um, temperature of those, these upstream temperature issues are adequately addressed is the issue I mentioned earlier, the cumulative impacts of temperature, in, temperature impacts in critical years combined with low or non-existent new environmental flows in, uh, in, um, in those same years. Um, those cumulative impacts aren't an analyzed in this document. That framework is not presented. Um, and then summing those issues up, the sixth area is that the draft report doesn't really fully address the role of cold water storage and related water management in controlling those key issues, river temperatures, pre-spawn mortality, temperature-related mortality, um, and egg deprived survival. Um, um, and what that means for survival of the ocean, those are hugely important issues. Um, and what that means more broadly is that um, the draft document doesn't adequately uh, present a framework for how temperature issues would affect the claimed benefits of voluntary agreement habitat creation. Um, these temperature issues that you can see have enormous implications for the voluntary agreements and their claimed benefits, huge implications for the doubling goal. Uh, next slide, please. That's the last one. Um, I'll provide more, uh, as John did, um, I'll provide more citations in about temperature issues in our written comments, uh, but simply put, these omissions in this document clearly show that the draft report um, on, on temperature issues, these upstream temperature issues, is inaccurate, incomplete, and can't be the basis of either evaluating the VAs or updating the data plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson and Ms. Zimmerman. I appreciate the, the, the feedback. Uh, and the citations as well, actually. Um, those were helpful for Mr. Rosenfeld, and I look forward to yours. Thank you, it's much appreciated. I'm going to um, mess around with the order a little bit. I know we have a third panel to get to, 
Uh, we did, uh, note, I did notice here we have a vice chair um, from a, a, a tribe that I want to make sure we elevate uh, because any electeds um, and especially tribal members uh, are elevated and go first. And once we do that, I know we have someone with a time commitment. And so we'll go to Jennifer Pierre and then we'll go back to then our third panel. And so appreciate everyone's flexibility and um, coordinating that. So I'd like to um, call up then here. Let me get organized on my spreadsheet. Apologies. Melissa Tayaba, who is the vice chair of the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians. And apologize, uh, Vice Chair uh, Tayaba, if I know you may be participating, she may be participating remotely or is she coming uh, here soon in person? Okay, okay. okay. No worries, thank you. She I is on remotely if. Yes, it finally sent me the, to oh, unmute. Thank you, can Vice Chair. Can you hear Chair. me? Yes, we okay. can. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair, for your patience <laughs> and appreciate your participation. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. Uh, my name is Melissa Tayaba. I am the Vice Chair of Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians and Director of Traditional Ecological Knowledge. Um, and so I'm just gonna make a brief statement. I believe that your scientific analysis on the voluntary agreements is not only incomplete, but also inadequate. Nowhere does your analysis include consideration or incorporation of tribal consultation or traditional ecological knowledge. Failure to include tribes in our indigenous knowledge about the Delta, which my people have occupied and stewarded since the beginning of time, is a failure to acknowledge tribal people, our communities, our needs, and the wealth of knowledge that each tribe possesses. It is a failure to represent our best interests and we will not be left out and ignored. We have fought for hundreds of years and we will continue to make our voices heard and our presence known. We did not accept your incomplete science, which only serves to worsen the conditions of the Delta and all of the cultural and traditional resources within that we hold sacred. The Delta is diminishing largely due to irresponsible water management diversions, poor, poor water quality, and lack of flows. Our traditional food sources are endangered. The plants we rely on for cultural and ceremonial uses are at risk, and the waterways that sustain and nourish my people are now unsafe. You have a responsibility to ensure the health of the Delta, and I urge you to understand the gravity of the impacts on tribal people and the repercussions to our communities if you do not. Tribes were excluded from any and all discussions on voluntary agreements. There was no tribal consultation, whether that was an unfortunate oversight or an intentional decision, it needs to be corrected. It is imperative that you include and consult California tribes on water issues disproportionately impacting us. Otherwise, your science that informs Delta management will continue to be incomplete and inadequate. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Vice Chair. Really appreciate your contributions and your words and your, your feedback on the scientific basis report and uh, the board's work here uh, generally. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call up Jennifer Pierre. <laughs> Wait, actually, thank you. I appreciate the patience and everyone, thank you. Oh, I apologize, I, you need I got this. It. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you for accommodating my um, son's activity schedule this afternoon, thank you. Um, I'm Jennifer Pierre, I'm the general manager for the state water contractors. Uh, we serve water to um, 27 million Californians, which really equates to one in 12 Americans actually, and 750,000 acres of farmland in the state. And um, we're very involved in the voluntary agreement. And um, the comments I'm gonna to share today are my comments. Uh, we have a team of folks still reviewing, but I wanted to reach out to you directly, um, given the work that I personally do on this, to share my initial perspectives. Um, I'm, I'm personally overall pleased with the direction of the report. 
Um, and I'm happy that the staff and the board are moving forward with this process. I think one thing maybe we can all agree on is that we need to get this done and it's urgent that we do so. So I appreciate the forward movement in the process. Um, I also wanted to comment that um, when I had first heard that this might be supplementary to the 2017 report, I thought it was a terrible idea. Um, but after having reviewed it, I think that does make sense. And I do appreciate the thoroughness with which um, staff, along with other state agencies, have reviewed the more recent literature to be included in this report. As is stated in the conclusion of, it, of, the, of this report, um, the VA provides, and I quote, improvements in multiple types of rearing habitat over upstream regions, off-channel habitat, and estuarine habitat that can increase population resiliency through a portfolio effect, which may assist with population persistence even in low flow years. And I think that really sums up the intent of the voluntary agreement. It's clear from the analysis that the combination of flow and habitat actions provide substantial benefits to fish and ecosystems. Some examples pulled from the um, report include um, improvements in spawning habitat, which Ms. Conrad um, noted, especially on the Sacramento River, where we know winter run spawning habitat management is critical, and we heard that um, just in the previous panel as well. Um, I would note that there was no mention in the report about the thiamine deficiency. Um, I don't believe that was in the 2017 report either. So as it relates to limiting factors, not necessarily things that um, we can control within the voluntary agreement or water quality control plan program, we need to acknowledge that that is out there and um, unfortunately undermining um, actions that we're trying to take. I also want to note that, um, and again noted by Ms. Conrad, that there are major improvements in what they're referring to as meaningful floodplain events on the Feather, McKellamy, and Yuba Rivers, and they do activate the floodplains to distribute food production. So I think that's a really important conclusion uh, related to the floodplain that's proposed. Um, I also want to note that as it relates to abundance of fish in the Delta, the four species that do have a relationship, um, a, a, statistically significant relationship to flow in the delta that were shown. The same models that were used in this supplemental report were used in the 2017 report. And these models do actually show, for example, long fin smelt abundance increases in dry and below normal years of at least 11%. So some pretty significant increases in abundance of one of the key species that we're looking at. That was not related to any habitat analysis. That was specifically the flow abundance relationship used um, under the unimpaired flow proposal and the voluntary agreement proposal. Um, as it relates to temperature, we know that is a huge driving factor. Um, as it relates to temperature in the delta, I just want to know we can't control that. We know that that's driven by atmospheric temperatures, but there is some evidence that habitat restoration can create some temperature refuges, so I think that that's encouraging and referenced in the report. And as it relates to delta restoration, I just want to say um, there is only 5,227 acres proposed, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is because um, under BDCP and other planning activities, there was a lot of concern about creating predator habitats, inland lakes, and other um, um, inhabitable and um, bad conditions for our native fish species. And so we really wanted to focus the delta restoration on where we knew that we had the greatest um, level of confidence that we would actually create benefits. And so we looked at areas that were um, available for restoration, primarily in the North Delta, and um, of acres that could be easily restored. Because remember, this is an eight-year program, so we need to be able to get in the ground and make these restoration activities happen. And I just want to say that I am personally not opposed to additional Delta restoration if we find that that is, in fact, creating the kind of benefits that this report says it is. But there, there was a rationale for that number, and I wanted to let you know that. I also want to point out that the baseline used in this report was, in fact, the 2008-2009 biops. So the evidence that we're seeing in these conclusions is actually on top of those flows, which um, in some instances makes this analysis conservative. Um, but I also want to point out that that um, baseline is not what was agreed to in the um, 2022 MOU and term sheet that was signed by all the parties um, noted earlier. And lastly, or second to lastly, I want to note that you know, it was really important that this report noted the uncertainties. Um, it really looked at error bars around floodplains and about abundances and all of the different qu um, quantitative analyses that were used. And we think that's really important 
these are the uncertainties that the voluntary agreement science program is going to test. That is that is one of the main objectives of the voluntary agreement is to identify these uncertainties and test them. And they are going to help us understand how our management actions are affecting species and habitat and inform our future adjustments and actions. And this is gonna help us to continue the acceleration toward meeting the long-term water quality control plan objectives, including the doubling objective. And really lastly, I just wanna say that we, the state contractors, I can only speak for us, welcome the engagement by others, including the NGOs and tribal communities to help us with the development of the voluntary agreement. Uh, we have left space in the governance document. We want them at the table. I have personally reached out to many people that you've heard from today to invite them on multiple occasions to the table, and we support that. There is expertise within those communities, especially as it relates to governance, science, adaptive management, and this program will be more successful with their involvement. Thank you, and thank you to all of you who've worked on this report. Thank you, Ms. Pierre. I appreciate your time and contributions to the work. Uh, let's go back to our panels, and I believe we have Spencer Fern, Ashley Overhouse, and Gary Popker on uh, panel three. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Appreciate it, board members. Thank you for having me or giving me the opportunity to present. Um, one of the things that, if I could get into the next slide, please. Um, on this, on the scientific basis report, HABs seem to be an afterthought in this report. And um, there's only one paragraph in the draft scientific basis report that actually addresses, addresses HABs concerns. And uh, in this, in the report, it is stated that increases to flow may alleviate the impacts of cyanohabs. However, cyanohabs also increase the frequency during years with higher temperatures caused by climate change and may counteract the benefits of, a, of increased flow. And um, I wanted to point out in a, in a report from Berg and Satula, or let me phrase, hold on. The board knows, let me take it back a second, sorry. In, in, the, in the quote about how the flows may counteract the benefits of HABs, the State Water Board knows that the HABs are a big concern in, in the Delta. And without, without using, using the term that they may counteract the benefits of HABs is incomplete science because it's not based on any empirical evidence in terms of how temperatures increase. And essentially where I want to go with that is that there's, there's an, in a report from Berg Satula and, and Satula in in a report on causes of harmful algal blooms, and it was in a report to the Central Valley Water Quality Regional Board, they uh, po pointed out that there are like there are five main factors that lead to harmful algal blooms outbreaks, and what the, those five are flow, low flow conditions, which can lead to stagnant waters, uh, high water temperatures, which was uh, has been previously mentioned a lot throughout today. There are uh, light availability, which is what helps feed the the HABs through photosynthesis. You've got turbidity, which specifically low turbidity when there is uh, more light, which leads to more light availability throughout the water column. And then there are nutrients that form in nutrient loads. And essentially the reason why I wanna point out those five, those five factors are that the previous quote up top is about, about how the, the effects of climate change and higher increased water temperatures may be counteracted the formation of harmful algal blooms is a factor of all five of these factors. It's not just one, it's not one that's more important than the other. Sure, there are some have their own significance, but they act as a group. And temperature obviously isn't that only important factor. And increased flow or increased flow to an adequate level that can mitigate blooms can help to dilute or transport nutrients as well as reduce residence time in waters. And so like, like I wanna get back to is there's a, this lack of flow is one of those critical, critical environmental factors for HABs formation among those five. And according to the EPA's website, based on uh, causes of cyanohabs in, in freshwater ecosystems, um, alterations of flow is listed as one of the primary concerns. And in another document from the EPA based on um, water quality criteria in regards to have harmful algal blooms as well as other aspects of water quality, 
there was a quote that was specifically stating that the increase in water quality, water qual column stability associated with higher temperatures, less flow, and shallower water, and which would also favor total cyanobacteria growth. And so, essentially, where I'm trying to go with this is that the Flow and nutrients specifically, if those two are things that can be controlled, especially by measures made by the State Water Board, but the factors of temperature and turbidity and, and light availability are less uh, reasonable to control. So if there's one thing we can control, we should be doing everything in our power to control that. Next slide, please. And so starting a comparison between different years um, in dry years, you're, you would expect there to be a more of a concern for flow, and this is according to an article or uh, a report from Lehman et al. in 2013, which was a focus on um, the types of causes for my harmful algal blooms and specifically microcystis. And uh, these toxins were increased in a high or were in a higher abundance during dry years. And um, According to those, I'll read some other quotes in there. One of the quotes is that dry years were generally more were generally characterized by low stream flow and low total suspended solids, but elevated water temperatures and inorganic and organic nutrient concentrations. Further, further putting that the, the low stream flow is kind of negatively cor correlated with water temperature. So the lower the flow, the higher the temperature. And so in that same report, the increased abundance of microcystis was accompanied by a 13 to 52 percent lower stream flows in both Sacramento and San, San Joaquin rivers. So obviously a lot lower flow in dry years. And with microcystis abundance, we've got stream flow that was correlated to with all of the environmental variables like that I mentioned in the previous slide, but more specifically uh, lower turbidity, uh, increased light availability and increased water temperature. And so regarding the low flow conditions in dry years, they clearly exacerbate HABs out outbreaks. And which they, this also ties back into the fish habitat and fishery populations because this negatively affects those populations. Um, HABs are toxic to fish in their own toxins, of course. But the, another ha side effect of harmful algal blooms are that they will deplete oxygen in the water after they have disappeared. And, with oxygen depletion, you get fish kills because the fish can't get the oxygen through their gills through the water. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is that improving flow conditions can help to prevent specifically the dissolved oxygen depletion. Next slide, please. And so what, uh, dry years aren't the only years where you can see harmful algal blooms. And, reason why I bring up is that wet years can also have low flow conditions and they, this could be due to due met, uh, management decisions made regarding the flow through the del throughout the delta. And in another article by Lehman et al. in, in 2020, uh, specifically was measuring the differences between microcystis in wet years and dry years, specifically 2014 and 2017, respectively, of course. And um, during, according to the research, the wet years did not prevent blooms as, and one of those key factors in throughout all of that was the low flow. And to quote, the, to quote the article on the flow conditions, they had done prior research and noticed that um, 2,800 roughly cubic feet per second in the upper San Joaquin River and below 10,600 cubic feet per second in the lower Sacramento, Sacramento River near Rio Vista those were the values. Anything below that would be more inducive to, uh, conducive for harmful algal blooms to, to form, and specifically microcystis. So during the September of 2017, which was the wet year in this, in this, investi or this report, the peak, and this was during the peak of the microcystis bloom, flow was measured to be below both of those averages of uh, 2,800 cubic feet per second in the San, jo San Joaquin River and 10,000. 600 cubic feet per second in the Sacramento River. And even though it was a wet year, we still saw problems with flow in these, in these blooms outbreaks, highlighting the importance that not having adequate flows leads to the tabs formation. And regarding the nutrients in flow, stream flow is also expected to be important due to the excess of nutrients in the San Francisco estuary. So 
kind of tying it all together, flow is important for these different factors that can lead into harmful algal blooms. So to c continue on that, the State Water Board can regulate these low flow conditions in year where, years where water temperatures are excessive. And I feel like that's the one linchpin that, it, it, again, dating back to the previous argument I was making is that if you can control flow, you can help control the problems that mitigate water quality concerns that also affect the fishery fishery populations and, and habitats. So we believe that there needs to be more investigation done on the harmful algal blooms regarding the scientific basis report, maybe even giving itself its, a, its separate section because it deserves a little more information than just one paragraph in a, in a document that focuses on flow. And uh, the State Water Board needs to do the hard work of setting a HAB standard to help set this up, especially for beneficial uses alongside the standard for drinking water before committing to voluntary agreements and a tunnel project. If flows through the delta are not increased to adequate levels, HABs threaten to undo the voluntary agreement habitat goals further to and undermine fishery populations. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ashley Overhouse with the proposed goals of the voluntary agreements. Thank you. Thank you, much appreciated. Thank you, Spencer. Can everyone hear me? We can. Good afternoon. Wonderful. Good afternoon. I promise I will make this quick. We have been here a long time. Um, again, as Spencer noted, Ashley Overhouse, I'm the Water Policy Advisor with Defenders and Wildlife. Defenders stands with our colleagues and their concerns with the draft report. I start today um, with the conclusion of the report, the chapter that Water Board staff are in charge of. Many thanks to Water Board staff for their work on this. An effective conclusion brings the reader back to the main point, reminding the reader of the purpose of the essay. So here, I think it was well done. So we've heard a lot of information today, which is why I start back here. The proposed VAs are expected to achieve two standards. First, to double salmon populations, and second, to maintain the natural production of viable native fish populations. Unfortunately, the draft report fails to even consider full compliance with water quality standards, let alone provide a scientific basis for finding that the standards would be met. Next slide, please. The report changes the existing salmon doubling objective. The current objective does not have a timeline for implementation and thus requires providing the flows necessary to achieve salmon doubling today. Whereas the report proposes to defer achievement of salmon doubling to the year 2050, which on its face is inconsistent with federal law and inconsistent with at least the spirit of state law. It is also important to note that the current VA proposal as outlined in the draft report and the draft governance document referenced earlier only spans eight years with no effective enforcement mechanism to ensure compliance or achievement of these objectives and effectively delaying recovery goals for salmon and the overall health of the Delta estuary even further. We are also curious as to how the board produced their salmon doubling numbers in this draft report, since those numbers are lower than the Central Valley Project Improvement Act's salmon doubling numbers, as listed in the final anadromous fish restoration program report. Additional information in the final report to explain that discrepancy would be much appreciated. Next slide, please. The report also lacks metrics to define viability. The 2010 final flow criteria report, as also mentioned many times earlier today, identified some abundance targets for certain species that were intended to reflect protection of the public trust. The 2017 scientific basis report adopted those criteria. See specifically that report, page 3-13. It's notable that the board has identified metrics of success in the 2017 scientific basis report, but fails to use those metrics here. Next slide, please. The report's analysis is inconsistent and sometimes misleading, and we have listed four examples of those instances on the next two slides. The first example, the report claims that the VA would provide 5,227 acres of tidal marsh habitat for fish in the Delta, which it claims is 25% of the amount identified by the San Francisco Estuary Institute 2020 report, page 6-27. Yet only a few sentences later, the report admits that physical habitat restoration must overlap with appropriate water quality conditions to provide adequate habitat. And then the Delta and Susun Marsh, only 789 acres of this proposed habitat would provide suitable habitat for salmon in winter and spring months. That's approximately only 
of the SFEI target. As Dr. Zimmerman noted earlier, there is no evidence that rearing habitat in the Delta is limiting for Chinook salmon. Second example, the report states that additional floodplain habitat will theoretically confer survival benefits to juvenile Chinook salmon, but it then reviews several studies, as described earlier by Dr. Zimmerman, that fail to support that presumed benefit. Next slide, please. As Dr. Rosenfield noted earlier, the report cites research finding that the strong relationship between Delta outflow and longfin smelt abundance is tied to success in their deep water rearing habitat, but then concludes that additional outflow will not be effective without additional shallow water habitat proposed in the VA. See page 6-29. And then our final example. The draft report assumes that floodplain habitat will generate food for rearing juvenile salmon, but it also repeatedly states that it is uncertain whether food supply is currently limiting salmonid populations on the Sacramento River. And it says the same for, of course, the American Yuba, American and McCallamy rivers, pages 2-6, 2-8, 2-10, and 2-11, respectively. I thank the board again for the opportunity to present, and I pass it off to my colleague, Mr. Gary Bobker, to conclude our presentation. Mr. Bobker. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you very much for accommodating um, our uh, organization's desire to pre present sort of a, a linked sequential uh, series of presentations and appreciate your patience. Um, you know, there's a lot here, a lot to unpack. We will be submitting written comments that go into much greater detail, but given so that we had so much to unpack, I wanted to very briefly go through some key points, key takeaways here. Um, beginning with the, the fact as I started at the very beginning of this, that um, you know, there, you, you've got a huge record uh, in front of you about the, uh, the problems with the underlying assumption that subsetting habitat for flows um, you know, in a program that doesn't substantially increase flows um, is just not gonna do the job and that flows are in fact critical, not just to achieving viability and salmon doubling, which is the primary concern here, but uh, in fact, uh, to create, maintain and make functional physical habitat. Um, there isn't really evidence that increased habitat is gonna translate to increased abundance or other uh, viability attributes, but there is strong evidence that uh, flow does that. Um, as we've gone over, over and over again through the years. Um, there's no evidence that the food subsidy uh, from habitat is uh, meaningful or significant for pelagic species, but there's strong evidence that uh, the food subsidy for salmonids is very uh, much dependent on the flow regimes, uh, adequate flow regimes. Um, there's no evidence that the uh, kind of shallow water or wetland habitats being created are really the limiting factors for many of these species. No evidence that um, the habitat restoration that's been done in the past would provide benefits for, in many ways, um, but, but no evidence that it actually has um, uh, achieved doubling or, or met viability objectives for many of the species we're talking about. Next slide, please. Um, the, the analysis fails to consider some, some very, very critical uh, limiting factors uh, and potential effects of implementing VAs. Um, it fails to consider uh, the effect, uh, temperature effects, both on inflow to the estuary, which can have a significant temperature effect uh, on the spawning and early rearing success of salmonids upstream. Um, we know this is a, a big limiting factor for a number of native species, but um, but it's not touched on. Um, the report fails to consider the effects of VA actions on uh, harmful al algal bloom formation, uh, and uh, the report's assumptions are inconsistent with uh, the the primary driver here, which is attaining existing and proposed water quality control plan objectives. Um, so let me, uh, let's go to the final slide here, or the next slide. Um, 
there are a number of issues that um, were only maybe very briefly touched on in our presentations that um, are also highly problematic. And I just wanted to remind you what they were. Um, you know, the use of, uh, however, you however you address this issue, you know, um, and whatever baseline you use to evaluate impacts, the fact is that the VAs are predicated on flow assets being additional uh, to the 2019 biological opinions and not um, the existing baseline or, or improved baselines. Um, and that's that's a fundamental flaw in the uh, in, in considering the impacts of VAs. Um, whether in fact those slow assets are real, um, will they come across or not? Um, is uh, uh, there are many issues about whether uh, flows will show up when they're supposed to be, uh, uh, w when they're most needed, um, uh, and what their fate will be in different parts of the system, uh, uh, and a number of other issues that I think other presenters will probably touch on. So uh, let's go to the last slide. Um, so based on this long list of concerns, problems, shortcomings, omissions, um, it's clear to us that the draft scientific basis report supplement is inaccurate and incomplete um, amidst important information. And as such, it can't serve as the basis for developing and adopting water quality control plan objectives. Um, that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to present to you. Um, if you have questions, we're happy to answer them. I'll note that um, Dr. Zimmerman uh, was, uh, as far as I know, I had to leave a, a while back and uh, ask Dr. Rosenfield to field any questions on her presentation. So uh, with that, uh, thank you again. Thank you. I appreciate the thoroughness of the feedback uh, from all the presenters as part of your panel uh, and just the critical eye, certainly to the document that you provided. I'm looking to my colleagues in case there are any questions and seeing none, I appreciate again. Oh yes, please, Board Member Firestone. Oh, I just had a question really, actually it's for um, uh, uh, staff or um, the first panel to respond to is just, can you, um, you know, we've had a couple commenters both in the panel and then um, Jennifer Pierre talk about the um, baseline. And I feel like I'm hearing different things and I'm wondering if you could clarify um, baseline and how that's fitting into this, um, the 2017 that report that, that this is supplementing. Um, it's, uh, yeah, if you can clarify that, that'd be great. Yes, I will try. This is a complicated issue and it, and I sometimes um, create more confusion by trying to explain this, but um, in evaluating the um, effects, particularly the flow abundance uh, benefits, um, because the modeled scenarios that we had did not represent the 2008-9 biological opinion baseline, which was essentially what the baseline was in the 2017 report, we used a post-processing exercise to correct for that. And so the intention was to use that same baseline that we used in 2017 to assess the effects or the benefits potentially of different ranges of unimpaired flow um, to also assess the benefits related to those flow abundance relationships at least um, of the VA. And so, so the, the VA was modeled on top of a 2019 biological opinion because that's, those are the terms of the VA as proposed. Um, and so the, those flow quantities um, were added on top of the appropriate baseline um, for the proposal. Then there was a further post-processing exercise of those model results to essentially discount those benefits uh, of flow for the reduction in flows associated with the 2019 biop relative to the 2008 and 9 biops, which was the baseline for the 2017 report. Is that clear? That was helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I, I can add. I think the, yeah, the bottom line is that 
the benefits that were assessed were assessed relative in a complex <laughs> quantitative way to the 2008-2009 biops. So the, you don't, you would see a different benefit if you compared it to the 2019 biological opinion. So that discount was assumed and that the benefits were, those benefits were not incorporated into the analyses in the scientific basis report. So sorry, just making sure I understand the, um, we did our best despite the fact that the VA is um, based on the 2019 um, biological opinion, we did our best to have um, kind of apples and apples uh, comparison with the 2017 uh, scientific basis report and this one in terms of understanding um, flows and benefits? Flows, specifically with respect to delta outflows, there were some other, we, we did not correct tributary flows um, for that change. Um, so when, when we um, complete the, the draft staff report that's going to, you know, give us the whole picture of the benefits and impacts associated with all of the alternatives that we're considering, um, we should have a much cleaner set of comparisons and a, a clearer narrative um, such that we can really say what the apples to apples comparison looks like. Can I add one other response? I, I, I'm not sure if it was your question or not, but um, you had raised the question of how this report relates to the 2017 report. This is a supplement to the 2017 report. So all of the information included in the 2017 report is essentially part of this report. So particularly on the issue of temperature, temperature is discussed in that report. There, aren't, there isn't an evaluation of the temperature impacts of scenarios in that report. That will be included in the upcoming staff report for both the VA and the alternatives. But the, the benefits from a biological perspective of temperatures is evaluated in that 2017 report. So this is incorporated into um, this report as well. Helpful, thank you, Ms. Riddle. And thank you, board member. At this point, we ha uh, and Mr. Bob Corey, I did see your hand up for a moment. Did you want to um, circle back on the point? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I actually uh, think John Rose, Dr. Rosenfield had a point on that. But. Mr. Rosenfield, please. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, Matt Holland's explanation makes sense to me, and I, I recognize how hard it is to put things in apples to apples terms, so I appreciate that. That was done, uh, but just to flag then, hopefully not to confound things, but to clarify that the 2017 baseline used for both scientific basis reports uh, would not include the phase one flows from the phase one update, the 40% unimpaired, 30 to 50% range. And so voluntary agreement flows from those tributaries on the San Joaquin are, are less but using the baseline of 2017, it looks like those flows are additive to add flow there, but they're actually less than the current plan. So again, the baseline, the point being that the baseline matters and I urge board members and staff to, you know, keep, keep track of what these numbers are being compared to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenfield. I appreciate that and agree very much. The, the baseline uh, does matter and we're, we're doing our best amongst what our again, um, kind of moving targets amongst it all uh, to have some consistency and, and some better decision-making space for us. So thank you. Not seeing anything further from my colleagues. Again, thank you, Mr. Bob Kerr. We can uh, begin to get into individual comments. I appreciate everyone's patience. I know um, here it takes time and sometimes uh, discussions can go over, uh, but we have about 30 commenters left uh, at five minutes a piece, which uh, I didn't glance, but there may be some that have requested a little more than that, uh, but that gives us you know, roughly two and a half hours and brings us to about six o'clock um, with then a 10 minute break, which I'd like to take now. And um, so let's go ahead and take that 10 minute break and then we can um, get through our individual commenters. Um, then again, which will take about two and a half hours. We'll try to go without break so that we can try to conclude here uh, not too long after six o'clock, knowing that there are a lot of folks out there. So again, appreciate everyone's patience so far. Let's take a quick break so that we can 
then get through um, our commenters and uh, just thank you. We'll be, let's get back here uh, at 3.30.
Okay, everyone, we're at time, and I think we can gather back. We're missing uh, our, the vice chair at this point, but she'll be uh, here returning shortly. Uh, now we can get to our individual commenters. I do want to get to a group of commenters uh, here in the room. Um, and again, thanks for everyone's patience. I know it's been a long day. Uh, so I believe first um, part of the group is Cynthia Cortez. Oh, is she online? Okay. Um, how, how best do you, well, uh, then uh, let me make sure I, uh, we identify properly the group that wanted to go that was uh, here in person. Okay, apologies. Of course. Good afternoon. Uh, you may have to turn on the microphone there. Apologies. Uh, there's a button, right? Yeah. Good Please. afternoon. Can you hear me? I can. I can. Right. Thank you. We can. Um, <clears throat> give me a minute. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, chair and board members. My name is Gloria Alonso Cruz. You have seen me before, but through Zoom. I am a senior climate water advocate with Restored Delta and a metropolitan area planning and GIS student at Sacramento State University. I am representing Stockton as a Delta environmental justice community where I have gained numerous experiences and observations that reflect how the science behind the Bay Delta plan has failed for decades to provide environmental equity while prioritizing water extraction and diversion processes that are not reflective of surface water beneficial uses, overlook the climate crisis, and perpetuate socio-environmental disparities. The recent update to the draft scientific basis report supplement and support of proposed voluntary agreements continues to grow concern about the social systems ruling over science and the future of aquatic systems. Rising concerns about the current and updated Bay Delta Plan objectives in connection to the additional regional temperature fluctuations, implementation timeline, and monitoring of critical local and regional scales. They assume reliable and engineered solutions for Delta water management continues to be based on an incomplete understanding and model, modeling of the regional ecology and Delta habitats that are dependent on adequate flows. Divor, divor, di, divorcing habitat restoration from adequate water flows comprises, compromises the health of the most at-risk native and human ecosystems. The overarching effects of this impacts the ecological integrity of rivers, food systems, and food sovereignty, cultural and, so and cultural sovereignty within the delta and the interconnected watersheds, some of which are partially reflected in the most recent Your Delta, Your Voice survey from 2021. This reflects the strong connection between delta habitat and delta environmental justice residents. The scientific report uh, and my comment, which echoes a lot of the other colleagues' comments, does not reflect the recent study, studies that emphasize the message in the following quote. The effects, tidal march habitat restoration do not substitute the flows, but instead depend on adequate flows and temperatures to provide benefits. To conclude, the current calculated vulnerability by the scientific report leaves important spatial and modeling assumptions that question the effects of how outflow in a compounding matter behind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments and participation today. I believe next is Cynthia Cruz. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to look at my scroll here and Good afternoon, I am Cynthia Cortez, the Good Assistant afternoon. Policy Analyst for Restore the Delta. I'm here today to comment on the scientific basis report. The presence of aquatic species is a marker of health for any water, bottle, water body. The presence of native fish in the Delta is an indicator of good water quality and adequate flows. However, the continued decline in native fish species highlights the improper management of the Delta. Increasing flows has been recognized as a solution to improve the Delta's water quality and restore its native fish population. 
Flows have a direct effect on habitat conditions such as temperature, transport, residence time, nutrient loadings, just to name a few, that are vital for the success of key species, including Chinook salmon, longfin, longfin smelt, and delta smelt. The report fails to consider relevant conditions in its analysis of fish habitats, which lead me to question the credibility of the science basis report being presented. When analyzing fish habitats, the report miss misses the mark in completeness as uh, John Rosenfield highlighted in his presentation. Per the report, target for the eight-year term of the VAs is to provide habitat necessary to support approximately 25% of the doubling goal, but it is expected to exceed this goal. However, how can we expect the proposed voluntary agreements to meet the target much less, much less exceed it when the report ignores the effects of water temperature on spawning. Not to mention the report fails to adequately consider the increasing concerns of the proliferation of HABs. Like the Bay Delta plan um, that the voluntary agreements are in support of, the scientific basis report fails to use the best available science to ensure the restoration and improvement of the Bay Delta conditions and fails to consider the impact of EJ communities and tribal beneficial uses as stated in the racial equity impact report. Lastly, I did want to echo what many here have mentioned. It is unacceptable, unacceptable that the inclusion of tribes and environmental justice communities is a mere afterthought. We are Delta stakeholders that deserve equitable inclusion and consideration on all Delta related matters. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Cortez. Really appreciate it. Uh, next, I'd like to call up uh, Sarah Medina. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, there we go. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on the draft scientific basis report supplement in support of the proposed voluntary agreements for the Sacramento River, Delta, and Tributary update to the San Francisco Bay Sac. Sacramento San Joaquin Delta Water Quality Control Plan. That's a mouthful. <laughs> I am Sarah Medina, the Sustainable Agriculture Coordinator for Restore the Delta, and I have been, in, been a San Joaquin Delta resident most of my life. I would like to raise concerns regarding the draft scientific report. The first concern to bring up is the various inconsistencies throughout the report. For example, starting on how the table 2-1 is not working hand in hand with the latest scientific research. Also, it does not match the claims made in the 2017 science base report. And if there has been any major changes in the last four to five years, where are the science reports that support those changes? Which leads into the second concern, which is that those changes are not talk taking into account various factors like the runoff from agriculture and its effects on HABs, as brought up by Spencer Fern. The board needs to do the correct research to and realize that not only is the flow important, but the qu water quality matters significantly as well. Finally, the third concern is that the board has not taken the time to speak to those who will be directly affected by the decisions made off this report. The board did not consult with those tribes whose main lifeline is the fish they consume. By doing so, it begs the question as to who the board writes these reports for. In summary, this report was put out by the board not to help the general public, but it's just another pol political paper to help agriculture interests, senior water holders, and water exporters. Failure to do otherwise is another suppression to underserved communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Medina. I appreciate your participation and comments today. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call up uh, R.D. Valencia, who will be followed by uh, Barbara Berrigan for you. Apologies, you may have to turn the microphone back on. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Artie Valencia and I'm the community organizer and government liaison for Restore the Delta. Currently, the VAs expect that the proposed combination of flow and non-flow, along with restoration assets, will improve conditions for native species and double salmon populations by 2050. However, these claims are unsupported by existing scientific literature and without the best available science to implement and determine the correct amount of flow needed to achieve this feat, this puts environmental justice, oops, 
tribal communities and native fish populations in the Bay Delta at risk. Peer-reviewed scientific research recognizes the benefits of wetland restoration, but without enough flow, salmon runs cannot be restored, and this has an impact on health, cultural, and spiritual well-being of the Northern Californian tribes and fishing communities. A decline in fish, combina in fish combination with hydrology and physical changes in the delta are evidence that the current flows are not enough to maintain or recover the process that support native delta fishes. Two of the four runs of Chinook salmon are listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. The rate of salmon participating in the fall run is at a historic low. The Chinook salmon are the way of life for tribal communities dependent on the waterways for food and beneficial cultural practices and uses. Habs pose a threat to delta smelt at, as Habs will dissolve oxygen levels in water as discussed in Spencer Fern's presentation to the board today. Habs are persistent due to lack of flow. Chief Colleen Sisk of the Winneman Wintu tribe stresses that salmon have fed and dependent on the, on the delta smelt as a food source for years. And if they were to change their diet to rice and anchovies, there is no scientific studies on how that will impact salmon health. There is a clear tribal, lack of tribal consultation and incorporation of tribal knowledge in the scientific research report for the VAs, thus illustrating its incomplete status as a report. In what ways is the board committed to working with tribal partners and environmental justice communities? If there is no proper science analysis for proposed flow impacts on salmon populations and their food sources, this will exacerbate the inequality impacts on these communities. When disparities are created, this becomes a civil rights issue too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time and participating here in person with us today. I know it's been a long day, so I appreciate the patience around things. And long for you too, and we appreciate all the help with working with our group today very much. So the 2010 flow study, we believe, provides some of the best science we need for improved flow standards to restore fisheries and to improve water quality for people living in the Delta and the Delta watersheds. The scientific basis report, unfortunately, has been designed to undercut what you have already said about flows, and that is why our group made some signs today. The VAs are an attempt to change the science narrative and we see this science report as the second in a trilogy of uh, narratives to undo meaningful flow standards to heal the estuary. We've addressed the harmful algal bloom problems in front of this board starting in 2017 and in our water fix comments before that. And to have it left out of the scientific report for the VAs is erasure of our work and the impacts on our community. While we appreciate the work on the equity resolution, and we did listen yesterday and have staff comment, our observation is that your processes are truncated. Offering equity briefings on the Bay Delta Plan and VA processes that are separate from planning processes with water districts will likely result in unequal outcomes because EJ groups and tribes will be briefed after the fact. As I said earlier, being asked to participate after agreements are designed is not being a working partner. Equity and representation needs to be integrated into processes, plans, and science reports during their creation. Otherwise, you are setting a child's table at Thanksgiving for Delta communities and tribal partners. Shouldn't tribal knowledge be included in scientific reports? Shouldn't data that we provide to the board around HABs analysis be included in the VAs? Especially seeing that we are trained by water board staff on how to collect that data and how to interpret it. Wouldn't this aid in the study of flows to the Delta? I also wanna add that long fit smelt population that was discussed earlier in other comments is actually down over 99.5%. An 11% increase is not the same as achieving viability. And all that improvement is based on flow, not habitat. So why are we delaying and limiting flow improvements for habitat that will have no effect? When did the fine peer-reviewed papers by Dr. Lehman and other papers listed by John Rosenfeld 
improve analysis regarding flows for fish, HABs, and other key issues. When it Delta water agencies and public work agencies have insights to flow needs and applications that could be used for the scientific analysis. And when it this board's own work, like the 2010 flow report, be applicable to how habitat expansion could be achieved. We're not against habitat. We want the right science behind it for it to work. The board needs to return to its mission as a regulator rather than planning resource specialists for the California water industry. And to be a successful regulator, the board must intentionally incorporate the concerns of impacted parties into scientific analysis and produce science for communities in order to achieve equity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barry and Priya. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Tim Stroshane. We'll be followed by Haley Flanagan. When I came before the board four years ago for water fix, I didn't have hearing aids. Now I do. And they don't match up with masks very well. Good day, I'm Tim Stroshane. Uh, Greetings to all board members. Um, my comments focus on two aspects of this supplemental VA report. Um, my comments are not new to you today. They are reflective of other commenters from scientists to people I work with with Restore the Delta. Uh, but they focus on the proposed voluntary agreement assets and betrayal of the salmon doubling goal by the proposed fishery viability objective. Table ES1's description of assets feels more like wishes and prayers than something concrete. This table brings up so many questions that are not asked, let alone answered, by the supplemental VA report about who buys, who sells, and why are supposed flow numbers allowed to appear in the table to which no one has actually or formally committed. How can this be considered as a serious alternative to the Bay Delta plan with a straight face? You as water board officials are asked by this report to consider science applied to a chimera, an elaborate hydraulic fantasy. Second, by adding a fish viability objective to the salmon doubling objective, RTD and the environmental justice and tribal communities with whom we link arms, believe the supplemental VA report is a solicitation by water right holders and operating water agencies to let them comply with an objective easier than salmon doubling. The viability objective will become the new lower ceiling for regulating folks, regulated folks, DWR and the Bureau to reach for, but will salmon truly recover? Another unasked question. This report is meant to show the viability of the viability objective and not of the salmon doubling objective, nor of the two objectives somehow marvelously working together. There is little reassurance that the VAs would achieve salmon population doubling. Such silence represents an open, if unstated, official act of hostility towards salmon recovery because salmon population doubling would seem to be just too hard for the supreme propertied rulers of Delta watershed rivers and the Delta estuary. This report implies extinction is the as yet unspoken objective of the Bay Delta plan yet to come. It is, if it's not about allowing extinction, then how will the state water board achieve the remaining 75% of salmon doubling habitat if the majority, if the major water users of the Sacramento and San Joaquin Valleys commit only to achieving 25% of that goal. If I'm getting this wrong, it means you've probably, you have problems communi communicating your findings and the meaning of the report. But I, I conclude that the emperors of water rights and water project operations push the VAs to try to rehabilitate their poor record as environmental stewards the last five decades. It is simply the latest model of greenwashing, California style. 
your non-cooperation as board officials with their sales pitch would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stershain. Appreciate your participation and being here in person today. Thank you. Next, Haley Flanagan, uh, we followed by Ben King. Hi, I'm Haley Flanagan, a climate water advocate for Restore the Delta. I would like to further point out how the voluntary agreements released by the State Water Board have not prioritized the Delta community in their inadequate analysis on flow management, particularly in how its management impacts harmful algal blooms within the Delta waterways. While the board has claimed to back its decisions with scientific analysis, its scientific research report is noticeably lacking in its coverage of potential adverse impacts to the most at-risk areas of the community. The report has failed to assess how flow management changes will influence HABs or harmful algal bloom growth, while we know that flows could be a major factor in HAB occurrence, as Spencer Fern mentioned in his presentation earlier. This is in addition to the fact that HABs and their negative effects on water quality, as well as fish populations, are a burden unduly experienced by low income and minority communities, violating the board's own equity policy. The voluntary agreements and their associated research thus far blatantly ignore the well being of disadvantaged communities within the Delta, even as the long term impacts of HAB exposure to both humans and to wildlife are becoming more well understood and more concerning. As the report admits, it has not considered temperature in the well being of spawning salmon habitat. It is also leaving out the potential, uh, the potential risks of rising temperatures alongside decreased flow on the future growth of HABs and their thus produced cyanobacteria. With such carefree decision making behind these changes, what was the point of the scientific analysis in the first place? Who are we caring for if not the people most exposed to and impacted by potential toxins? And if these reports are intended to address the safety of voluntary agreements, for salmon populations alone, why isn't the potential risk of HABs being addressed for them as well? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Flanagan. Mr. King. Hi, uh, yes, I'm, I'm Ben King. Um, my family's been farming in, in near College City since 1860. Um, I'm a member of the Clusa County Resource Conservation District, um, and also uh, I'm a member of the Clusa Basin Joint TAC. Um, so I'm here to comment. I submitted um, some excerpts from the history of Clusa County by Will S. Green, and also an excerpt uh, in 1891, uh, which details the extent of the of the Tules uh, of the Clusa Trap, the natural interconnection between the Sloughs, Sacramento River. Um, uh, below, there was two basins: the upper basin and the lower basin. The upper basin itself was at least 10,000 acres, according to Will S. Green and the southern basin, the lower basin, which tied into the lower Sycamore Slough through Knight's Landing, was like 70 to 80,000 acres of, of tules. These acted as both um, wetlands, but also spawning areas for fish uh, uh, interconnected through high flows. Um, in, in the 1891 history, John Bilbo reported that the wind, local Winton tribe in Calusa actually was fishing in the middle of the river. There were several stories where the river actually would run dry and one person actually I've heard about his father bra bragging about actually damming the river. So I, historically, the, the area both on the east and west actually probably have, was more wet than the river during the time before the, the, the Shasta Dam was built. I, I bring this up not only because it just it illustrates the loss, of, the loss of spawning area and natural habitat, but also the impact that uh, the loss of just riparian habitat and the wildlife corridors between the lower layers of both the east side and the west side. My family's been farming on the Clusa Trop, like as I said, since 1860. Uh, we settled um, between the upper basin and the lower basin. It's a narrow part of land, actually a ridge. So there's no only the Knights Landing Ridge, but actually the College City Ridge, which my family granted easement to build to dig the Clusa Basin drain. What I think is missing from the report is identification of the Clusa Trough as a natural waterway. All the uh, ephemeral streams that run into that our natural waterway and natural contribution to the Sacramento River, to the Delta, and also it ignores the impact of the Clear Lake volcanic field 
and its extension into Sutter Butte. So it ignores that whole geology, which has dramatic, potentially very dramatic and, 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 and unknown uh, potential adverse consequences on groundwater quality. The, the Sutter Buttes um, is a unique geological formation within in the midst of our water system, including a quarter mile long of, of granite, a granite formation that is the same as the Sierras. It, it indicates that actually you not only need to think about the surface water, but interaction with groundwater quality and the potential for redox conditions as we lower groundwater levels. There, the, 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 the existence of, the, of these Thule areas showed that we actually had anaerobic uh, conditions for, for millions of years in when the Sacramento Valley was actually a inland sea, but also during the period before uh, the, the reclamation itself. And to actually now to drain that area is you're just actually expanding the zone of redox. We are seeing uh, in Clusa itself, we have manganese and and iron contamination, and we have the wells that have actually shown arsenic contamination. Of course, you know about Robbins. In Williams, we're seeing manganese contamination. These are all indications that we are seeing the expansion of the zone of redox. And I, I believe that the scientific report not only ignores um, the, the, the ge geological backdrop of the western, especially the western part of the Sacramento uh, Basin, inclusive subbasin, but also just ignores the, uh, the impact, uh, um, also the potential for subsidence because we're lowering groundwater levels. We've seen the first illustration of subsidence north of the Clusa Refuge, um, and you're seeing it along the river. So and, and to finish up, uh, uh, please don't ignore the Clusa Trough. Please don't ignore the seasonal wetlands that exist on the west side of the uh, reclamation areas of RD-108. These have been providing zooplankton to the Delta and its ecosystem for, for, for the millennium. And that the, the scientific basis needs to actually look at the geological sending and the history as detailed in this historical record. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. King. I really appreciate your, your patience in sticking through today's um, long already discussion. I know we still have a lot of good commenters as well, but just thanks. Thanks for being here with us. Uh, next, let's get to uh, Heinrich Albert, uh, who will be followed by Greg uh, Slotnick and then Chris Schutz. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to be quick. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of the panels uh, today, the staff and also the NGO panels. Uh, I, I think uh, they were very informative. Uh, just two quick uh, comments. The first thing is that a doubling goal when the baseline is a greatly decimated uh, population, a small fraction of what it once was, is a pretty modest goal. And now when the VAs propose to drag out achieving that goal to 2050, it becomes less than modest. It, it, it's really, uh, I think, uh, unacceptable to all of us. The other thing, I think that the NGO panels made very convincing arguments that while habitat is important in almost all of the cases uh, relevant to uh, the Delta and its tributaries, it is not the limiting factor. Any kind of voluntary agreements need to have substantially more flows than what has been currently proposed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Albert. Appreciate your comments and participation and as well sticking with uh, us today. Next, I'd like to call up Greg uh, Slotnick, then Chris Schutz, and then uh, Aaron Woolley. And Mr. Slotnick was on the call until about five or 10 minutes ago, but he has dropped off. Thank you. Appreciate that. And apologies to Mr. Slotnick if uh, we ran out of time for you there. Uh, Mr. Schutz. Good afternoon, board chairman uh, Esquivel and board members. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, uh, sorry about my video, but there you go. Um, Chris, Chris shoots with the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance. CSPA will be commenting uh, in written form, and I offer a few high level comments today. The voluntary agreements bill themselves as a mixture of flow and what they call habitat. 
Mostly I wanna to talk today about the proposed flow measures in the 2022 supplement, the 2017 scientific basis report. The supplement says on page 3-2, no direct flow assets are proposed for flood basins. The voluntary agreements propose to rearrange 20,000 acres in the suburb bypass, Butte Sink and Calusa Basin, but they don't propose to devote water to get those acres wet. If they can figure out how they may divert more of the existing flow from the main stem Sacramento into the Sutter bypass than goes with current infrastructure and operations. But that's robbing Peter, Peter's flow to pay Paul. It's also substituting an aspirational experiment for proven flow results. Worthy as the bypass floodplain concept may be, to date it has not shown that it can produce better out migration and escapement than existing conditions. At, it, at its best, the construct is a spill management plan. But we know that fish throughout the system do well in big high flows already. More generally, consider the alleged flow benefits in table 2-1, pages 2-1 to 2-3 of the supplement. The thing you have to ask yourself in each case is whether there's enough flow to produce the stated generic benefit or negatively stated to improve on the limited, fat limiting factor. To take some important examples. First, is there enough water to improve the success of the outmigration of juvenile salmon? Right now, good numbers of juvenile salmon only make it to the ocean during big flows in wet years. Small increments of flow improvement barely move the needle. Second, as stated on page 4-2 of the 2017 scientific basis report for fish flow as habitat. This is particularly true for smell. Because of the effect of export pumps and other factors, the location of habitat is more important than the amount or the physical characteristics. So the critical question is, is there enough water to move the low salinity zone into the estuary far enough downstream for a long enough time to benefit smell? You've all seen the bar charts of fish declines over the last 40 years. You've seen a number of them today. The fish get hammered in critically dry years and dry year sequences, but the voluntary agreements don't propose to keep existing flow and water quality standards in effect during droughts. And whatever the baseline is, which I honestly don't understand when it comes to flow numbers, for example, in table ES-1, the voluntary agreements propose almost no critically dry year flow increases. Today, declines of fish in drier sequences have not left enough spawners of many species to produce enough babies for populations to rebound in the good years. One result is that even in wet years, there aren't enough juveniles to use the habitat that already exists in the tributaries, in the floodplains, in the estuaries. The last time there was a wet year uptick for Delta smelt was 2011. Creating physical habitat when there aren't enough fish to use the existing habitat makes no more sense than building reservoirs when there's no water to put in them. You also have to ask yourself how much real new water are the voluntary agreements going to produce? Will there be more net Delta outflow and how much or, or and how much, and how much will be existing inadequate outflow moved around in time? The McCollumney modeling shows that most of the new water in the voluntary agreement for the McCollumney is a water that would have been released later in the year anyway under existing operations. East Bay Mud's been upfront about that. Is that different for Delta outflow? The voluntary agreements propose to add water to a system built on constraints. The accounting is easy when to add water to that, the accounting is easy when the actual outflow is the same as the minimum flow required by those constraints. But a lot of times the actual outflow is more than the minimum. For one reason or the next, um, water above the minimum is not exported today. The outflow construct of the voluntary agreements relies on exports foregone. Is every acre foot of outflow greater than the required minimum and export foregone? Ask yourself, exports foregone compared to what? Flows added compared to what? As far as I can tell, even the tributary proponents of the voluntary agreements don't know how much water, new water for Delta outflow, uh, there will be how it will be encountered and how it will be enforced. 
They don't know the mechanisms by which their own tributary flow contributions won't just become export water. They can't tell me how any benefits for fish in tributaries will help fish make it through the Delta. Remember the environmental water account where new environmental water just became export water. If the export foregone aspect of the grand bargain is not just a grand accounting shell game, when are the proponents going to explain it to us so that they can, so that we can actually count the water? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schutz. I appreciate uh, your good comments and uh, your camera's fine. It's just our aged projectors. So thank you. <laughs> Very good, thanks. Next, uh, I'd like to call up Aaron Woolley, uh, who'll be followed by uh, our Sally. Good afternoon. Oh, can you hear me? We can, sorry, I was just saying good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Eswell and members of the board, and thank you for the opportunity to comment today. My name is Erin Woolley, and I'm a policy advocate with Sierra Club California. I speak today on behalf of our half a million members and supporters throughout the state um, to comment on the scientific basis report supplement for the voluntary agreements. I want to start by thanking the panelists for their excellent presentations today and support the points that were made there and thank the board for your thoughtful questions, um, both in response to this agenda item and the previous agenda item, um, which address many of the same topics. Efforts to produce a Bay Delta voluntary agreement started in 2012. We are now a decade later and the proposed VA still fails to demonstrate how it will achieve objectives for salmon doubling, the new native fish viability objective, it fails to include provisions to address temperature management, and it has repeatedly delayed adoption and implementation of an updated Bay Delta plan. In that time, fish, wildlife, and water quality in the Bay Delta have continued to deteriorate. As you know, salmon survival rates are low and Delta smelt have not been found in surveys since 2017. The science shows that increasing freshwater flows directly benefits native species viability but the VA doesn't include additional freshwater flows that are commensurate with the recommendations made by scientists or this board. The VA before you today is not best based on the best available science and by its own terms, it will not meet objectives for salmon viability. Instead, it proposes to construct new non-flow habitat and contribute to the salmon doubling goal. The scientific basis report states that the outcomes of the VA are uncertain due to a long list of factors and underlying assumptions. Habitat is critical, but the best available science does not support substituting non-flow habitat projects for in-stream flows in the Bay Delta watershed. The VA parties have asked for an additional eight years to try something new, but non-flow habitat restoration in the Delta is not new. It's been tried for years while species have continued to decline. Director Bonham acknowledged in his comments earlier today that habitat without flow cannot support fish, but the voluntary agreement lacks sufficient protections for freshwater flows to support viable populations of native aquatic species. New flow regulations can be implemented immediately and scientific evidence shows that it will be effective in responding to species decline that we've witnessed without waiting an additional eight years. The board has already delayed adopting and implementing an updated Bay Delta plan in the hopes that voluntary agreement would materialize. The Bay Delta ecosystem simply cannot wait. Finally, the VA leaves out an essential component that was addressed by the board's Bay Delta plan update, temperature management. Temperature is a key component of salmon survival and temperature issues contribute to salmon mortality Failing to include provisions to address temperature leaves a gaping hole in the VA proposal and undermines conclusions in this report that the VAs will improve salmon viability. The presentations today have gone into detail about the numerous benefits of flow for the Bay Delta ecosystem. Science shows that freshwater flows are key for native species viability and have positive effects on numerous aspects of water quality. Increasing functional flows can drive food export, contribute to cooler water temperatures, and improve species survival. On the contrary, low flows exac exacerbate HABs, negatively impacting water quality, species habitat, and human health, as we've seen in the past few years. California needs to address the situation in the Bay Delta with urgency, 
develop solutions through inclusive and transparent processes, and ensure that solutions are supported by strong science. This VA has not achieved that. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Thank you, Ms. Woolley. I appreciate your, your good comments and participation uh, in this discussion and I know ongoing uh, in the work, so thank you. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Araceli Moreno. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Araceli and I'm the, um, Araceli Moreno and I'm the Youth Education Advocate in the Central Valley for uh, Safe California Salmon. Um, my comments may sound uh, repetitive to what my colleagues have already said, um, but I think it's important to hear everybody's voice regardless of repetitiveness. So, um, so here I go. Uh, so even though one of the uh, VA representatives um, said decades of science, uh, supports their report. Uh, the VA that was drafted is actually not fully supported by science. Um, and I would love to know more about the peer-reviewed science they are using to support some of their claims. Um, the VA seems to have been written to only benefit water right holders upstream and also water exporters um, over those whose lives are tied to a healthy estuary. Um, and an example, one of their scientific claims um, in the VA scientific report uh, is their claim that habitat restoration without flows will benefit native fish in the Bay Delta um, and that habitat alone can support food webs. Uh, however, these claims are not supported by existing scientific literature uh, and therefore the analysis points that uh, they were making throughout the report fail to use the best available science that's out there. Um, also, um, toxic algae impacts um, are not addressed in the VA report, and the failure to complete a full scientific analysis on how flows impact um, the formation of harmful of HABs um, in the Delta is a political deci decision that erases the concerns, the safety, and the health of the Delta and EJ communities. Um, just last year in 2022, we saw a huge fish kill um, of an estimated um, 10,000 or even more fish in the San Francisco Bay uh, that included both white and green sturgeon, uh, leopard sharks, striped bass, bat rays, and mm -hmm. anchovy. And this was all due to the, the harmful blooms. Um, uh, lastly, the lack of strong uh, scientific data used in the VA and the lack of tribal consultation by the state water board is contradictory to your racial equity plan. Um, and um, it's contradictory because the VA report that has major flaws um, does not address various issues that negatively affect countless tribal communities and communities of color. Um, so I urge the state water board to support flows for fish and uh, fish dependent communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Moreno. I appreciate your participation and uh, whether anyone finds it repetitive or not, uh, really important and appreciate your voice in all of this. So thank you. Um, next, I'd like to call up Mackenzie Owens. And as I do, I do wanna look in the room and make sure there isn't <clears throat> anyone here in person that's still looking to comment uh, would want to make sure that you're able to. So just flag as we, uh, after we hear after uh, Mackenzie Owens here, Ms. Owens. Thank you. Um, good afternoon to the board. I'm Mackenzie Owens with the Store of the Delta. First and foremost, I'd like to emphasize that the voluntary agreements are a culmination of various short-sighted implementations that will continue to benefit those who are currently profiting from those poorly constructed framework, which are senior water right holders and water exporters. This continues to build on a similar privileged narrative with the inadequate scientific report for the voluntary agreements, which is the focus at hand today. Uh, the report exhibits a lack of updated science needed to properly adhere to the delta that is confronting a constantly changing climate while also failing to provide science that properly represents tribal and environmental justice communities and the impacts their beneficial uses may face. Additionally, not only will these groups be at the forefront of lasting negative effects, local wildlife from various fish species will continue to decline along with an increase of toxic harmful algal blooms due to a lack of flow from water diversion and depletion. 
As mentioned previously, it was stated that in the board's 2018 phase one master response document, that there is no tangible evidence that non-flow measures will be able to ensure habitat sustainability and saving water in regards to efficacy. If the board has already discovered those results, how can non-flow measures protect habitats and wildlife when those normally need flows in the first place? How can we move forward in development when the science and discussion is lacking the proper updated practices and electing those who are the first to suffer from those outcomes? There must be less contradictory procedures in order for future water and equity management. Again, the report and the voluntary agreements focus on the welfare of senior water right holders and water diverters rather than all impacted parties such as tribal and EJ communities. I implore you to recognize and reconsider the ramifications that the current scientific report will result in. Thank you. Thank you as well. I appreciate that, Ms. Owens. Uh, next, I'd like to call up uh, Sam Little, uh, followed by Crystal Moreno. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. I am Sam Little. I am a climate water advocate from Restore the Delta. I am here today to comment on the draft voluntary agreement scientific research report. In the report, there was a lack of assessment on spawn on water temperature and how this would be impacting the spawning habitat of salmon. Temperature is a critical component in spawning and is entirely overlooked in the voluntary agreement. The Central Valley salmon population is in decline, with the Federal and State Endangered Species Act listing two of the four Chinook salmon runs and with the fall Chinook salmon being at historically low abundance. The disregard for evaluation on water temperatures is deeply concerning due to the changing climate we are experiencing and with flows being vital for regulating river temperatures for the health of fisheries. The oversight to consider how this would influence the health of fish and flows is another example how, of how this scientific analysis fails to address the concerns of tribes and EJ communities for restored fisheries. The salmon in our waterways is relied upon by many for sustenance and spiritual practices and this report does not take into account how neglecting rising temperatures will directly affect many livelihoods. Salmon fisheries won't recover if inadequate or partial research serves as a foundation for Delta management. The consequences on tribal communities and Delta environmental justice communities will be substantially more disproportionate. Flow in our waterways, as previously discussed by a lot of people, supports Delta health and reduces the rising water temperatures brought on by climate change. Flow minimizes the potential existence of harmful algal blooms. And without this, it will threaten the health and the safety of these communities further. A political choice that ignores the worries, safety and health of communities of the Delta is an oversight of thorough and comprehensive scientific anal analysis <clears throat> on how flows affect the formation of harmful algal blooms in the Delta. Since these needs of the community are not factored, factored as equ equitably as water exporters, incomplete science really just does not appropriately estimate what is required to restore fisheries for impacted communities will further result in additional discrimination in California water management. Better framework is needed to ensure equitable resolutions. I thank you for the opportunity to comment and I hope you take this as an opportunity to reconsider the addition of water temperature in your analysis and the significance of salmon and flow for our communities in this scientific report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Little. Appreciate your, your comments, uh, sticking with us here and, and participation in all of this. Uh, regrettably, I believe Crystal Moreno is not on the platform uh, with us and apologies to Ms. Moreno. We uh, again ex went a bit long here and passed your schedule. If you are viewing through another uh, platform, please, um, if you're having any challenges getting on the platform, email uh, board.clerk at waterboards.ca.gov and we can make sure um, you're on there. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Thomas uh, Berliner, be followed by uh, Mark Rafferty. And we have given Mr. Berliner a chance to unmute. I know he had indicated that he was just going to be um, as Speak if necessary. necessary. Yeah, so. and I'll, I'll start flagging that at the, the top in case um, folks are not desiring to speak, they can quickly just say so, and we'll move on to the next thing as well. And Chair Escavel, I will point out that, um, oh, she just dropped her hand, Ms. Desjardins had her hand up briefly. Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Mark Rafferty, uh, who will be followed by James Lynch, who is uh, speak if necessary. Good afternoon. Good Nearly afternoon. Evening. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment today. My name is Mark Raftree. I'm a certified law student at the Stanford University Environmental Law Clinic, representing Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians, Winnemem Wintu Tribe, Little Manila Rising, Restore the Delta, and Save California Salmon. My comments today focus on four themes, some of which build on what other commenters have touched on today. The importance of flows, the lack of scientific support for trading physical habitat restoration for flow increases, the significant uncertainties that limit the report's utility, and continuing concerns with the organization of the Bay Delta Plan Phase 2 update around the VAs. First, the board and other regulatory agencies have repeatedly recognized that viability of native fish populations in the Bay Delta primarily depends on increasing flows. In its 2017 scientific basis report for phase two, to which as we have been reminded, this report is a supplement, it stated that flow is commonly regarded as a key driver or master variable governing the environmental processes in riverine and estuarine systems, such as the Bay Delta and its watershed, and that flow and physical habitat are not interchangeable. Moreover, we already know that flows would address many of the factors that the report recognizes limit fish prevalence from temperatures, contamination, dissolved oxygen, and salinity, among others. Second, claims that physical habitat restoration will significantly benefit salmon and other native fish are not based on a sound scientific rationale as required by the Clean Water Act. To the contrary, the report indicates that physical habitat is infrequently a limiting factor for spawning and rearing of salmon, such that the proposed VA habitat expansion would pro provide little to no benefit. It cites no scientific studies showing that improving physical habitat in the Delta without providing flow-based habitat will promote fish recovery. Science, including that published by the board itself, cuts in the opposite direction. Third, major uncertainties limit the report's utility. The report should not hide the ball on its real conclusion that even after its extensive modeling and literature review, there are at least eight major areas of uncertainty that make its findings and conclusions unreliable. These include such fundamental inputs as how, where, and when physical habitat restoration will be implemented. And the board concedes that its baseline habitat findings were not informed by water temperature, something it recognizes as one of the crucial concerns for native aquatic species in the future. If habitat is not suitable because of temperature or other factors, that would, according to the board, reduce the VA habitat contributions. Simply monitoring temperatures after the fact is not enough. Finally, the phase two Bay Delta plan update should not be organized around the VAs. The board has an obligation to ensure that water quality criteria protect a range of beneficial uses, including those related to fish recovery, others like recreation that are not currently being met and still more that the board has so far declined to codify, including tribal beneficial uses. VAs are not productively advancing the Bay Delta plan update, but instead doing the opposite, delaying the update, narrowing the board's consideration, and limiting public engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raftery. Appreciate your contributions and comments today. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call up uh, James Lynch and uh, flagging there, I you had marked uh, speak if necessary, we will be followed by uh, Regina Chikazola and uh, then Thad Bentner. Thank you. Uh, this is Jim Lynch representing uh, Merced Irrigation District, and we'll defer our comments at this time, given the late time. We'll submit written comments at the appropriate time. Thank you very much for your participation and for staff's excellent presentation. Thank you as well, Mr. Lynch. Appreciate that and look forward to uh, the written comments and uh, would reinforce that point for everyone as well that uh, we're going to get through everyone and uh, their comments and hopefully folks can hang on. But please do submit written comments so that you can more thoroughly and formally respond to what we're hearing. Uh, next, I'd like to call up uh, Regina Chikazola. will be followed by Thad Bentner and then uh, Lucy Gill. <laughs> Um, hello, my name is Regina Chikazola. Um, I definitely brought up earlier in the morning some of my issues with the VA process and um, other people have, so I'll try to skip over that. 
Um, but I just wanted to mention that the last time there was a significant Bay Delta Water Quality Plan update, um, I had just graduated from high school and now I am in my mid 40s, which I think is significant to think about. Um, within that time, there's been massive declines of water quality in salmon in the Delta. And there's also been a lot of scientific studies about what is needed and flow seems to come up in every single one of them. Um, I wanted to mention that um, the Sacramento River and Delta are uh, listed for a lot of things. Um, one of them is temperature. Dissolved oxygen is one of them. A lot of different chemicals are uh, listed. Um, and flow is really important for all of these things. Um, and then, um, so I think it's really important that we stick to the first scientific report, um, or at least like have maybe the VA eggs can go, some of the VAs can go forward, but with the flows from the sci first scientific report. Um, I would also like to say that habitat is not something that is listed. And so what's under your, the water quality control board preview is water quality. Um, so I think we need to look at our listings and look at our beneficial uses, which do include recreation and cold water fisheries. Um, I spent 20 years, 25 years almost on the Klamath River right now, and I've seen a lot of habitat projects not lead to helping fisheries at all. And a lot of that is because habitat only is helpful if it's wet, you know, and a lot of times, even if it's wet during certain times of year and then it's drained too fast as diversions begin, that actually leads to massive fish strandings and kills a lot of fish. And I see it over and over again in tributaries here, and I'm sure it'll continue to be an issue everywhere. And um, one of the things, a lot of the things, one of the things I also want, think you need to look at, look at is cumulative effects of all the new proposed diversions and projects in the Bay Delta. Um, and what's going to happen if we do all these habitat projects um, and we don't have a lot of new flows coming in, but we do allow a lot of new flow diversions. You know, that's gonna lead to a lot of habitat that is then dry, which could lead to fish strandings. Um, I also wanted to mention that I think it's really um, telling that there are so many uncertainties that were brought up as far as this scientific um, research report. I really have a hard time seeing it go through peer review and actually be supported by a peer re review process because the um, uncertainties are crazy. There are things like climate change, timings of flow, habitat might not be suitable, not understanding the relationships of the species in the habitat. I mean, the uncertainties are crazy, but we are certain that fish need water and they need much more water than they're getting. Um, and then one of the final things I wanted to bring up is that the Delta has poor water quality and it, impact, it impacts more than just fish. I mean, we've brought up the tribal beneficial use issues. We've brought up the toxic algae issues, um, but we also should bring up that a lot of people do get surface water drinking water from the Delta. And there's a massive amount of pollution that enters the Delta. And so outflows are also critically important to actually getting that pollution moving and not just sitting there creating toxic algae, which then can impact people's drinking water supplies. Um, I will try to cede the rest of my time because every I want to just agree with all the PhD scientists that spoke earlier. Um, it's so critically important we deal with these temperature and flow issues, uh, and then I will see the rest of my time and we ask you to please do the right thing and actually do a water quality control plan that helps the Delta and deals with the flow issues, because who knows if it's going to be another 20 years before we actually get a good update from the water board. Thank you, Ms. Chikazola. Appreciate your, uh, your comments and participation today. Thank you. Uh, taking through, I don't believe uh, Ms. Bononis is with us any longer, and Lucy Gill is not on the platform. I think our next commenter may be either Justin Fredrickson or Matt Holmes. Oh, and I apologize. I keep glossing this. And uh, sorry, before we go to, to you, Mr. Fredrickson, I do see uh, Ms. Desjardins, uh, your hand is up. Um, I'll quick, Mr. Fredrickson, if you can hold a moment, I'd like to go to Ms. Sure. Desjardins. To... First. Thank you. Um, Deirdre Desjardins with California Water Research. And uh, I just uh, came from the Delta Independent Science Board meeting uh, 
where the lead scientist presented uh, the, this uh, supplemental report. And as you know, the Delta Independent Science Board was asked by the Water Board to review all review the previous scientific and technical basis report. Um, and the science board does want to review this. And I pointed out that um, since the Delta Independent Science Board is involved in the adaptive management and review, and also since they have oversight of adaptive of the science supporting adaptive management in the Delta, it's critically important that the Delta Independent Science Board be given adequate time to review this report and comment on the overall adaptive management framework. Um, if you have this panel of world-class preeminent scientists and uh, they're supposed to be involved in reviewing the plan at the end, but they need to look at the overall framework from the beginning. Um, and we're going to support them very strongly in doing so um, because with the very deep uncertainties with climate change, it's critically important that we use the best available science and that there be a good adaptive management framework for dealing with uh, uncertainties, um, which are huge at this point, as, as we've seen from, you know, going from drought to uh, the recent uh, extreme storms, we really are in uncharted territory. Um, so I, I very much hope the Water Board will uh, work with the Independent Science Board. They cannot provide comments within by the February 8th public comment period, and it would not be appropriate to ask them to do so. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Desjardins. I uh, believe, Matt Holmes, you have your, your hand up. I do, but I think there was someone in front of me. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, we'll we'll just we'll go to Mr. Fredrickson, and then um, and then you'll be right after that. So thank you for that. Cool. Thank you. Mr. Fredrickson. Yes. Uh, hello again, uh, Justin Fredrickson at the California Farm Bureau. Um, I uh, was hesitating whether to comment. It's been a a, a, a depressing day for me because, uh, as I indicated earlier, I think I actually believe that voluntary agreements have uh, a lot of work has gone into them, and I think it's a it's a constructive attempt to do something different than what we we have uh, been doing for a long time, and and uh, I don't I've not seen it work. Um, I uh, I've, I've I don't have hearing aids yet. I'm, I need eyeglasses now. But I have been doing this long enough that I've seen a lot of water reallocated since early 2000 or late 1990s, um, early 2000s, starting with CalFID, Bay Delta Accord, on you know biological opinions, on and on and on. The 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 water management um, uh, situation over the summer, and if you add up all the water, in addition to floodwaters like you know uncontrolled, unregulated flows like we're seeing right now. There's a lot of water in rivers at various times. I agree, it could be a problem in dry years, um, and uh, uh, and, may, and so maybe there's some kind of targeted fix that that could be needed there. But I also think that uh, floodplains, for example, are um, what the kinds uh, uh, what's what's being proposed with the bypasses, um, some of uh, some of the synergies and opportunities that might be there in, in places like. On, in the South Valley, on in on the San Joaquin, where uh, we're seeing um, uh, snowpack retreat up the mountains, and we're going to see huge flows. That's actually modeled and predicted, and uh, I believe that floodplain is was a huge part of the life cycle of these uh, salmonid uh, species, for example, and could. 
provide huge benefits. It's actually been shown to huge uh, pr pr provide huge benefits for for the fish in um, utilizing those habitats. Um, so that's where I get a little excited when I see something like uh, what's being proposed with all this um, floodplain habitat, in particular with the with the um, the the voluntary agreements, and which is where it gets depressing depressing to hear person after person sort of. Um, in, uh, advocating for the same thing that frankly has not worked for 20 years. It hasn't. It hasn't. And I also think that um, a lot of what we're seeing, there's something else going on, uh, not just in California, the world over. I mean, climate, there's something going on with the climate. The al algal blooms were mentioned, fires. These are not normal things and they're not necessarily being caused by the water users. Um, but where we've gotten is we have a regulatory environment where it's next to impossible to plan. Uh, to invest, to invest or to adapt. Um, the last couple of uh, years, through the last couple of uh, droughts, we've seen uh, zero back-to-back -back zero allocations for some water users. Um, we've seen even some uh, many of the se senior most uh, uh, water users curtailed entirely or or um, uh, significantly. That's never that had never happened before, and we have um, the Colorado River drying up. Um, and we have uh, Sigma rolling out, and uh, it's getting to be a real crisis. We're running out of water, uh, and, and that's a real thing. It impacts our economy. It impacts agriculture, certainly. It impacts cities. It imp impacts people when they when they uh, want to turn their open their um, uh, uh, you know the spigot on their on 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 their sink, and uh, it's 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 a real issue. So. Um, I just I don't envy you. I think you have you're being asked to do something that I think could be very destructive to the state. If you if you uh, as a whole, if you do that and it does not work, I don't know where it leaves leaves us where it's like we're betting everything. And I, frankly, I put the odds um, quite low that it's that it's going to succeed. So I, I, that's where I think we should be trying something else. But I guess I'm kind of one of the in, very much in the minority in terms of people commenting today. But I think it's important to put that view out there as well. Thank you, Mr. Fredrickson. Um, I, I want to make sure that um, when you hear criticism, when I hear, I'll say when I hear criticism um, and otherwise um, opinions about a piece of work, it's, it's less about, you know, is the person saying nice things? Um, do I, you know, feel um, ultimately um, that uh, it's about kind of cheerleading one side or another? Um, I, I, I think it's important to take away from this, uh, not a feeling, um, especially when you, we hear criticism about uh, the document and the discussion, things that this board, again, this is a workshop, so we'll continue to hear a lot, um, that we don't take umbrage, I think, from that, but in, in fact, we continue to listen. Um, I, I wanna know that you, it's important to not conflate, and I think I said this at the beginning, what has happened out in our landscape between the Endangered Species Act, say, and constraints on the pumps, and take that for us ever having endeavored to actually establish flows throughout uh, this incredible 40%, you know, that is the state and, and drains through the Delta. So um, it's important to note uh, that there hasn't ever been uh, a project out there throughout the watershed to this extent on flows. There have been constraints on the projects and pumping in the Delta, and that has led to um, outflow that has happened, but um, not this project. So. I think it just, you know, I haven't commented much, I think on, I know on a lot of folks' comments, but I don't want to leave too much confusion again for the project that we're endeavoring on when it comes to establishing uh, flows throughout the Bay Delta watershed and what have been, yes, over these years, uh, further constraints from the Endangered Species Act on pumping uh, within the Delta, but um, those aren't uh, a project, a, six, a, a real discussion on uh, the amount needed for our watersheds and flow, so. Just thank you. Mr. Holmes. Uh, can we hear me? We can, thank you. Thanks for sticking with us. Good afternoon, Chair Escobar, members of the board. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. My name is Matt Holmes, I'm with Little Manila Rising, and I represent environmental justice communities in South Stockton. We've met, and I see you again. Uh, we're, we were supposed to be a cultural preservation organization, but we learned from our friends at Restore the Delta that all of our work is really endangered by uh, the history and the water structures that protect the, you know, this this water, this hydrology around our community, and so we realize that this is a, a set of issues, and this issue in particular is one that we just couldn't ignore. 
So thank you for recognizing me. I'm just going to submit some abbreviated comments right now that focus on the history that got us here um, and which have really only been called out by our tribal partners and Barbara. Uh, and they need to be more re reflected more fully in the uh, analysis and the discussion that we have here. And it's really common across the state of California. Uh, the dearth of social science represented in uh, governance and decision making. Uh, there seems to be a, a preference for uh, engineers and ecologists uh, to and spreadsheets versus people remembering what actually got here. Um, so I'll, I'll just conclude by saying, uh, you know, uh, 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 we we appreciate that research, but we need to, you know, uh, we we can really look at this issue with a skill set that really any young child has, which is, is this fair? Is it not fair? And does this endanger our state? Uh, history matters. And this conversation is about power and not ecology. And we all know that. And I know that's why it's tough to navigate. So I'll submit the rest in writing. And I look forward to hearing the other comments. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Appreciate your comments. Yes, please, uh, Board Member Firestone. Thanks. Um, just have a question. Um, for staff, uh, I really look forward to um, seeing all the comments and I know there's more to come. Um, one thing that's been brought up that I just still have a question on for staff and maybe you could touch on is how we're um, incorporating HABs into the scientific basis report and analysis. I know um, that's been brought up a lot, so interested to hear more about how that's being approached. Um, I think I can take a stab at it uh, and please chime in, but again, going back to referencing the 2017 report, which um, water quality is not necessarily my strong suit, um, other than it does relate to fisheries ecology, but I am fairly certain that it's covered under the water quality sections in the 2017 report, uh, specifically discussed HAPS. Uh, having said that, I am also looking forward to seeing the uh, comments and writing, and we can respond to them. Yeah, I can I can add that there, you know, there's approximately a page or so in the 2017 report on HABs. Um, it covered a lot of the literature and um, conditions that that lead to HAB formation that that were covered in some of the earlier presentations. Um, with respect to managing HABs through flow actions, that is a very challenging problem. Um, and at times, particularly with warming climate, I think um, it's likely that that's not a tool that would be adequate to the task. We are um, analyzing those impacts um, that may result from changes in flow in the Delta in the staff report. Um, which will will look at you know conditions that may lead to hab formation um, across all the alternatives, I th but I think at the end of the day there's there's not a simple solution that we have available to us. Yeah, I think that would be something we'd love to hear more from um, the science experts um, over in our sister agencies that. Um, just recommendations on how we might better integrate that within our analysis. And, um, you know, I know the staff report is a little bit different because it's um, somewhat of a CEQA document as well, which is a little bit different than the scientific basis. So just would love to figure out how we might approach this in understanding um, HABs which, like you said, is very complex. And I also will say that just seems to me that there's a ton of evolving science, um, even just since the 2017 report, um, in particular on this issue, because it's just um, uh, such an emerging um, crisis that um, in many places, including the Delta. So I just would love for us to um, take another look there. And I, I'm sure as we're looking at comments, that will be something that We'll try and do. Thank you, board member. Uh, next, th I think we have Cassiel Willie. And you are here in person. I thought you were. Apologies. I, it, I did. Um, you're mislabeled a bit here on our, our sheet. We thought you were going to be remotely. So good to see you. 
Thank you for your patience. Good afternoon, my name is Crystal Willie. Uh, my comments will be mostly supplemental, like the report. Um, I'd just like to echo Vice Chair Tab Tab Tayaba's comments um, regarding the lack of consultation during the development of the VAs, the failure to incorporate traditional ecological knowledge and into the report, and, it, and it's a major flaw leaving the report incomplete. Um, the presentations from the public emphasize the conditions that are threatening culturally, culturally significant salmon and other native fish. The failure to protect these species with adequate flows also threatens tribal traditions, ceremonies, and traditional foods. Without the incorporation of tribal knowledge into VA, the VA analysis, the tribes will suffer. <coughs> Excuse me. Tribes that traditionally inhabited the Bay Delta and areas upstream have depended on adequate flows to maintain the population of salmon for since time immemorial. And flows are necessary to provide habitat to these culturally significant species. Um, I'd like to go back to a comment that was made earlier. I realize there's a desire um, to move forward with the VAs and expedite the update process. However, as has been mentioned, the method of creation of the VAs is exclusionary and unfair. Uh, further, the scientific report has not used the best available science and pushing inadequate science in a rushed process will not heed the best results for the Bay Delta ecosystem or the people who depend on the Bay Delta. As such, there's more faith in the regulatory process at this point from those affected communities. Finally, I have a question um, for a comment that was made earlier. It seems like climate change is not effectively analyzed in the report. And it seems like I may be mistaken, but I believe there's a comment that climate change is not included in the mod modeling. And since it is such an active threat, I'd like to know why it was not included in the modeling and will it be included later? And that would be my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Willie. I appreciate those comments. Um, and actually, um, maybe looking to our folks if there's a, a quick answer around how we treated climate change um, assumptions in our modeling. I can take a stab at that. Um, as I mentioned in the uncertainties, it is not included. And so the commenter is correct that it is not included in the analysis. We do uh, have some discussion. Uh, I'll be honest, it's just discussion in, in the final part of the report about how some extreme events were included in the time series of hydrology that is used. Um, however, we note that the increase in frequency of extreme drought or flood could that frequency could be increased and that is not reflected. Moving forward, we will need to look at what um, analysis tools are available to us to, um, to analyze that. One option could be to extend the time series for the hydrology, but we need to really check to see if that's gonna be feasible for the draft that goes for peer review. Appreciate that. And actually, it, it just does lead me to a bit of a question of, um, is it simply how we treat it in the 2017 uh, report? And that's that's kind of actually on. what I was going to add. We, all, we also didn't analyze specifically, I mean, I think we had a narrative discussion of climate change, but didn't have a modeling evaluation of climate change in the 2017 report either. I appreciate that, yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Dreckmeyer, Peter Dreckmeyer uh, is who we have next, thank you. And it will be followed by uh, Nicole Whipple and then Danielle Frank. Thank you, Chair Esquivel. It's been a well-run meeting and a long one. Thank you. The VAs were touted as more likely to achieve results sooner than the Bay Delta plan, but it appears the opposite might be true. It's been more than four years since phase one was adopted and progress on implementation has been very slow. The VAs have been a distraction. The problem with the Bay Delta and its tributaries is that the ecosystems have been dramatically altered. As a result of unsustainable diversions, our waterways now favor non-native species that evolved in slow moving warm water over native cold water fisheries. Low flows have diminished so many important ecosystem services, including water temperature, dissolved oxygen, dilution of pollutants, floodplain activation, scouring and cleaning gravel, sediment and woody material transport, preventing toxic algae blooms in the Delta and maintaining a healthy salinity balance in the Bay Delta. Can the VAs compensate for these lost ecosystem services? There's talk about power washing gravel and organizing bass fishing derbies. 
Perhaps we could install giant aerators like we have in our fish tanks. But how about water temperature? And how about addressing conditions that fuel toxic algae blooms? I'm glad these two specific issues were addressed by the NGO workshop presenters today. I thought those presentations were excellent. I do have a question about how escapement is measured. I ask because on the Tuolumne, there are two different measurements. We have the traditional CDFW carcass surveys that the doubling goal is based on. And in 2009, a fish counting weir was installed by Fish Bio. The fish bio counts are updated regularly and are more readily accessible, so they get cited more often. I compared the carcass surveys with the weir counts since 2009, and the weir counts averaged two and a half times higher. The Tuolumne diverters produced a salmon count graph that changed the data source in 2009, making it appear the salmon population has fared better over the past 13 years than it actually has when you compare apples to apples. I realize there's a lot of work to be done here. And I realize there's a bit of a chill ever since Chair Felicia Marcus was not reappointed to the water board. But this is an opportunity to really establish a legacy for all of us. And I encourage you all to be bold, to move quickly, to be honest, which I think you are. The peer review is incredibly important. It needs to be done right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dreckmeyer. Appreciate you staying with us, your comments and continued involvement, I know, on this critical balance that the board is here called to do. Um, here, looking at my scroll, waiting for it to come up, apologies, because I think my checking Chair Escavel, and we did have uh, four or five speakers who were left to speak, but um, it seems like they have all been slowly dropping off. And okay. at this point, we do, unless somebody raises their hands, um, because they were already passed over and now will wish to speak. I believe we are done with public comment. Thank you, Mr. Lover. Um, those on the platform, please do uh, raise your hand if you intended to speak further and haven't had a chance to, and then just looking in the room if there's anyone further um, as well. And if not, this is just a workshop, so I really do appreciate everyone's critical eye to this. It's a draft meaning that we're looking for that input. So that's the purpose of this workshop and, and do again, um, have been actively listening, appreciate um, everyone's again, critical eye. There's a lot to, to think over. I know uh, I'm gonna wait, we'll continue to chat here for board member Firestone, but I'll, I'll echo, echo her questions around harmful algal blooms and me personally as well, wanting to just better understand um, how uh, we treat other, I, and, and here the, the importance is that this board complete its work um, and that we update standards and, and know that uh, there are many rocks that we can continue to turn over. And I think fundamental to that is how does it make, make more complete and or um, differentiate an outcome with the way the board um, is evaluating and determining how it proceeds uh, both on the, on the assessment of the voluntary agreements, but importantly, which, you know, that is uh, the implementation component of what is in a whole uh, standard setting here that the board is doing and is the main pro project and the main program before the board. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are, again, a number of things that we heard today around out harmful algal blooms, and I'll be interested in following up on those. And uh, here generally, everyone's written comments. Uh, the, the comments I heard today, again, um, were very helpful in, in helping to continue to further ensure that the decision-making space before the board is one that, again, we can come uh, to completion of our work on the water quality control plan update and continue to, to ensure that we have uh, here standards that are set for this century uh, and importantly key off of so much of the other decision-making that's going on. I look to my fellow board colleagues for their their thoughts and reflection, though, and what they've heard. Board Member McGuire. Yeah, thank you. I, I know this has been a long day, so I'll try to be as succinct as I can here. Uh, just really want to thank you all uh, for all the work that you've done on the supplemental science report. I know it wasn't easy, and I know you're under um, a tight timeline to have that report completed. And, and get it out for public review. So, yeah, appreciate the effort. Um, obviously, we've 
heard a lot today, uh, a lot of input, and I you know, just don't have time to drill into all the questions that I have that I've been taking thorough notes on from all the feedback that we've received. But I, I suffice to say there's a lot of good questions that were raised. Um, there are you know, a couple of areas that I just wanted to ask about that you know, I agree with the comments about the haves and just understanding that. And it's, um, I think we'll, it sounds like we're gonna learn a lot more from the staff report um, when that document comes out, it might flesh out a lot of the questions that have been raised. That, uh, Ms. Riddle, you mentioned temperature being more thoroughly analyzed in the staff report. So uh, I'm kind of anxious to, now to see what that report has and what that analysis includes in, in as much as it can address some of the concerns that we've heard. Um, and perhaps, you know, if there's still time, we can um, e expand some of the analysis to address some of those questions. But I would like to hear <clears throat> first just a bit uh, one commenter mentioned the thiamine deficiency, and I have been hearing a lot about that and how detrimental it is to uh, Chinook salmon, uh, especially this past year. And uh, it sounds like perhaps it's not currently covered in the science report in terms of a limiting factor or stressor. So just wondering what your thoughts, um, you know, looking at CDFW, you know, what your thoughts are on that and if perhaps it should be at least acknowledged as one of those factors that um, are you know, emerging and, and difficult to control at this point. Uh, yes, it is certainly an issue. We uh, did not include it because it's really caused by an ocean condition, um, feeding of adult salmon in the ocean that didn't then carry upstream. So as such, there's not much we can do about it within the VA assets. Whether or not we should still mention it um, is definitely something we can consider. Um, but that's sort of the short reason why it's not in the report. Sure, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I guess you know, in my opinion, we're 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 looking at uh, trying to support a viable fishery, and and to do that, you have to look at all the pieces. You have to look at the ocean. You have to look at fishing conditions. You have to look at the circumstances they encounter, you have to look at predation. I mean, that came up this morning as well. So um, not to say that those fall squarely within the board's authority and the types of actions that we can take here, but certainly they are all factors that affect the success or failure of any action, whether it's an unimpaired flow regime or whether it's a voluntary agreement alternative. I think those all can be influenced by you know these other factors. So for me, it's just important. I, and I don't know, you know if that's a staff report type analysis or or it falls squarely in the science report, I'm gonna to look to staff to, to maybe um, enlighten me on that part. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a, it is a stressor on the fish and I think we'd have to go back and think about how we listed all of the stressors that may exist outside of the watershed would be, that are introduced to the watershed and, and determine if, we're going, you know, what the scope is of the stressors discussion. I think it would be in the stressors discussion, the science report, rather than, I mean, I, it, it, which is incorporated into the staff report. But in terms of doing an impact assessment, we're doing an impact assessment on temperatures, and we will, we will talk about the the relative impacts of the project, of different alternatives on um, have formation as well as temperature. The thiamine issue is an independent variable that isn't. It interacts with the um, with the with our project and the alternatives, but it, in and of itself, it doesn't um, either lessen or, or increase the effect of thiamine deficiency. So, from that perspective, it likely isn't going to be an, an issue that we address from an impact assessment standpoint. But from a stressor standpoint, we will certainly look at including that in the report. Okay. Thank you. The other area I'd just like to signal, and, and I think because this is an issue that I've given a lot of thought to, you know, I've been on the board for four years now. I, I participated in the phase one uh, Bay Delta plan update process and, and that decision that we made. So I, I feel the urgency, I feel the need to act uh, soon. It's been 13 years. Uh, there's been a lot of iterations here of voluntary agreements and different analyses that have happened. And we've made progress, but still aren't over the finish line. So I, I think there's been a lot of consistency here and everyone feeling that we need to move forward as quickly as possible. And the schedule that was shared, I think outlines you know, a pretty aggressive approach to do that. So I appreciate that work. 
Um, but one area that I still struggle with, and, and perhaps it's just because of my memory of the last few years here, are critically dry years, and in particular sequ sequential critically dry years, and, and the implications on the fisheries you know, from experiencing those extremely dry conditions. Uh, I think a number of commenters mentioned that today, uh, and I'm not as sure how or clear, you know, I'm just looking at the VA, I think the, the table, um, sorry, the flow table ES1 does outline some of the flow assets that are being provided in those year types. Um, just wondering if you can explain a little bit of how you approached that analysis or how you looked at dry and critically dry years uh, in terms of fishery impacts and um, some of the consequences that we might see from those conditions. I'll start us off and let others fill in, but generally, so the um, scientific basis report is focused on the potential benefits of the VA. The impact assessment will be that's largely what's covered in the staff report. The staff report will look at, you know, what kind of impacts are you seeing of different alternatives. I think what you would see if there are limited assets under a VA alternative or other alternatives in dry and critically dry years is a continuation of the impacts that are occurring. It may not, you know, add to those impacts, but you wouldn't see those impacts being reduced in dry and critically dry years if you don't have um, assets. However, you know, I know some, there was mention of, you know, the habitat restoration actions and the um, effects that they will have. I think we'll have to evaluate that as well and determine, you know, how that interacts with, um, with the, the impacts to under baseline conditions that occur during dry and critical years. But from a flow perspective, um, during, in the staff report, you know, we will be evaluating that issue during the modeling results to show what kind of effect you have in dry and critically dry years. Okay, well, I appreciate that. I think, yeah, some of the challenge here, as I signaled, was with understanding the assessment that would come out of the staff report. And so I know this is the beginning of the process, this is the start of our public process. I think this is a very important step um, to be able to hear from everyone today. So I you know, appreciate that and look forward to the, you know, the process continuing here in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, board member. And I did want to note and apologize that uh, board member Firestone had to leave at a, a five o'clock. She had to catch a flight. So, vice chair. Okay, just thank you all for the long day and a really interesting discussion. Um, I, I want to focus my, first of all, want to join in uh, what's already been said by the chair and board member McGuire, um, specifically on uh, thiamine. Um, I, I am interested in seeing it included, and I think that um, it, it can go to uh, the issue of uncertainty. And so uh, I, I know we're not 100% certain about any of this, and so just flagging some of these other challenges that are out there. And then in that context, could you all talk a little bit about, we didn't hear much about adaptive management and the role that it can play uh, during this eight year period in addressing some of the uncertainties, but then there's you know the longer term um, and the uncertainties that exist. So um, uh, could you talk about that? And maybe that's a way to you know, answer some of these questions that have been posed today um, uh, you know, regarding issues that are not included. I think, um, on the, I think that from a conceptual basis, the VAs have an adaptive management framework. The details of that adaptive management framework, I think, are being developed as we speak in the VA governance and strategic planning processes. Um, I'll let others chime in on that, but um, conceptually, that that is. Um, Part of the basis for the VAs is having a, a more adaptive framework that can, you know, respond to real time information that exactly how that's going to work, I think, is still going to be part of that development process and part of the board's consideration process. That's that's something that we've been providing feedback on in the governance process is um, what's the board's role in that adaptive management? What's the proposed range for adaptive management? What are the decisions that are going to inform 
um, adaptive management, um, shaping and shifting of flows and those sorts of things. So those are, those are things that the governance group is actively working to um, provide answers to so that we have that information for um, the staff report and subsequent public review. But I'll let others chime in if they have more to add. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. And then um, just reiterating some of the comments that have already been said, you know, we need to move, it's time to move. Um, but with some of these broader issues, uh, just hoping that um, whether it's in the staff report or in the response um, um, when you come back, you know, after reviewing um, uh, the record here, um, looking at, you know, how to weave in uh, climate change, for example. I think it's more important that we move quickly and that we be prepared to do more if we need to. And so my question earlier today about public process, and I think you all answered it really well, there's gonna be the annual report, the triennial review, and so uh, we need to be ready to um, move or a future board would be, uh, you know, need to be prepared with the information that's coming in and then hopefully uh, in the staff report, um, because one of the things that I felt you know was really missing in um, phase one was a discussion on climate change. So how do you weave in that discussion without turning it into a monumental exercise that's going to slow down the whole process? You know, give people the assurances that as we go forward, uh, this information is going to continue. The record will continue to build, so that in the event that it's a, a red light. Um, we're ready to move. And then lastly, just uh, reiterating um, uh, d d a lot of the uh, comments uh, about tribal beneficial uses, whether it's in the scientific basis report or in uh, the staff report, you know, weaving in the role of the regional boards on HABs and beneficial uses. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Agree and appreciate uh, that, you know, uh, although when it comes to the thiamine deficiency, I mean, our ocean conditions, uh, you'll have to remind me, considered at all in, in much of our analysis. I mean, we'd be kind of dipping into that side right now. Yeah, so. Yeah, no, I, I, I know it's an important issue and um, is, yeah. we see the impacts upstream when we um, assess juvenile survival levels. Um, so, I mean, we can try to figure out how to weave in a broader discussion of the fact that these fish have, um, you know, a life cycle that extends beyond the, the Bay Delta watershed and out into the ocean, and there are many stressors that exist in the ocean that are outside of the purview of the board and, and of the VA parties, and try to provide some more context on that issue. I think that brings us to the conclusion of today, the two-day board meeting and this item. I just, I echo the thanks. I know that a lot of time and effort has continued to go on into this project. It is a lengthy project before us now, um, and I'm committed to ensuring and, and, and doing my part to and appreciate the, 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 the layout of the uh, agenda, if you will, the schedule for the next two years, uh, because there is a lot that we're going to have to um, come to conclusion on uh, that this board will will have to complete around its evaluation and and and, and the balancing that we're certainly called to do in this project. Um, I know Ms. Chigozola uh, earlier mentioned that you know she had just graduated high school. I was in the eighth grade, so you know there are um, other middle school kids, others that are are depending, I think, on all of us in our decision making here. And uh, just appreciate all the feedback. Uh, we have a lot to think of about and around, and this is just a start of, again, a really intensive period to cap off something that's um, overdue, uh, given the, the pressing, um, I know, uh, anxiety we all feel between the drought, floods, opportunities to, to be managing our, our water in a, a better way. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. It's been a long two days, and uh, that brings us to the conclusion of this board meeting. Our next board meeting is in uh, two weeks. I believe it'll be... February uh, 7th and 8th, and so, or potentially 8th, we'll notice that we have a two-day board meeting soon. Uh, we're adjourned now, and this board meeting has come to conclusion, I believe, and, unless Mr. Lawfer, did I miss anything? I just wanted to, the record to reflect that there will not be a closed session. Thank you for that.
Much appreciated. Be safe, be well. Really appreciate everyone's uh, contributions again, and we'll be here again in two weeks. Thank you.